Chapter One of Dr. Nicholas' Experiment by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One It is a sad enough thing at any time for a man to have to confess himself a failure but i think it will be admitted that it is doubly so at that period of his career when he is not only young enough to have had some flickering sparks of ambition left but old enough to appreciate at their proper value the overwhelming odds against which he has been battling so long and with such conspicuously poor success such was my case i had entered the medical profession seemingly with everything in my favour my father had built up a reputation for himself and what he prized still more of competency as a country practitioner of the old-fashioned sort in the west of england i was his only child as he was in the habit of saying he looked to me to carry the family name up to those dizzy heights at which he had often gazed but on which he had never aspired to set his foot a surgeon i was to be willy-nilly it may have been a throwback to the parental instinct alluded to above which led me at once to picture myself flying at express speed, regardless of cost, across Europe, in obedience to the summons of some potentate whose life and throne depended upon my dexterity and knowledge. In due course I entered a hospital and followed the curriculum in the orthodox fashion. It was not, however, till I was approaching the end of my student days that I was burnt with that fire of enthusiasm which was destined ultimately to consume me altogether. Among the students of my year was a man by whose side I had often worked, with whom I had occasionally exchanged a few words, but whose intimate I could not in any way claim to have been. In appearance, he was narrow-shouldered, cadaverous, lantern-jawed fellow, dark, restless eyes, who boasted the name of Kelleran, and was properly supposed to be an Irishman. As I discovered later, however, he was not an Irishman at all, but hailed from the black country, Wolverhampton, if I remember rightly, being the city which he claimed the honour of his birth. His father had been the senior partner in an exceedingly wealthy firm of hardware manufacturers, and while we had been in the habit of pitying, and in some instances, I'm afraid, of rather looking down on the son on account of his supposed poverty, he was, in all probability, in a position to buy up every other man in the hospital twice over. The average medical student is a being with whom the world in general has by this time been made fairly familiar. His frolics and capacity, or incapacity as you may choose to term it, for work have been the subject of innumerable jests. If this be a true picture, then Kelleran was certainly different to the usual run. In his case, the order was reversed. With him, work was play, and play was work, while a jest was a thing unknown, and for which he allowed it to be seen that he had not the slightest tolerance. I have already said that my father had a master competency. I must now add that up to a certain point he was a generous man, with my allowance. Under different circumstances, it would have been ample for my requirements. As ill luck would have it, however, I'd got into the wrong set, and before I'd been two years in the hospital, was over head and ears in such a quagmire of debt and difficulties that it looked as if nothing but an absolute miracle could serve to extricate me. To my father I dared not apply, easy going as he was in most matters. I had good reason to know that on the subject of debt he was inexorable, and yet to remain in my present condition was impossible. On every side, tradesmen threatened me. My landlady's account had not been paid for weeks, while among the men of the hospital not one but several held my paper for sums lost at cards, the remembrance of which which sent a cold shiver down my back every time I thought of them. From all this it will be surmised that my position was not only one of considerable difficulty, but that it was also one of no little danger, unless I could find a sufficient sum, if not to free myself, at least stave off my creditors. My career, as far as the world of medicine was concerned, might be considered at an end. 
even now i can recall the horror of that period as vividly as if it were but yesterday it was on a thursday i remember that the thunderclap came on returning to my rooms in the evening i discovered a letter awaiting me trembling fingers i tore open the envelope and drew out the contents as i feared it proved to be a demand from the most implacable creditor a money-lender to whom i had been introduced by a fellow student the sum i had borrowed from him with the assistance of a friend had been only a trifling one but it helped out by fines and other impositions and it had now increased to an amount which i was aware it was hopelessly impossible for me to pay what was i to do what could i do unless i settled the claim the hope for mercy from the man himself was to say the least of it absurd my friend who i happened to know was himself none too well off at the moment would be called upon to make it good after that how should i be able to face him or anyone else again i had not a single acquaintance in the world from whom i could borrow a sum that would be half sufficient to meet it while well, i dared not go down to the country and tell my father of my folly and disgrace in vain i ransacked my brains for a loophole of escape then the whistle of a steamer on the river attracted my attention filling my brain with such thoughts that it was never entertained before and i pray by god's mercy may never know again here was the way out of my difficulty if only i had the pluck to try it strangely enough the effect it had upon me was to brace me like a draught of rare wine this was succeeded by a coldness so intense both mind and body were rendered callous by it how long it lasted i cannot say it may have been only a few seconds it may have been an hour before consciousness returned and i found myself still standing beside the table holding the fatal letter in my hand like a drunken man i fumbled my way from the room into the hot night outside what was i going to do i did not exactly know i wanted to be alone in some place away from the crowded pavements if possible where i could have time to think and to determine upon my course of action with a tempest of rage against i knew not what in my heart i hurried along up one street and down another until i found myself panting but unappeased upon the embankment opposite temple gardens all around me were the bustle of life of the great city cabs containing men and women in evening dress dashed along girls and their lovers talking in hushed voices went by me arm in arm even the loafers leaning against the stone parapet seemed happy in comparison with my wretched self i looked down at the dark water gurgling so pleasantly below me and i remembered that all i had to do as i was alone was to drop over the side allow it to engulf me and so be done with my difficulties for ever then in a flash the real meaning of what i proposed to do came to me coward coward i hissed with as much vehemence and horror as if i had been addressing a real enemy instead of myself to think of taking this way out of your difficulty if you kill yourself what will become of the other man go to him at once and tell him everything he has the right to know the argument was irresistible and i accordingly turned my heel i was about to start off in quest of the man i wanted and i found myself confronted with no less a person than kelleran he was walking quickly and swung his cane as he did so but seeing me he stopped douglas ingleby he said well this is fortunate you're just the man i want to see i murmured something in reply i forget what I was about to pass on i'd bargain without my host however he had been watching me with his keen dark eyes and when he made as if he would walk with me i was not altogether surprised you don't object to my accompanying you i hope he inquired by the way of introduction of what he had to say i've been wanting to have a talk with you for some days past i'm afraid i'm, rather, uh, I'm afraid i'm in rather a hurry just now i answered quickening my pace a little as i did so it makes no difference to me he returned if i think you're aware i'm a fast walker since you're in a hurry let's step out we did so and for something like fifty yards i proceeded at a brisk pace in perfect silence this at last became more than i could stand and i stopped and faced him what is it you want with me i asked angrily 
cannot you see that i'm not well tonight i would rather be alone i can see you're not quite the thing he answered quietly still watching me with his grave eyes this is exactly why i want to walk with you a little cheerful conversation will do you good you don't know how clever i am at adapting my manner to other people's requirements that is the secret of our profession my dear ingleby as you will some day find out i shall never find it out i replied bitterly i have done with medicine i shall clear out of england i think go abroad try australia or canada anywhere i don't care where to get out of this the very thing he replied cheerily but without a trace of surprise you couldn't do better i'm sure you're strong active full of life and ambition you're just the sort of fellow in fact to make a good colonist must be a grand life that hewing and hacking a place for oneself in a new country watching and fostering the growth of a nation that may some day take the rank among the powers of the earth ha i like the idea it is grand it is magnificent it makes one tingle to think of it he threw his arms out and squared his shoulders as if he were preparing for the struggle he had so graphically described after that we did not walk quite so fast the man had suddenly developed a strange fascination for me and as he talked i hung upon his words with a feverish interest i can scarcely account for now by the time we reached my lodgings i had forgotten my trouble for the time being when i entered my sitting-room and found the envelope which had contained the fatal letter still lying upon the table it all rushed back upon me and with such force that i was well nigh overwhelmed kelleran meanwhile had taken up his position on the hearth-rug whence he watched me with the same expression of contemplative interest upon his face to which i have before alluded hello he said at last after he had been some minutes in the house and he had begun to overhaul my library what are these where did you pick them up he had taken a book from the shelf and was holding it tenderly in his hand i recognized it as one of several volumes of a sixteenth century work on surgery that i had chanced upon in a bookstall in holywell street some months before its age and date had interested me and i had bought it more out of curiosity now for any other reason kelleran however could scarcely withdraw his eyes from it it's the very thing i've been wanting to make my set complete he cried after i had described my discovery of it perhaps you don't know it but i'm a perfect lunatic on the subject of books my own rooms where by the by you have never been are crammed from ceiling to floor and still i go on buying let me see what else you have so saying he continued his survey of the room humming softly to himself as he did so and pulling out such books as interested him and heaping them upon the floor you've by no means a bad collection he was kind enough to say when he had finished judging from what i see here you must read a great deal more than most of our men i'm afraid not i answered the majority of these books were sent up to me from the country by my father who thought they might be of service to me a mistaken notion for they take up a lot of room and i've often wished them at hanover you have have you you goth he continued well then i'll tell you what i'll do if you want to get rid of them i'll buy the lot these old beauties included they're really worth more than i can afford but if you care about it i'll make you a sporting offer of a hundred and fifty pounds for such as i put upon the floor what do you say i could scarcely believe i heard aright his offer was so preposterous that i could have laughed in his face my dear fellow i cried thinking for a moment that he must be joking with me and feeling inclined to resent it what nonsense you talk a hundred and fifty for that lot well they're not worth a ten pound note all told the old fellows are certainly curious but it's only fair that i should tell you that i gave five shillings and sixpence for the set of seven volumes complete then you've got a bargain such as you'll never find again he answered quietly i wish i could make as good an one every day however there's my offer take it or leave it as you please i will give you one hundred and fifty pounds for those books and take my chance of their value if you are prepared to accept i'll get a cab and take them away tonight i've got my cheque-book in my pocket and i'll settle up for them on the spot but my dear kelleran how can you afford to give such here i stopped abruptly i beg your pardon i know i have no right to say such a thing 
don't mention it he answered quietly i'm not in the least offended i assure you i've always felt certain you fellows supposed me to be poor as a matter of fact however i have the good fortune or the ill as i sometimes think to be able to indulge myself to the top of my bent without fear of the consequences but that has nothing to do with the subject at present under discussion will you take my price and let me have the books or not i assure you i am all anxiety to get my nose inside one of those old covers before i sleep to-night heaven knows i was eager enough to accept if you think for one moment you will see what his offer meant to me with such a sum i could not only pay off the money-lender but well nigh put myself straight with the rest of my creditors yet all the time i had the uneasy feeling that the books were no means worth the amount he had declared to be their value and that he was only making me an offer out of kindness are you sure you mean it oh, i will accept i said i am awfully hard up and the money will be a godsend to me i am rejoiced to hear it he replied for in that case we should be doing each other a mutual good turn now let's get them tied up if you wouldn't mind seeing to it i'll write the cheque and call a cab ten minutes later he and his new possessions had taken their departure and i was once more in my room standing beside the table just as i had done a few hours before but with what a difference then i had seen no light ahead nothing but complete darkness and dishonour now i was a new man and in a position to meet the majority of calls upon me the change from the one condition to the other was more than i could bear and when i remembered that less than sixty minutes before i was standing on the antechamber of death the embankment contemplating suicide i broke down completely and sinking into a chair buried my face in my hands and cried like a child next morning as soon as the bank had opened its doors i entered and cashed the cheque calleran had given me and calling a cab i made my way with a light heart as you may suppose to the office of the money-lender in question his surprise on seeing me and on learning the nature of my errand may be better imagined than described having transacted my business with him i was preparing to make my way back to the hospital when an idea entered my head upon which i immediately acted in something under ten minutes i stood in the bookseller's shop in holywell street where i had purchased the volumes kelleran had appeared to prize so much some weeks ago i said to the man who came forward to serve me i purchased from you an old work on medicine entitled the perfect chirurgeon or the art of healing as practised in diverse ancient countries seven volumes very much soiled five and sixpence returned the man immediately i remember the books i'm glad of that i answered now i want you to tell me what you would consider the real market value of the work if it were wanted to make up a collection it might possibly be worth a sovereign the man replied promptly otherwise not more than we asked you for it then you don't think any one would be likely to offer a hundred and fifty pounds for it i inquired the man laughed outright not a man who has possession of his wits he answered no sir i think i've stated the price very fairly though of course it might fetch a few shillings more or less according to the circumstances i'm very much obliged to you so i said i simply wanted to know as a matter of curiosity with that i left the shop and made my way to the hospital where i found kelleran hard at work he looked up at me as i entered and nodded but it was well nigh lunch time before i got an opportunity of speaking to him kelleran i said when i did you deceived me about those books last night they were not worth anything like the value you put on them he looked me full and fair in the face and i saw a faint smile flicker around the corners of his mouth my dear ingleby he said what a funny fellow you are to be sure surely if i choose to give you what i consider the worth of the books i am at perfect liberty to do so and if you are willing to accept it no more need be said upon the subject the value of a thing to a man is what he cares to give for it so i have always been led to believe but i am convinced you did not give it only because you wanted the books you knew i was in straits and you took that form of helping me it was generous of you indeed kelleran and i'll never forget it as long as i live you saved me from but there i cannot tell you i dare not think of it myself but there is one thing i must ask of you i want you to keep the books and to let the amount you gave me for them be a loan which i will repay as soon as i possibly can i was aware that he was a passionate man 
Indeed, once or twice I had seen him in a rage, but never in a greater one than now. Let it be what you please, he cried, turning from me. Only for pity's sake drop the subject. I've had enough of it. With this explosion he stalked away, leaving me standing looking after him, divided between gratitude and amazement. I have narrated this incident for two reasons. In the first place, because it will furnish you with a notion of my own character, which I am prepared to admit exhibits but few good points. And in the second, because it will serve to introduce you to a queer individual, now a very great person, whom I shall always regard as the good angel of my life, and indirectly, it is true, the bringer about of the one and only real happiness I have ever known. From the time of the episode I have just described at such length to the present day, I can safely say that I have neither touched a car nor owed a man a penny piece that I was not fully prepared to pay at a moment's notice, and with this assertion I must revert to the statement made at the commencement of this chapter. The saddest a man can make, as I said then, there could be no doubt about it, that I was a failure. Although I had improved in the particulars just stated, fate was plainly against me. I worked hard and passed my examinations with comparative ease, yet it seemed to do me no good with those above me. The sacred fire of enthusiasm, which had at first been so conspicuously absent, had now taken complete hold of me. I studied night and day, grudging myself no labour, yet by some mischance everything I touched recoiled upon me, and like the serpent of the fable, stung the hand that fostered it. Certainly I was not popular, and since it was due almost directly to Kelleran's influence that I took to my work with such assiduity, it seemed strange that I should also have to attribute my non-success to his agency. As a matter of fact, he was not a good leader to follow. From the very first he had shown himself to be a man of strange ideas. He was no follower or stickler for the orthodox. To sum him up in plainer words, he was what might be described as an experimentalist. In return, the authorities of the hospital looked somewhat askance upon him. Finally he passed out into the world, and the same term saw me appointed to the rank of house surgeon. Almost simultaneously my father died, and to the horror of the family, an examination of his affairs, instead of proving him the wealthy man we supposed him to be, showed there was barely sufficient, when his liabilities were paid, to meet the expenses of his funeral. The shock of his death and the knowledge of the poverty to which he had been so suddenly reduced proved too much for my mother, and she followed him a few weeks later. Thus I was left, so far as I knew, without kith or kin in the world, with but a few friends, no money, and the poorest possible prospects of ever making it. The circumstances under which I lost the position of house surgeon, I will not allude, let it suffice that I did lose it, and that, although the authorities seem to think otherwise, I am in a position to prove, whenever I desire to do so, that I was not the real culprit. The effect, however, was the same. I was disgraced beyond hope of redemption, and the proud career I had mapped out for myself was now beyond my reach for good and all. Over the next twelve months, it would be better that I should draw a veil. Even now I scarcely like to think of them. It is enough for me to say that for upwards of a month I remained in London, searching high and low for employment. This, however, was easier looked for than discovered. Try how I would, I could hear of nothing. Then, weary of the struggle, I accepted an offer made me and left England as a surgeon on board an outward-bound passenger steamer for Australia. Ill luck, however, still pursued me, for at the end of my second voyage the company went into liquidation and its vessels were sold. I shipped on board another boat in a similar capacity, did two voyages in her to the Cape, where on a friend's advice I bade her goodbye, and started for a shanty, a surgeon to an inland trading company. While there I was wounded in the neck by a spear, was compelled to leave the company's service, and eventually found myself back once more in London, tramping the streets in search of employment. Fortunately, I had managed to save a small sum from my pay. So that I was not altogether destitute, it was not long, however, before this was exhausted. 
and then things looked blacker than they had ever done before. What to do I knew not. I had long since cast my pride to the winds, and was now prepared to take anything, no matter what. Then an idea struck me, and on it I acted. Leaving my lodgings on the Surrey side of the river, I crossed Blackfriars Bridge and made my way along the embankment, in a westerly direction. As I went, I could not help contrasting my present appearance with that I had shown on the last occasion I had walked that way. Then I had been as spruce and neat as a man could well be, boasted a good coat to my back and a new hat upon my head. Now, however, the coat and hat, instead of speaking for my prosperity, as at one time they might have done, bore unmistakable evidence of the disastrous change which had taken place in my fortunes. Indeed, if the truth must be confessed, I was about as sorry a specimen of the professional man as could be found in the length and breadth of the metropolis. Reaching the thoroughfare in which I had heard Kellerin had taken up his abode, I cast about me for a means of ascertaining his number. Compared with that in which I myself resided, this was a street of palaces, and it seemed to me I could read the characters of the various tenants in the appearance of each house front. The particular one before which I was standing at the moment was frivolous in the extreme. The front door was daintily painted. An elaborate knocker ornamented the centre panel, while the windows were, without exception, curtained with expensive stuffs. Everything pointed to the mistress being a lady of fashion, and having put one thing and another together, I felt convinced I should not find my friend there. The next I came to was a residence of more substantial type. Here everything was solid and plain, even to the borders of severity. If I could sum up the owner, he was a successful man, a lawyer from choice, a bachelor, and possibly, even probably, a bigot on matters of religion. He would have two or three friends, not more, I thought, all of whom would be advanced in years, and like himself, successful men of business. He would be able to appreciate a glass of dry sherry, would have nothing to do with anything that did not bear the impress of being a gilt-edged security. As neither of these houses seemed to suggest that they would be likely to know anything of the man I wanted, I made my way farther down the street, keeping my eyes open as I proceeded. At last I came to a standstill before one that I was prepared to swear was inhabited by my old friend. His character was stamped unmistakably upon every inch of it. The untidy windows, the pile of books upon the table behind them, the marks upon the front door where his impatient foot had often pressed while he turned his latch-key. All these spoke of Kelleran, and I was certain my instinct was not misleading me. Ascending the steps, I rang the bell. It was answered by a tall, somewhat austere woman of between forty and fifty years of age upon whom a coquettish frilled apron and cap sat with an incongruous effect. As I afterwards learnt, she had been Kelleran's nurse in bygone years, and since he had become a householder, she had taken charge of his domestic arrangements, and ruled both himself and his maidservants with a rod of iron. Would you be kind enough to inform me if Mr. Kelleran is at home? I asked after we had taken stock of each other. He has been abroad for more than three months, the woman answered abruptly. Then, seeing the disappointment upon my face, she added, I don't know when we may expect him home. He may be here on Saturday, and on the other hand, we may not see him for two or three weeks to come. Perhaps you'll not mind telling me what your business with him may be. It's not very important, I answered humbly, feeling that my position was to say the least of it an invidious one. I'm an old friend, and I want to see him for a few minutes. Since, however, he's not at home, it does not matter. I assure you, I shall have other opportunities of communicating with him. At the same time, you might be kind enough to tell him I called. In that case, you'd better let me know your name, she replied with a look that suggested, as plainly as any words could speak, that she did not for an instant believe my assertion that I was a friend of her master's. My name is Ingleby, I said. Mr. Calloran will be sure to remember me. We were at the same hospital. She gave a scornful sniff as if such a thing would be very unlikely, and then made as if she would shut the door in my face. I was not, however, to be put off in this fashion. Taking a card from my pocket, I scrawled upon it, 
i scrawled my name and present address upon it and handed it to her perhaps if you will show that to mr kelleran he would not mind writing to me when he comes home i said that is where i am living just now she glanced at the card and then noting the locality sniffed even more scornfully than before it was evident this was the only thing wanting to confirm the bad impression i had created in her mind for some seconds there was an ominous silence very well she answered at length i'll give it to him but why heaven save us what's the matter you're as white as a sheet why didn't you say you were feeling ill i had been running it rather close for more than a week past and the news that kelleran my last hope was absent from england had unnerved me altogether a sudden giddiness seized me and under the influence of it i should have fallen to the ground had i not clutched the railings by my side it was then that the real nature of the woman became apparent like a ministering angel she half led half supported me into the house and seated me on a chair in the somewhat sparsely furnished hall friend of the master or no friend i heard her say to herself i'll take the risk of it i heard no more for my senses had left me when they returned i found myself lying upon a sofa in keller and study the housekeeper standing by my side and a maid-servant casting sympathetic glances at me from the doorway i am afraid i put you to a lot of trouble i said as soon as i had recovered myself sufficiently to speak i cannot think what made me go off like that i have never done such a thing in my life before you can't think queried the woman with a curious intonation that was not lost upon me then it's very plain you've not much wit about you i think young man i could make a very good guess at the truth if i wanted to howsoever let that be as it may i'll put a bit of it right before you leave this house or my name's not what it is and turning to the maid who was still watching me she continued sharply be off about your business miss and do as i told you are you going to waste all afternoon standing there staring about you like a gabby the girl disappeared only to return a few minutes later with a tray upon which was a substantial meal of cold meat on the old woman's authorization i sat down to it and dined as i had not done for months past there she said with an air of triumph as i finished that will make a new man of you and having done all she could for me and repenting perhaps of the leniency she had shown me she returned to her former abrupt demeanour and informed me in terms that there was no mistaking that her time was valuable and that it behoved me to be off about my business as soon as possible while she had been speaking my eyes had travelled round the room until they alighted upon the mantelpiece it was covered with pipes books photographs and all the innumerable odds and ends that accumulate in a bachelor's apartment where i discovered my own portrait with several others i remembered having given it to kelleran two years before it was not a very good one but with this assistance i proposed to establish my identity proved to my stern benefactor that i was not altogether the impostor she believed me to be i cannot tell you how grateful i am to you for all you have done i said as i rose and prepared to make my departure from the house at the same time i am very much afraid you do not altogether believe that i am the friend of your masters that i pretend to be tut, tut, she answered if i were in your place i'd say no more about that least said soon as mended is my motto i trust however i am a christian woman and do my best to help folk in distress but i've warned ye already that i have eyes in my head and wit enough to tell what's a clock just as well as my neighbours why bless my soul you don't think i've been all my years in the world without knowing what's what or who's who she paused as if for breath and embracing the opportunity i crossed the room and took from the chimney-piece the photograph to which i have just alluded possibly this may help to reassure you i said as i placed it before her i do not think i have changed that much since it was taken that you should fail to recognize me she picked up the photo and looked at it reading the signature at the bottom with a puzzled face heaven save us so it is she cried when the meaning of it dawned upon her you are mr ingleby after all well i'm a softy to be sure i thought you were trying to take me in so many people come here asking to see him saying they're at the hospital with him if i'd have thought it really was you i'd have bitten my tongue out before i had said what i did why sir why sir the master talks of you to this day thing will be this and ingleby that from morning till night 
Many's the time he's made inquiries from gentlemen who've been here, in the hope of finding out what has become of you. God bless him, I said, with my heart warming at the news that he had not forgotten me. We were the best of friends once. But, Mr. Ingleby, continued the old woman after a pause, if you'll allow me to say so, I don't like to see you like this. You must have seen a lot of trouble, sir, to have got into such a state. The world has not treated me very kindly, I answered with an attempt at a smile. But I'll tell Kelleran all about it when I see him. You think it's possible he may be home on Saturday? I hope so, sir. I'm sure she replied. You may be certain I'll give him your address and tell him you've called the moment I see him. I thanked her again for her trouble, took my departure, feeling a very different man as I went down the steps and turned my face cityward. In my own heart, I felt certain Kelleran would do something to help me. Had I known, however, what that something was destined to be, I wonder whether I should have awaited his coming with such eagerness. As it transpired, it was on the Friday following my call at his house, and on returning to my lodgings after another day's fruitless search for employment, I found the following letter awaiting me. The handwriting was as familiar to me as my own, and it may be imagined with what eagerness I tore open the envelope and scanned the contents. It ran, My dear Ingleby, there's a pleasant welcome home to hear that you were in England once more. I am sorry, however, to find from my housekeeper that affairs have not been prospering with you. This must be remedied, and at once. I flatter myself I am just the man to do it. It is possible you may consider me unfeeling when I say that there were never such luck as yours being in want of employment at this particular moment. I have a billet standing by and waiting for you, one of the very sort you are best fitted for, and one which you will enjoy unless you have lost your former instincts. You have never met Dr. Nicola, but you must do so without delay. I tell you, Ingleby, he is the most wonderful man with whom I have ever been brought in contact. We chanced upon each other in St. Petersburg three months ago, and since then he's had a fascination for me such as no other man has ever had. I have spoken of you to him, and in consequence he dines with me tonight in the hope of meeting you. Whatever else you do, therefore, do not fail to put in an appearance. You cannot guess the magnitude of the experiment upon which he is at work. First glance, and in any other man, it would seem incredible, impossible, almost absurd. When, however, you have seen him, I venture to say you will not doubt that he will carry it through. Let me count upon you tonight, then, at seven. Always your friend, Andrew Fairfax Kelleran. I read the letter again. What did it mean? At any rate, it contained a ray of hope. It would have to be a very curious billet, I told myself, under present circumstances, that I would refuse. But who was this extraordinary individual, Dr. Nicola, who seemed to have exercised such a fascination over my enthusiastic friend? Well, that I had to find out for myself. End of chapter one. Chapter 2 of Dr. Nicholas' Experiment by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 The clocks in the neighbourhood had scarcely ceased striking when I ascended the steps of Kelleran's house and rang the bell. Even had he not been so impressive in his invitation, there was small likelihood of my forgetting the appointment. I had been waiting for it hour by hour with an impatience that can only be understood when I say that each one was bringing me nearer the only proper meal I had had since I last visited his abode. The door was opened to me by the same faithful housekeeper, who had proved herself such a ministering angel on the previous occasion. She greeted me as an old friend, but with a greater respect than she had shown when we had last talked together. This did not prevent her, however, from casting a scrutinising eye over me, as much as to say, you look a bit more respectable, my lad. Your coat is very green at the seams, your collar is frayed at the edge, and you sniff the smell of dinner as if you had not had a decent meal for longer than you care to think about. All of which would have been perfectly true. Step inside, she said. Mr. Kelleran's waiting for you in the study, I know. Then, sinking her voice to a whisper, she added, there's duck and green peas for dinner. 
and as soon as the other gentleman arrives i shall tell cook to dish you'll not be long now what answer i should have returned i cannot say but as she finished speaking a door further down the passage opened and my old friend made his appearance with that impetuosity which always characterised him ingleby my dear fellow he cried as he ran with outstretched hand to greet me i cannot tell you how pleased i am to see you again seems years since i last set eyes on you come along in here i want to have a good look at you we've tons of things to say to each other and heaps of questions to ask haven't we and by jove we must look sharp about it too for in a few minutes nikola will be here i asked him to come at quarter past seven in order that we might have a little time alone together first so saying he led me into his study the same in which i had returned to my senses after my fainting fit a few days before and bade me seat myself in an easy chair you can't think how good it is to see you again kellaran i said as soon as i could get in a word i begin to think myself forgotten by all my friends bosh was his uncompromising reply talk about your friends why you never know who they are till you're in trouble at least that's what i always think and by the way let me tell you that you do look a bit pulled down i wonder what idiocy you've been up to since i saw you last tell me all about it you won't smoke very good now fire away thus encouraged i told him in a few words all my experiences since we had last met while i was talking he stood before me his face lit up with interest and to all intents and purposes as absorbed in my story as as if it had been his own well thank goodness it's all over now he said when i brought my tale to a conclusion i found you a billet that will suit you admirably and if you play your cards well there's no saying to what it may not lead nikola is the most marvellous man in the world as you will admit when you meet him i for one have never seen anybody like him and as for this new scheme of his why if he brings it off i give you my word it will revolutionize science i was too well acquainted with my friend's enthusiastic way of talking to be surprised at it at the same time i was thoroughly conversant with his cleverness and for this reason i was prepared to believe if he thought well of any scheme that there was something out of the common in it but what is this wonderful idea i asked scarcely able to contain my longing as the fumes of dinner penetrated to us from the regions below and how am i affected by it that i must leave for dr nikola to tell you himself kelleran replied let it suffice for the moment that i envy your opportunity i believe if i had been able to avail myself of the chance he offered me of going into it with him i should have been compelled to sacrifice you but there you will hear all about it in good time for if i mistake not that is his cab drawing up outside now it is one of his peculiarities to be always punctual to the moment Will you make the right time by your watch i was obliged to confess that i possess no watch it had been turned into the necessaries of existence long since Calloran must have seen what was passing in my mind though he pretended not to have noticed it at any rate he said i make it a quarter past seven to the minute and i am prepared to wager that's our man the bell rang almost before the sound of it had died away the study door opened and the housekeeper with a look of awe upon her face which had not been there when she addressed me announced dr nikola looking back on it now in spite of all that has happened since i find that my impressions of that moment are as fresh and as clear as if it had happened yesterday i could see the tall lithe figure of this extraordinary man his sallow face and his piercing black eyes steadfastly regarding me as if he were trying to determine whether i was capable of assisting him in the work upon which he was so exhaustively engaged never before had i seen such eyes they seemed to look me through and through and to read my inmost thought this gentleman my dear kellerad he began after they had shaken hands without waiting for me to be introduced to him should be your friend ingleby of whom you have so often spoken to me how do you do mr ingleby i don't think there is much doubt but that we shall work admirably together you have lately been in a shanty i perceive i admitted that i had and went on to inquire how he'd become aware of it for as kelleran had not known until a few minutes before i did not see 
how he could be acquainted with the fact it's not a very difficult thing to tell he answered with a smile at my astonishment seeing that you carry about with you the mark of a guato spear if it were necessary i could tell you some more things that would surprise you for instance i could tell you that the man who cut it out for you was an amateur at his work that he was left-handed he was short-sighted and that he was recovering from malaria at the time all this is plain to the eye but i see our friend Calleran fancies his dinner is getting cold so we had better postpone the subject for a more convenient opportunity we accordingly left the study and proceeded to the dining room all day long i had been looking forward to that moment with the eagerness of a starving man yet when it arrived i scarcely touched anything if the truth must be confessed there was something about this man that made me forget such mundane matters as mere eating and drinking and i noticed that nikola himself scarcely touched anything this reason save for the fact that he himself enjoyed it the bountiful spread kelleran had arranged was completely wasted during the progress of the meal no mention was made of the great experiment upon which our host had informed me nikola was engaged my conversation was mainly devoted to travel Nicola, I soon discovered, had been everywhere, and he had seen everything. There appeared to be no place on the face of the habitable globe with which he was not acquainted, and of which he could not speak with the authority of an old resident. China, India, Australia, South America, North, South, East and West Africa were as familiar to him as Piccadilly, and it was in connection with one of the last-named countries that a curious incident cropped up. We had been discussing various cases of catalepsy, and to illustrate an argument he was adducing, Kelleran narrated a curious instance of lethargy which he had seen in southern Russia. But while he was speaking, I noticed that Nicola's face wore an expression that was partly one of derision and partly one of amusement. I think I can furnish you with an instance that's even more extraordinary, I said, when our host had finished, and as I did so, Nicola leaned a little towards me. In fairness to your argument, however, Caroan, I must admit that why it comes under the same category, the malady in question confines itself almost exclusively to the black races on the west coast of Africa. You refer to the sleeping sickness, I presume, said Nicola, whose eyes were fixed upon me, and who was paying the greatest attention to all I said. Exactly, the sleeping sickness, I answered. I was fortunate enough to see several instances of it when I was on the west coast though the one to which i am referring did not come before me personally but was described to me by a man a rather curious character who happened to be in the district at the time the negro in question a fine healthy fellow of about twenty years of age was servant to a portuguese trader at cape coast castle he had been up country on some trading expedition or other and during the whole time had enjoyed the very best of health for the first few days after his return to the coast however he was unusually depressed a slight swelling of the cervical gland set in accompanied by a tendency to fall asleep at any time this somnolency gradually increased cutaneous stimulation was tried at first with comparative success the symptoms however soon recurred the periods of sleep became longer and more frequent until at last the patient could scarcely have been said to be ever awake the case so my informant said was an extremely interesting one what was the result inquired kelleran a little impatiently you have not told us to what all this is leading well the result was that in due course the patient became extremely emaciated a perfect skeleton in fact he would take no food answered no questions and did not open his eyes from morning till night to make a long story short just as my informant was beginning to think that the end was approaching there appeared in cape coast castle a mysterious stranger who put forward a claims to the knowledge of medicine he foregathered with my man and after a while obtained permission to try his hand upon the negro he killed him at once of course nothing of the sort the thing happened that you will scarcely credit the whole business was most irregular i believe but my friend was not likely to worry himself much about that this new man had his own pharmacopoeia a collection of essences in small bottles more like what they used in the middle ages than anything else i should imagine having obtained possession of the patient he carried him away to a hut outside the town took him in hand there and then 
the man who told me about it and who i should have said had a good experience of the disease assured me that he was as certain as any one possibly could be that the chap would not live out the week and yet when the newcomer ten days later invited him to visit the hut there was the man acting as his servant waiting at table if you please and to all intents and purposes though very thin as well as ever he had been in his life but my dear fellow protested kellerin Gurin says that out of the hundred and forty eight cases that come under his notice a hundred and forty eight died can't help that i said a little warmly i'm afraid i'm only telling you what my friend told me he gave me his word of honour that the result was as he had described but i had not finished my story when you interrupted me the strangest part of the whole business has yet to be told it appears that the man had not only cured the fellow but that he had had the power of returning him to the condition in which he found him at will it wasn't hypnotism what it was is more than i can say at any rate my informant described it to me as about being the uncanniest performance he had ever witnessed in what way asked kelleran furnish us with a more detailed account there was a time when you were a famous hand at the diagnosis i would willingly do so i answered unfortunately however i can't remember it all it appears that he was always saying the most mysterious things and putting the strangest questions and on one occasion he asked my friend as they were standing by the negro's bedside if there was any one whose image he would care to see merton at first thought he was making fun of him but seeing that he was in earnest he considered for a moment and eventually answered that he would very much like to see the portrait of an old shipmate who had perished at sea some six or seven years prior to his arrival on the west coast as soon as he had said this the man stooped over the bed and opening the sleeping nigger's eyes examine the retina he said and i think you will see what you want my friend looked and what did he see inquired kellerin nicola said nothing but smiled as i thought a trifle sceptically seems an absurd thing to say i know i continued but he swore to me that he had before him the exact picture of the man he had referred to standing on the deck of a steamer just as he had last seen him it was as clear and distinct as if it had been a photograph and all the time the negro was asleep fast asleep i answered i should very much like to meet your friend said kelleran emphatically a man with an imagination like that must be an exceedingly interesting companion but seriously my dear ingleby you don't mean to say you wish us to believe that all this really happened i am telling you what he told me i answered i cannot swear to the truth of it of course but i will go as far as to say that i do not think he was intentionally deceiving me kelleran shrugged his shoulders incredulously for some moments an uncomfortable silence ensued this was broken by nicola my dear kelleran he said i don't think you're altogether fair to our friend ingleby as he admits he was only speaking on hearsay and under these circumstances he might very easily have been deceived fortunately however for the sake of his reputation i am in a position to corroborate all he has said the deuce you are cried kelleran well i was too much astonished to speak I could only stare at him in complete surprise what on earth do you mean pray explain i can only do so by saying i was the man who did this apparently wonderful thing kelleran and i continued to stare at him in amazement could he be laughing at us and yet his face was serious enough you do not seem to credit my assertion said nicola quietly and yet i assure you it is correct i was the mysterious individual who appeared in cape coast castle who brought with him his own pharmacopoeia and who wrought the miracle which your friend appears to have considered so wonderful the coincidence is so extraordinary i answered as if in protest coincidences are necessarily extraordinary nicola replied i do not see that this is one more so than usual and the miracle it was in reality no miracle at all he answered but a logical outcome of a perfectly natural process pray do not look so incredulous i am aware that my statement is difficult to believe but i assure you that my dearing will be that it is quite true however proof is always better than a search so since you are still sceptical let me make my position right with you for reasons that will be self-evident i cannot produce the effect in a negro's eye but i can do so in a way that will strike you as being scarcely less marvellous if you drop your chairs i will endeavour to explain needless to remark we did as he desired 
and when we were seated on either side of him waited for the manifestation he had promised us taking a small silver box but a little larger than a card case from his pocket he opened it and tipped what might have been a teaspoonful of black powder into the centre of a dessert plate i watched it closely in the hope of being able to discover of what it was composed my efforts however were unavailing it was black as i have already said and from a distance resembled powdered charcoal this however it could not have been by reason of its strange liquidity which was as great as that of quicksilver and which came into operation when it had been exposed to the air some minutes hither and thither the stuff ran about the dish and i noticed that as it did so it gradually lost its original sombre hue and took to itself a variety of colours that were as brilliant as the component tints of the spectrum these scintillated and quivered till the eyes were almost blinded by their radiance and yet it riveted the attention in such a manner that it was well nigh if not quite impossible to look away or think of anything else in vain i tried to calm myself in order that i might be a cool and collected observer of what was taking place whether there was any perfume thrown off by the stuff upon the plate i cannot say but as i watched it my head began to swim and my eyelids felt as heavy as lead that this was not fancy upon my part is borne out by the fact that kelleran afterwards confessed to me that he experienced exactly the same sensations nicola however was still manipulating the dish turning it this way and that as if he were anxious to produce as many varieties of colour as possible in a given time it must have been upwards of five minutes before he spoke and as he did so he gave the plate an extra tilt so that the mixture ran down to one side it was now a deep purple in colour i think if you will look into the centre of the fluid you will see something that will go a long way towards convincing you of the truth of the assertion i made just now he said quietly but without turning his head to look at me i looked as he desired but at first could see nothing save the mixture itself which was fast turning from purple to blue this blue soon grew paler and as i watched to my astonishment a picture formed itself before my eyes i saw a long wooden house surrounded on all sides by a deep veranda the latter was covered with a beautiful flowering creeper on either side of the dwelling was a grove of palms and to the right showing like a pool of dazzling quicksilver between the trees was the sea and over everything was a sensation of intense heat at first glance i could not recall the house but it was not long before i recognised the residence of the man who had told me the story which had occasioned this miracle i looked at it again and could even see the window of the room in which i had recovered from my first severe attack of fever and from which i never thought to have emerged alive with the sight of it the recollection of that miserable time came back to me kelleran and even his friend nicola were for the time being forgotten from the expression on your face i gather that you know the place said nicola after i had been watching it for a few moments now look into the veranda and tell me if you recognise the two men you see seated there i looked again and saw that one was myself while the other was the man who was leaning against the veranda rail smoking a cigar was the owner of the house itself there could be no mistake about it the whole scene was as plain before my eyes as if it had been a photograph taken on the spot there said nicola with a little note of triumph in his voice i hope that will convince you that when i say i can do a thing i mean it so saying he tilted the saucer and the picture vanished in a whirl of colour i tried to protest but before i had time to say anything the liquid had in some strange fashion resolved itself once more into a powder nicola had tipped it back into the silver box and kelleran and i were left to put the best explanation we could upon it we looked at each other and feeling that i could not make head or tail of what i had seen i waited for him to speak i never saw such a thing in my life he cried when he found sufficient voice if anyone had told me that such a thing was possible i would not have believed him i can scarcely credit the evidence of my senses now in fact you feel towards the little exhibition i have just given you very much as you did to ingleby's story a quarter of an hour ago said nicola what a doubting world it is to be sure the same world which ridiculed the notion there could be anything in vaccination 
in the steam engine, in chloroform, the telegraph, the telephone, or the phonograph? For how many years has it scoffed at the power of hypnotism? How many of our cleverest scientists fifty years ago could have foretold the discovery of argon, or the possibility of being able to telegraph without the aid of wires? And because the little world of today knows these things and has survived the wonder of them, it thinks it has attained the end of wisdom. The folly of it. Tonight I have shown you something for which less than a hundred years ago I should have been stoned as a wizard. At my death the secret will be given to the world, and the world, when it has recovered from its astonishment, will say, How very simple. Why did no one think of it before? I tell you, gentlemen, Nicola continued, rising and standing before the fireplace, that we three tonight are standing on the threshold of a discovery which will shake the world to its foundations. When he had moved, Pellerin and I had also pushed back our chairs from the table, and were now watching him as if turned to stone. The sacred fire of enthusiasm, which I thought had left me forever, was once more kindling in my breast, and I hung upon his words as if I were afraid I might lose even that breath that escaped his lips. As for Nicola himself, his usually pallid face was now aglow with excitement. The story is as old as the hills, he began. Ever since the days when our first parents trod the earth, there have been men who have aimed at discovering a means of lengthening the span of life. In the very infancy of science, the wisest and cleverest have devoted their lives to the study of the human body in the hope of mastering its secret, assisting in the search for that particular something which was to revolutionise the world, we find Zosimus, the Theban, the Jewess, Maria, the Arabian, Geba, Hermes, Trismegatus, Linnaeus, Vesalius, Cuvier, Raymond Lully, Paracelsus, Roger Bacon, de Lille, Albertus Magnus, and even Dr. Price, each in his turn quarried into the mountain of wisdom and died having failed to achieve the success he hoped for. And why? Because egotistical, as it may seem on my part to say so, they did not seek in the right place. They commenced at the wrong point, and worked from it in the wrong direction. But if they failed to find what they wanted, they at least rendered good service to those who followed after. For from every failure something may be learned. For my part I have studied the subject in every form, in every detail. For more years than I can tell you, I have lived for it, dreamed of it, fought for it, and overcome obstacles of the very existence of which no man could dream. The work of my predecessors is known to me. I have studied their writings, tested their experiments to the last particular. All the knowledge that modern science has accumulated, I have acquired. The magic of the East I have explored and tested to the utmost. Three years ago, I visited Tibet under extraordinary circumstances. There, in a certain place inaccessible to the ordinary man, and at the risk of my own life and that of the brave man who accompanied me, I obtained the information which was destined to prove the coping stone of the great discovery I have since made. Only two things were wanting then to complete the whole and to enable me to get to work. One of these I had just found in St. Petersburg when I first met you, Kelleran. The other I discovered three weeks ago. It has been a long and tedious search. But such labour only makes success the sweeter. The machinery is now prepared. All that remains is to fit the various parts together. In six months' time, if all goes well, I will have a man walking upon this earth who, under certain conditions, shall live a thousand years. I could scarcely believe that I heard aright. Was the man deliberately asking us to believe that he had really found the way to prolong human life indefinitely? It sounded very much like it, and yet this was the nineteenth century, and... But at this point I ceased my speculations. Had I not only that evening witnessed an exhibition of his marvellous powers, if he had penetrated so far into the unknowable, at least what we consider the unknowable, as to be able to work such a miracle, why should we doubt that he could carry out what he was now professing to be able to do? And when shall we be permitted to hear the result of your labours? asked Kelleran, with a humility that was surprising for a man usually so self assertive. Who can say? asked Nicola. These things are more or less dependent on time. 
it may be only a short period before i am ready on the other hand a lifetime may elapse the process is above all a gradual one and to hurry it might be to spoil everything and now my dear Caleran, with your permission i will bid you good night i leave for the north at daybreak and i have much to do before i go if i am not taking you away too soon ingleby perhaps you would not mind walking a short distance with me i have a good deal to say to you i should be very pleased i answered and the look that Kelleran gave me showed me that he considered my decision a wise one in that case come along said nikola good night Kelleran. many thanks for the introduction you have given me i feel quite sure ingleby and i will get on admirably together he shook hands with Kelleran and passed into the hall leaving me alone with the man who had proved my benefactor for the second time in my life good night old fellow i said as i shook him by the hand i cannot thank you sufficiently for your goodness in putting me in the way of this billet it has given me another chance and i shan't forget your kindness as long as i live don't be absurd Kelleran answered you take things too seriously i feel sure your advantage is as much nicholas as yours he's a wonderful man and you're the very fellow he requires between you you ought to be able to bring about something that will upset the calculations of certain pompous old fossils of our acquaintance good night and good luck to you so saying he led us out of the front door and stood upon the doorstep watching us as we walked down the street it was an exquisite night the moon was almost at the full and her mellow rays made the street almost as light as day my companion and i did for some distance walk in silence he did not speak and i already entertained too much respect for him to interrupt his reverie more than once i glanced at his tall graceful figure and the admirably shaped head which seemed such a fitting case for the extraordinary brain inside as i said just now he began at length as if we were continuing a conversation which had been suddenly interrupted i leave at daybreak for the north of england for the purposes of the experiment i am about to make it is vitally necessary that i should possess a residence far removed from other people where i should not run any risk of being disturbed for this reason i have purchased allerdine castle in northumberland a fine old place overlooking the north sea it is by no means an easy spot to get at and should suit my purposes admirably i shall not see you before i go so that whatever i have to say had better be said at once to begin with i presume you have made up your mind to assist me in the work i am about to undertake if you consider me competent i answered i shall be only too glad to do so Kelleran has assured me that i could not have a better assistant he replied and i am willing to take you upon his recommendation if you have no objection to bring forward we may as well consider the matter settled have you any idea as to the remuneration you will require i answered that i had not and that i would leave it to him to give me what he considered fair in reply he named a sum that almost took my breath away i remarked that i should be satisfied with half the amount whereupon he laughed good-humouredly i'm afraid we're neither of us good businessmen he said by all the laws of trade on finding that i offered you more than you expected you should have stood out for twice as much still i like you all the better for your honesty and now my road turns off here and i will bid you good night in an hour i will send my servants to you the letter containing full instructions i need scarcely say that i am sure you will carry them out to the letter i will do so come what may i answered seriously then good night he said and held out his hand to me all being well we shall meet again in two or three days good night i replied then with a wave of his hand to me he sprang into a hansom which he had called up to the pavement gave the direction to the driver and a moment later was round the corner and out of sight after he had gone i continued my homeward journey i had not been in the house an hour before i was informed that someone was at the door desiring to see me i accordingly hurried downstairs to find myself face to face with the most extraordinary individual i have ever seen in my life first glance i scarcely knew what to make of him but when the light from the hall lamp fell upon his face i saw that he was a chinaman and the ugliest i have ever seen in all my experience of the mongolian race his eyes squinted terribly a portion of his nose was missing and he was minus his left ear it was the sort of face one sees in a nightmare and accustomed as i was by my profession 
to horrible sights i must admit my gorge rose at him at first it did not occur to me to connect him with nikola do you want to see me i inquired in some astonishment he nodded his head but did not speak what's it about i continued he uttered a peculiar grunt and produced a letter and a small box from his pocket both of which he handed to me i understood immediately from whom he came signing him to remain where he was until i could tell him whether there was an answer i turned into the house and opened the letter having read it i returned to the front door you can tell dr nikola that i will be sure to attend to it i said you savvy he nodded his head and next moment was on his way down the street when he was out of sight i returned to my bedroom and lighting the gas once more perused the communication i had received as I did so, a piece of paper fell from between the leaves. I picked it up to discover that it was a cheque for one hundred pounds payable to myself. The letter ran. My dear Ingleby, according to the promise I made you this evening, I am sending you here with your instructions, as clearly worked out as I can make them. To begin with, I want you to remain in town until Monday next. On the morning of that day, if all goes well, you will be advised by the agent of the company in London of the arrival of the river of the steamship donna mercedes bound from cadiz to newcastle on receipt of that information you will be good enough to board her and to inquire for don miguel de moreno and his great-granddaughter who are passengers by the boat to england i have already arranged with the company for your passage so you have no anxiety upon that score you will find the don a very old man and i beg that you will take the greatest possible care of him for this reason i have sent you accompanying drugs each of which is labelled with the fullest instructions they should not be made use of unless absolutely required here followed a list of the various symptoms for which i was to watch and an exhaustive resume of the treatment i was to employ in the event of certain contingencies arising on the arrival of the vessel in newcastle the letter continued i will communicate with you again in the meantime i send you what i think will serve to pay your expenses until we meet your sincere friend nikola p s one last word of warning should you by any chance be brought into contact with a certain mongolian of a very sinister appearance and boasting but one ear have nothing whatsoever to do with him keep out of his way and above all let him know nothing of your connection with myself. This, I beg you to believe, is no idle warning, for all our lives depend upon it. Having thoroughly mastered the contents of this curious epistle, I turned my attention to the parcel which had accompanied it. This, I found, was made up of a number of small packets, evidently containing powders and two-ounce vials of some tasteless and scentless liquid, to which I was quite unable to assign a name. Once more I glanced at the letter in order to make sure of the name of the man whose guardian I was destined for the future to be. De Moreno was the name, and his granddaughter was accompanying him. In an idle, dreamy way, I wondered what the latter would prove to be like. For some reason or other, I found myself thinking a good deal of her, and when I fell asleep that night, it was to dream that she was standing before me with outstretched hands, imploring me to save her not only from a certain one-eared Chinaman, but also from Nicola himself. End of chapter 2after my meeting with Nicola at Kelleran's house, it was a new prospect that life opened up for me. I confronted the future with a smiling face, and no longer told myself, as I had done so often of late, that failure and I were inseparable companions, and for any success I might hope to achieve in the world, I had better be out of it. On the contrary, when I retired to rest after the receipt of Nicola's letter, as narrated in the preceding chapter, it was with happier heart than I had known for more than two years past, and a fixed determination that, happen what might, even if his wonderful experiment came to naught, my new employer should not find me lacking in desire to serve him. As for that experiment itself, I scarcely knew what to think about it. 
to a man who had studied the human frame its wonderful mechanism combined with its many deficiencies and imperfections it seemed impossible it could succeed and yet strange as it may appear to say so there was something about nikola that made one feel sure he would not embark upon such an undertaking if he were not quite certain or at least had not a well-grounded hope of being able to bring it to a favourable issue however successful or unsuccessful the fact remained that i was to be associated with him and the very thought of such cooperation was sufficient to send the blood tingling through my veins with a new life and strength during the two days that elapsed between my meeting with nikola and the arrival of the vessel for which he had told me to be on the lookout i saw nothing of kelleran i was not idle however in the first place it was necessary for me to replenish my wardrobe which as i have already observed stood in need of considerable additions and in the second i was anxious to consult some books of reference to which nikola had directed my attention by the time i had done these things therefore i had not as may be supposed very much leisure left either for paying visits or for receiving them i was careful however to write thanking him for the good turn he had done me and wishing him good-bye in case i did not see him before i left it was between eight and nine o'clock on the monday morning following that i received a note from the steamship company to which nikola had referred advising me that their vessel the donna mercedes had arrived from cadiz and was now lying in the river and would sail for the north at eleven o'clock precisely accordingly i gathered my luggage together what there was of it and made my way down to her as nikola had predicted i found her lying in the pool on boarding her i was confronted by a big burly man with a long brown beard which blew over either shoulder and met behind his head as if it were some new kind of comforter i inquired for the skipper i am the captain he answered and i suppose you are dr ingleby i had a letter from the owners saying you were going north with us you may be sure we'll do our best to make you comfortable in the meantime the steward will show you your berth and look after your luggage as he said this he beckoned a hand aft and sent him below in search of the official in question i think you have a lady and gentleman on board who are expecting me i remarked after the momentary pause which followed the man's departure that i have sir he answered with emphasis and a nice responsibility they've been for me i wouldn't undertake another like it if i were paid a hundred pounds extra for my trouble but perhaps you know the old gentleman i've never seen him in my life i replied but i have to take charge of him until we get to the north then i wish you joy of your work he continued you'll have your time pretty fully occupied i can tell you in what way i inquired i should consider it a favour if you'll tell me all you can about him is the old gentleman eccentric well, what is the matter with him eccentric replied the skipper rolling his tongue round the word as if he liked its flavour well he may be that for all i know but it's not his eccentricity that gives the trouble it's his age why i'll be bound he's a hundred if he's a day he's not a man at all only a bag of bones can't move out of his berth can't walk can't talk can't do a single hand's turn to help himself his bones are almost through his skin his eyes are sunk so far in his head that you can only guess what they're like and when he wants a meal or when he's got to have one i should say for he's past wanting anything why well, i'm blessed if he hasn't to be fed with pap like a baby it's a pitiful sort of plight for a man to come to what do you think he'd be far better dead and buried i thought i understood putting one thing and another together the reason of the old man's journey north could be easily guessed and at that moment the seaman who the skipper had sent in search of the steward made his appearance from the companion followed by the functionary in question to the latter's charge i was consigned and at his suggestion i followed him into the cabin which had been set aside for my accommodation it proved to be situated at the after end of the saloon and was as small and poorly furnished as an affair i had ever slept in make use of the old nautical expression there was scarcely room in it to swing a cat tiny as it was however it was at least better than the back street lodgings i had so lately left and when i reflected that i had paid all i owed had fitted myself out with a new wardrobe and still had upwards of fifty pounds in pocket to say nothing of being engaged on deeply interesting work 
I could have gone down on my knees and kissed the grimy planks in thankfulness. I'm afraid, sir, it's not as large as some you've been accustomed to, said the talkative steward apologetically, as he stowed my bags away in a corner. How do you know what I've been accustomed to? I asked with a smile, as I noticed his desire for conversation. I can tell it directly I saw you look round this berth, he answered. People could say what they please, but to my thinking, there's no mistaking a man who spent any time aboard ship. What line might you have been in, sir? I told him, and had the good fortune to discover his brother had served the same employ. Thus having established a bond in common, I proceeded to question him about my future charges, only to find that this was a subject upon which he was very willing to converse. Well, sir, he began, seating himself familiarly on the edge of my berth and looking up at me. I don't know as I ought to speak about the old gentleman at all, seeing as he's a passenger, and you're, so to speak, in charge of him. But this I do say, without fear or favour, that whoever brought him away from his home and took him to sea at his time of life did a wrong and cruel action. Why, sir, I make so bold as to tell you that from the moment he was brought aboard this ship, until the very second, he has not spoken as much as five hundred words to me or to anybody else. He just lays there in his bunk, hour after hour, with his eyes open, looking at the deck above him, and as likely as not holding his great granddaughter's hand, not seeming to see or hear anything, and never letting one single word pass his lips. I have known what it is to wait upon sick folk myself, having spent close upon eight months in a hospital ashore. But never in my life, sir, and I give you my word, it's gospel truth. I am telling you, have I seen anything like the way the young girl waits upon him. You'll find her as sitting by him after breakfast, and if you go in at eight bells, she'll still be the same. She has her meals brought to her and eats them there, and at night she gets me to make up her bed on the deck alongside of him. She must indeed be devoted, I answered, considerably touched at the picture he drew. Devoted is no name for it, replied the man with conviction. But it's by no means pleasant work for her, sir, I can assure you. Why, more than once when I've gone there, I found her leaning over the bunk, her face just as white as the sheet, holding a little looking-glass to his lips to see if he was breathing. Then she'd heave a big sigh of relief to find out that there was still life in him, put the glass back again in its place, and sit down beside him again and go on holding his hand, for all the world as if she was determined to cling on to him until the judgment day. It would bring the tears into your eyes, I'm sure, sir, to see it. You have a tender heart, I can see, I said, and I think the better of you for it. Do you happen to know of anything of their history, where they hail from, or who they are? There is one thing I do know, he answered, and that is that they're English and not Spaniards, as the cook said. And as you might very well think yourself from the name, I believe the old gentleman was a merchant of some sort in Cadiz, but that must have been fifty years ago. The young lady is his great-granddaughter, and I was given to understand that her father and mother have been dead for many years. For well, one thing and another, I don't fancy they've got a penny to bless themselves with. But it's plain there's somebody paying the piper, because the skipper got orders from the office just before we sailed, that everything that could be done for their comfort was to be done, and money was no object. But there, here I am, running on in this way to you, sir, who probably know all about them better than I do. I assure you, I know nothing at all, or at least very little, I answered. I've simply received instructions to meet them here, and look after the old gentleman until he reaches Newcastle. What will become of them, I can only guess. I presume, however, that I may rely on you for assistance, should I require it. I'll do anything I can, sir, and you may be very sure of that, he replied. Of taking such a liking to that young lady, there's nothing I wouldn't do in reason to make her feel a bit happier, for it's my belief that she's far from easy in her mind just now. I remember once hearing an Orient steward tell of a man who was tied up with a sword hanging over his head by a single hair. He never knew from one minute to another when it would fall and do for him. Well, that's the way I fancy Miss Moreno is feeling. There's a sword hanging over her head or her great-grandfather's, and she doesn't know when it will drop. What did you say her name was? I inquired, for I had for the moment forgotten it. Moreno, sir, he replied. The old gentleman is Don Miguel, and she is the Donna Consuelo de Moreno. Thank you, I said. And now if you will tell me where their cabin is, I think I will pay the old gentleman a visit. Their cabin is the one facing yours, sir, on the starboard side. 
if it will be any convenience to you sir i'll tell the young lady you're aboard i know she expects you because she said so only this morning perhaps it would be better that you should tell her i replied if you'll give her my compliments to say that i'll do myself the pleasure of waiting upon her as soon as it's convenient for her to see me i shall be obliged i'll remain here until i receive her answer the man departed on his errand and during his absence i spent the time making myself as comfortable as my limited quarters would permit it was not very long however before he returned to inform me that the young lady would be pleased to see me as soon as i cared to visit their cabin placing my stethoscope in my pocket and having thrown a hasty glance into the small looking-glass over the washstand in order to make sure that i presented a fairly respectable appearance i left my quarters and made my way across the saloon since then i have often tried to recall my feelings at that moment but the effort has always been in vain one thing is certain i had no idea of the importance the incident was destined to occupy in the history of my life i knocked upon the door and as i did so heard someone rise from a chair inside the cabin the handle was softly turned and a moment later the most beautiful girl i have ever seen in my life stood before me i have said the most beautiful girl but this does not at all express what i mean nor do i think it is in my power to do so let me however endeavour to give you some idea of what donna consuelo di moreno was like try to picture a tall and stately girl in reality scarcely twenty years of age but looking several years older imagine a pale oval face lit up by dark lustrous eyes with long lashes and delicately pencilled brows a tiny mouth and hair as black as the raven's wing taken altogether it was not only a very beautiful face but a strong one as i looked at her i wondered what the circumstances could have been that had brought her into the power of my extraordinary employer that she was in his power i did not for a moment doubt closing the cabin door softly behind her she stepped into the saloon the steward tells me you are dr ingleby she began speaking excellent english but with a slight foreign accent and holding out her tiny hand to me with charming frankness she continued i was informed by dr nicola in a letter i received this morning that you would join the vessel here it's a great relief to me to know you are on board i said something i forget what in answer to the compliment she paid me and then inquired how her aged relative was he seems fairly well at present she answered as well perhaps as he ever will be but as you may suppose he has given me a great deal of anxiety since we left Cadiz. this vessel is not a good sea boat and in the bay of biscay we had some very rough weather so rough indeed that more than once i thought she must inevitably founder however we are safely here now so that our troubles are nearly over i don't want you to think i'm a grumbler but i'm keeping you here perhaps when you would like to see grandpa for yourself i answered in the affirmative whereupon she softly opened the door again and beckoning me to follow led the way into the cabin if my own quarters on the other side of the saloon had seemed small this one seemed even smaller there was only one bunk and it ran below the porthole in this an old man was lying with his hands clasped upon his breast you need not fear that you will wake him said the girl beside me he sleeps like this the greater part of the day sometimes he frightens me for he lies so still that i become afraid lest he may have passed away without my noticing it i did not at all wonder at her words the old man's pallor was a peculiar ivory white which is never seen save in the very old and then strangely enough in men oftener than women his eyes were deeply sunken as were his cheeks at one time forty years or so before it must have been a powerful face now it was beautiful only in its soft harmonious whiteness a long beard white as the purest snow fell upon and covered his breast and on it lay his fleshless hands with their bony joints and long yellow nails the better to examine him i knelt down beside the bunk took his right wrist between my finger and thumb as i expected the pulse was barely perceptible for a moment i inclined to the belief that the end of which his great-granddaughter had spoken only a few minutes before had come but a second examination proved that such was not the case i gently replaced his hand and then rose to my feet i can easily understand your anxiety i said 
I think you are wonderfully brave to have undertaken such a voyage. However, for the future, that is to say, until we reach Newcastle, you must let me take it in turns with you to watch it. It is very kind of you to offer to do so, she replied, but I could not remain away from him. I have had charge of him for such a long time now that it has become like second nature to me. Besides, if he were to wake and not find me by his side, there is no saying what might happen. I am everything to him. I know so well what he requires. As she said this, she gave me a look that I could not help thinking was almost one of defiance, as if she were afraid that by attending to the old man's wants, I might deprive her of his affection. Accordingly, I postponed the consideration of the matter for the moment, and having asked a few questions as to the patient's diet, retired, leaving them once more alone together. From the saloon, I made my way up to the poop. The tide was serving, and preparations were being made for getting under way. Ten minutes later, our anchor was at the cat head, and we were making our way slowly downstream. I had begun one of the most extraordinary voyages that it has ever fallen to the lot of man to undertake. During the afternoon, I paid several visits to my patient's cabin, but on no occasion could I discover any change in his condition. He lay in his bunk, just as I had first seen him. His sunken eyes stared at the woodwork above his head, and his left hand clasped that of his great-granddaughter. And his left hand clasped that of his great-granddaughter. To my surprise, the motion of the vessel seemed to cause him a little or no inconvenience. Unfortunately for him, his nurse was an excellent sailor. It was in vain I tried to induce her let me take her place while she went up on the deck for a little change. Her grandfather might want her, she said, and that excuse seemed to her sufficient to justify such a trifling with her health. Later on, however, after dinner, I was fortunate enough to be able to induce her to accompany me to the deck for a few moments, the steward being left in charge of the patient, with instructions to call us should the least change occur. By this time we were clear of the river and our bows were pointed in a northerly direction, leaving the miserable companion, which ascended to the poop directly from the cuddy, and began to pace the deck. The night was cold, and with a little shiver my companion drew her coquettish mantilla more closely about her shoulders. There was something in her action which touched me in a manner I cannot describe. In some vague fashion it seemed to appeal to me not only for sympathy, but for help. I saw the beautiful face looking up at me, and as we walked, I noted the proud way she carried herself, and the sailor-like fashion in which she adapted herself to the rolling of the ship. It was a beautiful moonlit night, and had the vessel remained upon an even keel, it would have been very pleasant on deck. To be steady, however, was a feat the crazy old tub seemed incapable of accomplishing. We paced the poop perhaps half a dozen times, when my companion suddenly stopped, and placing her hand upon my arm, said, Dr. Ingleby, you are in Dr. Nicholas' confidence, I believe. Can you tell me why we are going to the north of England? Her question placed me in an awkward predicament. As I have said above, her loneliness, not to mention the devotion she showed to her aging relative, would touch me more than a little. On the other hand, I was Nicholas' servant, employed by him for a special work, and I did not know whether he would wish me to discuss his plans with her. You do not answer, she continued, as she noticed my hesitation. And yet I feel sure you must know. It all seems so strange. Only a few weeks ago, we were in our own quiet home in Spain without a thought of leaving it. Then Dr. Nicola came upon the scene. And now we're on board this ship going up to the north of England. And for what purpose? Did Nicola furnish you with no reason, I inquired? Oh, yes, she replied. He told me that if I would bring my grandfather to England to see him, he would make him quite a strong man again. For some reason or another, however, I feel certain there is something behind it that's being kept from me. Is this so? I am not in a position to give you any answer. That would be at all likely to satisfy you, I replied. I am afraid, a little ambiguously, for I really know nothing myself. It's only fair that I should tell you that I met Dr. Nicola for the first time a few days ago. But he sent you here to be with my grandfather, she continued authoritatively. Surely, Dr. Ingleby, you must be able to throw some light upon the mystery which surrounds this voyage. I shook my head, and with a little sigh of regret, she ceased to question me. A few minutes later, she gave me a stately bow, 
and bidding me good night prepared to go below knowing that i had deceived her and hoping to find some opportunity of putting myself right with her i followed her down the companion ladder and along the saloon to her cabin perhaps i'd better see my patient before i retire to rest i said as we stood together at the door holding on to the handle and balancing ourselves against the rolling of the ship she threw a quick glance at me as if for some reason she was surprised at my decision the expression however passed from her face as quickly as it had come and opening the door she entered the cabin and i followed she could scarcely have advanced a step towards the bunk before she uttered an exclamation of surprise and horror the steward who was supposed to have been watching the invalid was fast asleep while the latter's head had slipped from his pillow and was now lying in a most unnatural position his chin in the air his eyes open but still fixed upon the ceiling in the same glassy stare i have described before in her dismay the girl said something in spanish which i am unable to interpret and leaning over the bunk gazed into her great-grandfather's face as if she were afraid of what she might find there the steward meanwhile had recovered his senses and was staring stupidly from one to the other of us hardly able to realize the consequences of his inattention though all this had taken some time to describe it was really the action of a moment and signing the steward to stand back and gently pushing the young girl to one side i knelt down and commenced my examination of my patient there could be no doubt about one thing the old man's condition was eminently serious if he lived at all there was but little more than a flicker of life left in him it was a question that at first glance appeared impossible to answer it would have been better and certainly kinder to have let him go in peace this however i was in honour bound not to do he was nicholas property whose servant i also was and if it were possible to keep him alive i knew i must do it oh dr ingleby surely he cannot be dead cried the girl behind me in a voice that had grown hoarse with fear tell me the worst i implore you hush i answered but without looking round you must be brave he's not dead nor will he die if i can save him and turning to the steward who was still with us i bade him hasten to my cabin and bring me the small bag he would find hanging upon the peg behind the door when he returned with it i took from it one of the small bottles it contained the contents of which i had been directed by nicola to use only in the event of the case seeming absolutely hopeless the mixture was tasteless odourless quite colourless and of a liquidity equal to water I poured the stipulated quantity into a spoon and forced it between the old man's lips somewhat to my surprise for i must confess after what i had seen at nicholas power a few nights before i had expected an instantaneous cure the effect was scarcely perceptible the eyelids flickered a little and then slowly closed a few seconds later a respiratory movement of the thorax was just observable accompanied by a heavy sigh for upwards of an hour i remained in close attendance upon him noting every symptom and watching with amazement the return of life into that aged frame from which i began to think it had taken its departure for good and all once more i measured the quantity of medicine and gave it to him this time the effect was more marked at the end of ten minutes a slight flush spread over the sunken cheeks and his breathing could be plainly distinguished when after a third dose he was sleeping peacefully as a child i turned to the girl and held up my hand you will recover i said you need have no further fear the crisis is past she was silent for a few moments and i noticed that her eyes had filled with tears you've done a most wonderful thing she answered and have punished me for my rudeness to you on deck how can i ever thank you by ceasing to give me credit to which i am not entitled i replied i fear a little brusquely this medicine comes from dr nicola and i think should be as good a proof as you can desire of the genuineness of his offer and of his ability to make your grandfather a strong and hearty man again i will not doubt him any more she said and after that having made her promise to call me should she need my services i bade her good night and left the cabin meaning to retire to rest at once the stuffiness of my berth however changed my intention after all that had happened it can be scarcely wondered that i was in a state of feverish excitement in love with my profession as i was 
it will be readily understood that I had sufficient matter before me to afford me plenty of food for reflection. I accordingly filled my pipe and made my way up to the deck. Once there, I found that the appearance of the night had changed. The moonlight had given place to heavy clouds and rain was falling. The steamer was rolling heavily and every timber groaned as if in protest against the barbarous handling to which it was being subjected. Stowing myself away in a sheltered place near the alleyway leading to the engine room, I fell to considering my position. And it was a curious one. I do not think anyone who has read the preceding pages will doubt. A more extraordinary one could scarcely be imagined. And what the upshot of it all was to be was a thing I could not at all foresee. Having finished my pipe, I refilled it and continued my meditations. At a rough guess, I should say, had been an hour on deck when a circumstance occurred which was destined to furnish me with even more food for reflection than I already possess. I was in the act of knocking the ashes out of my pipe before going below, and I became aware that something, I could not quite see what, was making its way along the deck in my direction, under the shadow of the starboard bullock. At first I felt inclined to believe it was only a trick of my imagination. But when I rubbed my eyes and saw that it was a human figure, and that it was steadily approaching me, I drew back into the shadow and waited developments. On the stealthy way in which he advanced, and the trouble he took to prevent himself being seen, I argued that whoever the man, and whatever his mission might be, it was not a very reputable one. Closer and closer he came, was lost to view for an instant behind the mainmast, and then reappeared scarcely a dozen feet from where I stood. For a moment I hardly knew what course to adopt. I had no desire to rouse the ship unnecessarily, and yet for the reasons just stated, I felt morally certain that the man was there for no lawful purpose. However, if I was going to act at all, it was plain I must do so without loss of time. Fortune favoured me, for I had scarcely arrived at this decision before the chief engineer, whose cabin looked out over the deck, turned on his electric light. A broad beam of light shot out and showed me the man standing beside the main hatch, steadfastly regarding me. Before he could move, I was able to take full stock of him, and what I saw filled me with amazement. The individual was a Chinaman, and his head presented this peculiarity that half his left ear was missing. As I noted the significant fact to which I have just alluded, the recollection of Nicola's letter flashed across my mind, in which he had warned me to keep my eyes open for just such another man. Could this be the individual for whom I was to be on the lookout? It seemed extremely unlikely that there could be two Mongolians with the same peculiar deformity, and yet I could scarcely believe, even if it were the same, and had he any knowledge of my connection with Nicola, he would have the audacity to travel in the same ship with me. It must not be supposed, however, that I stayed to think these things out then. The light had no sooner flashed out upon him and revealed his sinister personality than the switch was turned off and all was darkness once more. So blinding was the glare while it did last, however, that fully ten seconds must have elapsed before my eyes became accustomed to its absence. When I could see, the man had vanished, and though I crossed the hatch, and search, not a sign of him could I discover. Whoever he is, I said to myself, he has at least the faculty of being able to get out of the way pretty quickly. I wonder what, but there, what's the use of worrying myself about him? He's probably a fireman who has been sent aft on a message to the steward, and when I see him in the daylight, I shall find him like anybody else. But while I tried to reassure myself in this fashion, I was in reality far from being convinced. In my own mind, I was as certain that he was the man against whom Nicola had warned me as I could well be of anything. The chief engineer at that moment stepped from his cabin into the alleyway. Here, I thought to myself, was an opportunity of setting the matter once for all. I accordingly accosted him. I'd been introduced to him earlier in the day by the captain, so that he knew who I was. That's not a very pretty fireman of yours, I began, the Chinaman with half an ear missing. I saw him a moment ago coming along the deck here. Where does he hail from? The chief engineer, who I may remark, en passant, was an Abaddonian, consequently slow of speech, hesitated for a moment before he replied. That's mighty queer, he said at length. You're the second man who's seen him in the night. Do you tell me you saw him this minute? 
and if i may make so bold where might that have been only a few paces from where we are standing now i answered i was smoking my pipe in the shelter there when suddenly i detected a figure creeping along the shadow of the bullocks then you turned on your electric and the light fell full and fair upon his face i saw him perfectly there could be no doubt about it he was a chinaman and half his left ear was missing the engineer sucked at his pipe upwards for half a minute mm, queer queer he said more to himself than to me tis very queer twas my second in yonder was saying he met him at eight bells in this alleyway and yet i've been officially acquainted there's no such person aboard the ship but there must be i cried don't i tell you i saw the man myself not five minutes ago i would be willing to go into a court of law and swear to the fact didn't he swear he answered i'll nay misdoubt your word with this assurance i was conducted forthwith to the chart room where we discovered the skipper stretched upon his settee snoring voluminously do you mean to tell me that you really saw the man he inquired when my business had been explained to him i assured him that i did mean it i had seen him distinctly well all i can say is it's the most extraordinary business i've ever had to do with he answered the second engineer also says he saw him directly he told me i had the ship searched but not a trace of the fellow could i discover we'll try again leaving the chart room he called the boatswain to him and accompanied by the chief engineer and myself commenced an exhaustive examination of the vessel we explored the quarters of the crew and the firemen forward the galleys stores and officers cabins in both alleyways and finally the saloon aft but without success not a trace of the mysterious mongolian could be found the skipper shook his head i don't know what to think about it he said i knew that meant that he had his doubts as to whether i had not dreamt the whole affair the inference was galling and i bade him good night and went along to my cabin i wish i had said nothing at all about the matter nevertheless i was as firmly convinced that i had seen the man as i was at the beginning in this frame of mind i prepared myself for bed before turning into my bunk however i took down the small bag in which i kept the drugs nicola had given me and of which he had told me to take such care i was anxious to have them close at hand in case i should be sent for by donna consuelo during the night to assure myself they had not been broken by the rolling of the ship i opened the bag and looked inside my astonishment may be imagined on discovering that it was empty the drugs were gone End of chapter three Chapter Four of Doctor Nicholas' Experiment by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four. The night on which I discovered that Nicholas' drugs had been stolen was destined to prove unpleasant in more senses than one. The sweetest tempered of men could scarcely have failed to take offence had they been treated as the captain had treated me i told him in so many words and with as much emphasis as i was master of that i had distinctly seen the chinaman standing upon the main deck of his steamer the second engineer had also entered the same report his evidence however while serving to corroborate my assertion was of little further use to me inasmuch as i had still better proof that what i said was correct namely that the medicines were missing under the circumstances it was small wonder but i slept badly even had the cabin been as large as a hotel bedroom and the bunk the latest invention in the way of comfortable couches it is scarcely possible i should have had better rest as it was the knowledge that i had been outwitted was sufficient to keep me tumbling and tossing to and fro from the moment i laid my head upon the pillow till the sun was streaming in through my porthole next morning again and again i went over the events of the previous day recalling every incident with photographic distinctness but always returning to the same point how the man could have obtained admittance to the saloon at all was more than i could understand and having got there why he should have stolen the bottles of medicine when there were so many other articles which would have been of infinitely more value to him scattered about was to say the least incomprehensible hour after hour i puzzled over it 
at the end was no nearer a solution of the enigma than at the beginning at first i felt inclined to believe that i must have taken them from the bag myself and for security's sake had placed them elsewhere a few moments search however was sufficient to knock the bottom out of that theory hunt high and low where i would i could discover no traces of the queer little bottles then i remembered that when i had sent the steward forward for them to the don's cabin the previous afternoon i had taken them from the bag and placed them upon the deck beside the old man's bunk could i have left them there on reconsidering the matter more carefully however i remembered that before leaving the cabin i had replaced them in my bag and then as i carried them back to my berth i had dumped the satchel against the corner of the saloon table I was afraid that i might have broken them so this effectually disposed of that theory too at least the suspense or irritation by whichever name you may describe it became unbearable and unable to remain in bed any longer i rose dressed myself and prepared to go on deck entering the saloon i found the steward busied over a number of coffee cups good morning sir he said looking up from his work if you'll excuse me my saying so sir you're about early i was late in bed i answered with peculiar significance how is it my friend that you allow people who have no right there to enter the saloon to thieve from passengers cabins to thieve sir the man replied with a startled tone i'm sure i don't understand you sir i allow no one to enter the saloon when there is no right to be there i glanced at him sharply wondering whether the fellow was as innocent as he pretended to be at any rate i said the fact remains that someone entered my cabin last night while i was on deck and stole the medicines with which i am treating the old gentleman in the cabin yonder the man looked inexpressibly shocked god bless my soul alive sir you don't mean that he said with a falter in his voice Sh surely you don't mean it but i do mean it i answered there can be no sort of doubt about it when i left the old gentleman's cabin yesterday i carried the bag containing the medicines back with me to my own berth locked it and hung it upon the peg inside the looking-glass with my own hands after that i went on deck returned to my cabin an hour or so later opened the bag and the bottles were gone but sir have you any idea who could have taken them the man replied I hope you don't think, sir, as I how I should have allowed such a thing to take place in this saloon without my knowledge. I hope you would not, I answered, but that does not alter the fact that the things are missing. But don't you think, sir, the young lady herself might have come in search of you, and when she found you were not there, did the next best thing, and took away the medicines to use herself? At present, I do not know what to think, I replied with some hesitation, for that view of the case had not presented itself to me. But if there had been anything underhand going on, I think I can promise the culprit that it would be made exceedingly hot for him when we reach our destination. Having fired this parting shot, I left him to the contemplation of his coffee cups and made my way up the companion ladder to the deck above. It was a lovely morning, a brisk breeze was blowing, and the steamer was running fairly steady under a staysail and a foresail. It was not the sort of morning to feel depressed, and yet the incidents of the previous night were a little uncomfortable. Nicola had trusted me, and in the matter of the medications at least, I had been found wanting. I believed at the moment I would have given all I possessed, which was certainly not much, but still a good deal to me, to have been able to solve the mystery that surrounded the disappearance of those drugs shortly before eight bells the skipper emerged from the chart room and came along the hurricane deck towards the poop seeing me he waved his hand and after he had ascended the ladder from the main deck bade me good morning i'm afraid our accommodation is not very good he said but i trust you have passed a fairly comfortable night no more dreams of one eared chinaman i hope from the tone in which he spoke it was plain that he imagined i must have been dreaming on the previous evening had it not been for the seriousness of my position with nikola i could have laughed aloud when i thought of the shell i was about to drop into the skipper's camp dreams or no dreams captain windover i replied i have to make a very serious complaint to you it will remain then for you to say whether you consider that the assertion i made to you last night was or was not founded upon fact 
as i believe you are aware i was instructed by my principal dr nicola to join this vessel in the thames and to take charge of don miguel de moreno until his arrival in newcastle on time dr nicola was fully aware of the difficulty and responsibility of the task he had assigned to me and for this reason he furnished me with a number of very rare drugs which i was to administer to the patient as occasion demanded in the letter of instructions which i received prior to embarking i was particularly warned to beware of a certain chinaman whose peculiar characteristic was that he had lost half an ear in due course i joined your vessel and attended the don using the drugs to which i have referred and afterwards returned them to my cabin a quarter of an hour or so later i made my way to the deck where i found myself suddenly brought face to face with the asiatic of whom i had been warned on the recommendation of the chief engineer i reported the matter to you you searched the ship found no one at all like the man i described and from that time forward set down the story i had told you either as a fabrication on my part or the creation of a dream pardon me my dear sir not a fabrication the skipper began only a pardon me in your turn i replied i have not quite finished as i have inferred you treat the matter with contempt what is the result i returned to my cabin and before retiring to rest in order to make sure that they are ready at hand in case i shall require them during the night open the bag in which the medicines until that moment have been stored to my consternation they are not there some one had entered my cabin during my absence and stolen them i leave you to put what construction on it you please and to say you that someone was the captain's face was a study but but he began buts will not end the matter i answered i'm afraid rather sharply there can be no getting away from the fact that they are gone and that someone must have taken them they could scarcely walk away by themselves but supposing your suspicions to be correct what possible use could a few small bottles of an unknown medicine be to a man like a chinaman had he taken your watch and chain or your money i could understand it but from what you say i gather that nothing else is missing nothing else i replied in the tone of a man who is making an admission that is scarcely likely to add to the weight of the argument he is endeavouring to adduce besides continued the skipper there are half a hundred other ways in which the things might have been lost or mislaid last night the ship was rolling heavily why might they not have tumbled out and have slipped under your bunk behind your bags i've known things like that occur and would the ship have closed the bag again may i ask and would the ship have closed the bag again may i ask i answered scornfully no no captain i'm afraid that won't do the man i reported to you last night the one-eared chinaman is aboard your ship and for some reason best known to himself has stolen some of my property therefore not only inconveniencing me but placing in absolute danger the life of the old man whom i was sent on board to take care of as the thief is scarcely likely to have jumped overboard he must be on board now and as he would not be likely to have stolen the bottles only to smash them it stands to the reason that he must have them in his keeping at the present moment and suppose he has what do you want me to do i want you to find him for me i answered or if you don't care to take the trouble to put sufficient men at my disposal and allow me to do so on hearing this the captain became very red and shifted uneasily on his feet my dear sir he said a little testily much as i would like to put myself out to serve you i must confess that what you ask seems a little unreasonable don't i tell you i have already searched the ship twice in an attempt to find this man and each time without success upon my word i don't think it's fair to ask me to do so again in that case i'm very much afraid i have no alternative to make a complaint to you in writing and to hold you responsible should don miguel de moreno lose his life through this robbery which has been committed and which you will not help me to set right what the captain would have answered in reply to this i cannot say it's quite certain however that it would have been something sharp had not the dofia consuelo made her appearance from the companion hatch at that moment she struck me as looking very pale as if she had passed a bad night the skipper and i went forward together to meet her good morning i said as i took the little hand she held out to me 
I hope your great-grandfather is better this morning. He has passed a fairly good night and is sleeping quietly at present, she answered. The steward is sitting with him now while I come up for a few moments to get a little fresh air on deck. The skipper made some remark about the beauty of the morning, and while he was speaking I watched the girl's face. There was an expression upon it I did not quite understand. I'm afraid you have not passed a very good night, I said, after the other had finished. Yesterday's anxiety must have set you more than you allowed me to suppose. I will confess that it did upset me, she answered with her pretty foreign accent, and the expressive gesticulation which was so becoming to her. I've had a wretched night. I had such a terrible dream that I have scarcely recovered from it yet. I'm sorry to hear that, the skipper and I answered almost together, while I added, pray tell us about it. It does not seem very much to tell, she answered, and yet the effect of it that produced upon me is just as vivid now as it was then. After you left the cabin last night, Dr. Ingleby, I sat for a little while by my grandfather's side, trying to read, but finding that impossible. I retired to rest, lying upon the bed. The steward is kind enough to make up for me upon the floor. I was utterly worn out, and almost as soon as I closed my eyes, I fell asleep. How long I'd been sleeping, I cannot say. But suddenly I felt there was someone in the room who was watching me. Who it was, I could not tell. But that it was someone, or something utterly repulsive to me, I felt certain. In vain I endeavoured to open my eyes. But, as in most nightmares, I found it impossible to do so. And all the time I could feel this loathsome thing, whatever it was, drawing closer and closer to me. Then, putting forth a great effort, I managed to wake, or perhaps to dream that I did so. I had much better have kept my eyes closed. For leaning over me was the most horrible face I have ever seen or imagined. It was flatter than that of the European, with small, narrow eyes and such cruel eyes. Good heavens, I cried, unable to keep silence any longer. Can it be possible that you saw him too? Meanwhile, the skipper, who had been leaning against the bullocks, his hands thrust deep in his pockets, and his cap upon the back of his head, suddenly sprang to attention. Can you remember anything else about the man? he inquired. The girl considered for a moment. I do not know that I can, she answered. I can only repeat what I have said before, that it was the most awful face I have ever seen in my life. Stay, there is one thing that I remember. I noticed that half his left ear was missing. It's the Chinaman, I cried with an air of triumph that I could no longer suppress, and as I said it, I took from my pocket the letter of instruction Nitter had sent me the week before, and read aloud the passage in which he referred to the one-eared Chinaman of whom I was to beware. The effect was exactly what I imagined it would be. Do you mean to tell me I was not dreaming after all? The Donner inquired, with a frightened expression on her face. That is exactly what I do mean, I answered. I am glad to have your evidence that you saw the man, for the reason that it bears out what I have been saying to our friend, the captain here. And turning to that individual, I continue. I hope, sir, you will now see the advisability of instituting another search for this man. If I were in your place, I would turn the ship inside out, truck to Keelson, as it seems to me outrageous that a rascal like this could hide himself on board, and you, the captain, be ignorant of his whereabouts. There is no necessity to instruct me in my duty, he answers, and then going to the companion, called down it for the steward, who presently made his appearance on deck. William, said the skipper, Dr. Ingleby informs me that a theft was committed in his cabin last night. He declares that a man made his way into the saloon, visiting not only his berth, but that of Don Miguel de Moreno. How do you account for this? Dr. Ingleby did say something to me about it this morning, sir, the steward replied. But to tell you the plain truth, sir, I don't exactly know what to think of it. It's the first time I've ever known such a thing happen. Of course, I shouldn't like to say as how Dr. Ingleby was mistaken. You had better not, I replied so sharply that the man jumped with surprise. Anyway, sir, the steward continued, I feel certain that if the man had come aft, I should have heard him. I'm a light sleeper, as the saying is, and I believe that a cat coming down the companion ladder would be enough to waken me, much less a man. On this occasion, you must have slept sounder than usual, I said. At any rate, the fact remains that the man did come, 
and i have asked you once more captain what you intend to do to find my stolen property i must take time to consider the matter the captain replied if the man is aboard the ship as you assert i will find him and if i do find him he'd better look out for squalls for that's all i can say and at the same time i added i hope you will severely punish any member of your crew who may have been instrumental in secreting him on board as i said this i glanced at the steward and it seemed to me that his always sallow face became even paler than usual you need not bother yourself about that said the skipper you may be sure i shall do so then lifting his cap to donna consuelo he went forward along the deck while the steward having informed us that breakfast was upon the table returned to the companion ladder and disappeared below what does all this mystery mean dr ingleby inquired my companion as we turned and walked aft together it means there is more at the back of it than meets the eye i replied before i left london i was warned by dr nikola as you heard me say just now to beware of a certain asiatic with only half an ear what nikola had feared he would do i have no notion but there seems to be no doubt that this is the man but he's done us no harm she replied beyond frightening me so if the captain takes care that he does not come as far as the saloon again it does not seem to me that we need think any more about him but he has done us harm i asserted grievous harm he has stolen the medication with which i treated your great-grandfather so successfully yesterday on hearing this she gave a little start do you mean that he should become ill again the same way that he did yesterday you would be unable to save him she inquired almost breathlessly i cannot say anything about that i answered i should of course do my best but i must confess the loss of those drugs is a very serious matter for me they are exceedingly valuable and were specially entrusted to my care and you think that dr nickel will be angry with you for having lost them she said i'm very much afraid he will i answered but if he is i must put up with it but let us now come below to breakfast with that i led her along the deck and down the companion ladder to the saloon before we sit down to our meal i think it would perhaps be as well if i saw your great-grandfather i said i should like to convince myself that he is none the worse for his attack yesterday upon this we entered the cabin together i bent over the recumbent figure of the old man he lay just as he had done on the previous day his long thin hands were clasped upon his breast and his eyes looked upward just as i remembered seeing them for all the difference that was to be seen he might have never moved since i had left him so many hours before he is awake whispered his great-granddaughter who had looked at him over my shoulder then raising her voice a little she continued still in english this is dr ingleby grandfather whom your friend dr nicola has sent to take care of you i thank you sir for your kindness replied the old man in a voice that was a little louder than a whisper you must forgive me if my reception of you appears somewhat discourteous but i am very feeble a month ago i celebrated my ninety-eighth birthday and at such an age i venture to assert much may be forgiven a man pray do not apologize i replied i am indeed glad to find you looking so much better this morning if to be still alive is to be better than i suppose i must be he answered in a tone that was almost one of regret and then continued the days of our age are three score years and ten and though men be so strong that they come to four score years yet is their strength but labour and sorrow labour and sorrow ay labour and sorrow come come sir i said you must not talk like this you are not very comfortable here but we are nearly at our journey's end once there you will be able to rest more quietly and in greater comfort than it is possible for you to do in this tiny cabin you speak well he answered when you say that i am nearly at my journey's end god knows i am near it very very near it the wonder is i have not reached it long since but it will come at last and when it does i shall rest as you say more quietly than in this tiny cabin seeing that in his present humour there was not much to be done with him i completed my examination and gave certain instructions to his great-granddaughter and then left the cabin feeling very much as if i had stepped into the nineteenth out of another and quite different century breakfast was laid in the saloon and as the steward informed me that the skipper invariably had his sent forward to the chart room 
while the donna consuelo usually partook of hers by the old gentleman's bedside i sat down to it alone the steward waited upon me a trifle nervously i thought and with an obsequiousness that told me he was anxious to make up to me for the robbery of the night before whatever he might think however i had not the smallest intention of allowing myself to be drawn into a discussion with him on the subject the matter would have to be settled some way or another when we reached our destination and then in all probability nikola would look after it for himself whatever else may be said of the good ship donna mercedes her warmest admirers could scarcely assert that she possessed a wonderful turn of speed even with everything in her favour it was as much as the chief engineer could do to knock nine knots out of her but on the present occasion seven was somewhere near her mark for this reason instead of reaching our destination at midday as i had hoped we would do night had closed in upon us before we had crossed the bar and could count ourselves safely in the river for well, five bells in the first watch had been sounded before we lay at anchor in the tyneside as soon as i heard the cable rattling out through the hawse hole i made my way back to the deck the night was a dark one and a more interesting picture than i had before me then could scarcely be imagined around me on every side were ships colliers tramps passenger vessels and merchantmen of every possible sort and description the lights of the city could be plainly distinguished and innumerable tongues of fire containing all the colours of the rainbow flashed up continually from factory chimneys a couple of steam launches were lying alongside with at least a dozen small boats and thinking nikola might be in one of them i went forward to the gangway in search of him but though i scanned the faces below me his was not among them for the reason that we were so late getting into the river and knowing that the vessel would be likely to remain for some time to come i argued that in all probability he had been put off boarding her until the morning i accordingly turned away and was about to walk aft when a hand was placed on my shoulder well friend ingleby said a voice that there was no mistaking and which i should have known anywhere what sort of a voyage have you had and how is your patient progressing dr nikola i cried in astonishment as i turned and found him standing before me i was just looking for you in the boats alongside i had no idea you were on board i came up by the other gangway nikola replied but you have not answered my question how is your patient he is still alive i answered and i fancy if possible a little better than when we left london but he is so feeble that to speak of his being well seems almost a sarcasm yesterday for a few moments i thought he was gone but with the help of the drugs you gave me i managed to bring him round again this morning he was strong enough to converse with me i'm pleased to hear it he replied you have done admirably and i congratulate you now we must think about their transshipment transshipment i replied is it possible they have to make another journey it is more than possible it is quite certain he answered Allardane Castle is a matter of some fifty miles up the coast, and a steam yacht will take us there. A bed has been prepared for the old gentleman in the saloon, and all we have to do is get him off this boat and on board her. You'd better let me have those drugs, and I'll mix him up a slight stimulus. He'll need it. This was the question I had been dreading all along. But the die was cast, and willy nilly the position had to be faced. I should like to speak to you upon that matter i said i very much fear that you will consider me to blame for not having exercised greater care over them but i had no idea they would be of any value to anyone who did not know the use of them pray what do you mean he asked with a look of astonishment that i believe was more than half assumed to what are you alluding have you had an accident with the drugs while we had been talking we had walked along the main deck and were approaching the entrance leading therefrom to the cubby the light from which fell upon his face there was a look upon it that i did not like when he was in an affable mood nicholas countenance was singularly prepossessing when however he was put out by anything it was the face of a devil rather than a man i exceedingly regret having to inform you that last night the drugs in question were stolen from my cabin in a moment he was all excitement by the man of whom i bade you be beware of course the one-eared chinaman the same i answered and went on to inform him 
of all that had transpired since my arrival on board including my trouble with the captain and the suspicions i entertained without much foundation i'm afraid against the steward he heard me out without speaking and when i had finished bade me wait on deck while he went below to the moreno's cabin while he was gone i strolled to the side and once more stood watching the lights reflected in the water below on an old tramp steamer a short distance astern of us the man was singing it was one of chevalier's costa songs i could recognize the words quite distinctly the last time i had heard that song was in cape coast castle just after i had recovered from my attack of fever and i was still pursuing the train of thought it conjured up when i noticed the boat drawing into the circle of light to which i have just alluded it contained two men one of whom was standing up while the other rode a second or two later they had come close enough to me to see the face of the man in the bows to my amazement he was a chinaman so overwhelming was my astonishment that i uttered an involuntary cry and running to the skylight called to nikola to come on deck and bounding to the bullocks again i looked for the boat but it was too late either they had achieved their object or my prompt action had given them a fright at any rate they were gone what do you want cried nikola who by this time had reached the deck the chinaman i cried i saw one of them a moment ago in a boat alongside where are they now he inquired i cannot see them they've disappeared into the darkness again but when i called to you they were scarcely twenty yards away what does their presence here signify do you think it signifies that they know i am on board answered nikola with a queer sort of smile upon his face it means also that although this is the nineteenth century and law-abiding land of england if we were to venture a little out of the beaten track ashore to-night you and i would stand a very fair chance of having our throats cut before morning it has one other meaning and that is that you and i must play the old game of the partridge in its nest and lure them away from this boat while the skipper transfers don miguel and his great-granddaughter to the yacht i have waiting down the river that's all very well i interrupted but i'm not at all sure the skipper would be willing to put it bluntly he and i have already had a few words together over this matter that will make no difference nikola answered i assure you you need have no fear that he will play us false he knows me far too well to attempt that i will confer with him at once and while i am doing so you had better get your traps together we will then go ashore and do our best to draw these rascals off the scent so saying nikola made his way forward towards the chart room while i went through the cuddy to my own berth the steward carried my bags out onto the main deck after i had spoken a word or two with donna consuelo i followed him five minutes later nikola joined me accompanied by the captain I had bidden the latter good-bye earlier in the evening, and Nicola was giving him one last word of advice, when I happened to glance towards the alleyway on the port side. Imagine my surprise, nay, I might almost say my consternation, on beholding, standing in the dark by the corner of the main hatch, the same mysterious Chinaman who I had felt certain had committed the robbery of the drugs the previous night. Look, look, I cried to my companion, see, there is the man again they wheeled round and looked in the direction to which i pointed at the same time the man's right arm went up and from where i stood i could see something glittering in the palm an inspiration how or by what occasion i shall never be able to understand induced me to seize nikola by the arm to swing him behind me it was well that i did so for almost before we could realize what was happening a knife was thrown and stood embedded a good three inches in the bullock exactly behind where nikola had been standing an instant before and springing to the ladder which leads from the main to the hurricane deck he raced up it jumped onto the rail and dived headlong into the water alongside by the time we reached the deck whence he had taken his departure all we could see was a boat pulling swiftly in the direction of the shore that settles it friend ingleby said nikola we have no alternative now but to make our way ashore and do as i propose if you're ready come along i think i can safely promise you an adventure end of chapter four chapter five 
of Dr. Nicholas' Experiment by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 When, nowadays, I look back upon the period I spent in Nicholas' company, one significant fact always strikes me, and that is the enormous number of risks we managed to cram into such a comparatively short space of time. During my somewhat checkered career, I have perhaps seen as much of what it is vaguely termed life as most men. I have lived in countries the very reverse of civilised. I have served aboard ships where there has been a good deal more sandbagging and hazing than would be considered good for the average man's Christian temperament. And as for actual fighting, well, I have seen enough of that to have learnt one lesson, one which will probably cause a smile to rise on the face of the inexperienced and that is to keep out of it as far as possible and on all occasions to be afraid of firearms i concluded my last chapter with an account of our arrival in newcastle and explained how we were preparing to go ashore when the one-eared chinaman who i felt convinced had committed the robbery of the previous night made his appearance before us and came within an ace of taking nicola's life had it not been for my presence of mind or instinct or whichever term you please to call it, I verily believe it would have been the end of all things for the doctor. As it was, however, the knife missed its mark, and a moment later the man had sprung up the ladder into the hurricane deck, and leapt the rail and plunged into the river. Being desirous of preventing the Chinaman from following us, and by that means becoming aware that we were leaving for the north in Nicholas's yacht, we determined to make our way ashore and permit them to suppose we were remaining in Newcastle for some length of time. Accordingly, we descended into the wherry alongside and ordered the boatman to pull us to the nearest landing stage. Keep your eyes open and your wits about you, whispered Nicola, when we had left the boat and were making our way up to the street. They are certain to be on the lookout for us. As you may be sure, I did not neglect his warning. I had one exhibition of that diabolical celestial skill in knife-throwing and when I reflected that in a big town like Newcastle there were many dark corners and alleyways, and also that a knife makes but little or no noise when thrown, I was more than determined than ever to neglect no opportunity of looking after my own safety. When we reached the street at the rear of the docks, Nicola cast about him for a cab, but for some minutes not one was to be seen. At last a small boy obtained one for us. When the luggage had been placed on the roof, we took our seats in it. Nicola gave the driver his instructions, and in a short time we were bowling along in the direction of our hotel. Throughout the drive I could see no signs of the enemy. I was in the act of wondering how such a game as we were then playing could possibly help us if the Celestials had failed to see us come ashore. When Nicola turned to me, and in his usual quiet voice said, I wonder if you've noticed that we are being followed. I replied that I certainly had not, nor could I see how he could tell such a thing. Very easily, he said. I will prove that what I say is correct. Do you remember the small boy who went in search of a cab? Uh, I answered that I did. Whereupon he bade me examine our reflection as we passed the next shop window. I did so, and could plainly distinguish a small figure seated on the rail at the back. Save this atom, ourselves and a solitary policeman, the street was deserted. I do see a small boy, I answered, but may he not be coming with us to try and obtain the job of carrying our luggage? He is engaged upon another now. When he came up from the river, he was on the lookout for us. Although, as you may have noticed, he pretended to be asleep in a doorway. He obtained the cab for us. As you stepped into it, he ranged up alongside and handed something to the driver. When we alight, he will wait to see that our luggage is carried in after which he will decamp and carry the information to his employers, who will endeavour to cut our throats as soon as the opportunity occurs. He took the matter in an eminently cheerful light, I said. For my own part, I have no desire to give them the chance just yet. Is there no way in which we can prevent such a possibility occurring? It is for that reason that we are here, Nicola replied. I can assure you that I am no more anxious to die than you are. There would be a good deal of irony in having perfected a scheme for prolonging life, only to meet one's death at the hand of a Chinese ruffian in a civilised English town. 
then what is your plan i inquired i will tell you but do not let us speak so loud little pictures have long ears my notion is that we make for the hotel the name of which i was careful to give the driver in hearing of the boy and we will engage a couple of rooms there order breakfast tomorrow morning still in the hearing of the boy and afterwards get out of the way as quietly as possible sounds feasible enough i replied if only we can do it but do you think the men will be so easily fooled well that remains to be proved however we shall very soon find out a pretty sort of thing you've let yourself in for master ingleby i thought to myself as nicola lapsed into silence once more a week ago you were starving in a back street of london now it looks very much as if you're going to be murdered in affluence in newcastle <laughs> however you've let yourself in for it and have only yourself to blame for the result consoling myself in this philosophic way i held my peace until the cab drew up before the hostelry to which my companion had alluded as soon as we were at a standstill nicola alighted went into the hotel to inquire about rooms as we agreed i remained in the cab until he returned it's all right ingleby he cried as he crossed the pavement again they're very full but we can have the rooms until the day after tomorrow after that we must look elsewhere now let us get the traps inside the porter emerged and took our luggage and we accompanied him into the building as we did so i saw the ragged urchin who had ridden behind the cab draw nearer the portico the manager received us in the hall numbers fifty nine and sixty he said to the porter would you care for any supper gentlemen we thanked him but declined and then followed the porter upstairs into the rooms in question having seen my luggage safely installed and the man on his way downstairs nicholas showed himself ready for business when you get into these sort of scrapes he said it's just as well to have a good memory i know these rooms of old and directly i saw the position we were in i thought they might prove of use to us when i once did the manager a good turn when i explained matters to him he will understand why we have taken up our abode with him only to leave again so suddenly have you a sheet of notepaper and an envelope in your bag i produced them for him whereupon he wrote a note and having placed the bank note inside addressed it to his friend i'll leave it on the chimney piece where the chambermaid will be certain to see it he said i've told the manager that we are obliged to leave in this unceremonious fashion in order to rid ourselves of some unpleasant fellow travellers who have been following us about with what i can only think must be hostile intent until you return i have asked him to take charge of your baggage so that you need have no fear on that score i'm sorry you should have to lose it but i can lend you anything you may require until you get possession of it again now if we can only get outside of this window and down to the tyne side once more without being seen i think we may safely say we have given kwan ma the slip for good and all so saying he crossed the room and threw open the window we are both active men nicola continued and should experience small difficulty in dropping down to the roof of the outhouse below thence we can make our way along the wall to the back are you ready quite ready i answered whereupon he crawled out of the window and holding on by both hands lowered himself until his feet were only a yard or so above the roof of the outhouse to which he had referred then he let go and dropped i followed his example after which we made our way in indian file along the wall past the stables and dropped without adventure into the dark lane at the rear of the hotel it's the first time in my life i'd left a building of that description in such an unceremonious fashion yet strangely enough i remember it caused me no surprise in nicola's company the most extraordinary performances in commonplace and in the natural order of things from now forward we must proceed with the greatest caution said my companion as we regained our feet and paused before making our way down the dark lane towards a small street at the further end they are scarcely likely to watch the back of the hotel but it will be safer for us to suppose them to be doing so acting up to this decision we proceeded with as much caution as if every shadow were an enemy and every doorway contained a villainous celestial we saw nothing of the men we feared however and eventually reached the thoroughfare leading to the docks without further adventure but fortunate as we had so far been we were not destined to get away as successfully as we had hoped to do we were within sight of the river when something i cannot now remember what induced me to look back 
I did so just in time to catch a glimpse of a figure emerging from the shadow of a tall building. At any other time, such a circumstance would have given rise to no suspicion in my mind. But, worked up to such a pitch as I was then, I seemed gifted with an unerring instinct that told me as plainly as any words that the man in question was following us, and that he was the Chinaman we were so anxious to avoid. I pointed him out to Nicola and asked whether he agreed with me as to the man's identity. You will soon decide that point, was his reply. Slacken your pace for a moment. When I give the word, wheel sharply round and walk towards him. We executed this manoeuvre and began to walk quickly back in the direction we had come. The mysterious figure was still making its way along the darker side of the street and our suspicions were soon confirmed. For on seeing us, he turned also and a few seconds later, disappeared down a side street. He's spying on us, sure enough, said Nicola, and I do not see how we are going to baffle him. Let's hasten on to the river and trust to luck to get on board the yacht without his finding out where we have gone. Once more we turned ourselves about, and in something less than five minutes had reached the landing place for which we were steering. Then, pulling a whistle from his pocket, Nicola blew three sharp notes upon it. An answer came from the deck of the yacht out in the stream. It had scarcely died away before a boat put off from alongside the craft and came swiftly towards us. It's only a question of minutes now, said Nicola, throwing a hasty glance around him. Time versus the Chinaman. If I am not mistaken, here the boat drew up at the steps. Time has the best of it. Come along, my friend, let us get on board. I followed him down the steps and took my place in the dinghy. The men pulling bent to their oars and we shot out into the stream. Look, said Nicola, pointing to the place we had just left. I thought our friend would not be very far behind us. I followed with my eyes the direction in which he pointed, and sure enough, I could just distinguish a dark figure standing upon the steps. They would like to catch me if they could, observed the doctor, with a shrug of his shoulders and one of his peculiar laughs. If they've tried once, they've done so a hundred times. I will do them the credit of saying that their plans have been admirably laid, but fate has stood by me, and on each occasion they have miscarried. They tried at first at Ya Chou Fu, then at Ai Chang, afterwards in Shanghai, Rangoon, Bombay, London, Paris, and St. Petersburg. And I can't tell you how many other places, but as you see, they have not succeeded so far. But why should they do it, I ask? What is the reason of it all? that is too long a story for me to tell you now he replied as the boat drew up at the accommodation ladder you shall hear it another day our object now must be to get away from newcastle without further loss of time i followed him along the deck to where a short stout man stood waiting to receive us are you ready stevens asked nicola all ready sir the other replied with the brevity of a man who is not accustomed to waste his words in that case, let us start quickly as possible. At once, the man replied, and immediately went forward, while Nicola conducted me down a prettily arranged and constructed companion ladder to the saloon below. As we reached it, I heard the tinkle of the telegraph from the bridge to the engine room, and almost simultaneously the screw began to revolve, and we were under way. After the darkness outside, the brilliant light of the saloon in which we now stood was so dazzling that I failed to notice the fact that a bed place had been made up behind the butt of the mizzen mast. Upon this lay the old Don, and seated by his side and holding his hand was the Donna Consuelo. My dear young lady, said Nicola in his kindest manner, as he advanced toward her, I fear you must be worn out. However, we are under way again now, and I have instructed my servant to prepare a cabin for you, which I trust you will be fairly comfortable. Donna Consuelo had risen and was standing looking into his face as if she were frightened of something he was about to say. I am not at all tired, she said. I would far rather remain here with my great-grandfather. As you wish, answered Nicola abstractedly. Then stooping, he raised the old man's left hand and felt his pulse. The long, thin fingers of the doctor, indicative of his extraordinary skill as a surgeon, seemed to twine round the other's emaciated wrist while his face wore a look I have never seen upon it before. It was that of the born enthusiast, the man who loves his profession more than aught else in the world. While, however, I was observing Nicola, you must not suppose I was regardless of the Donna Consuelo. 
the student of character the expression upon her face could scarcely have been anything but interesting while nicola was conducting his examination she watched him as if she dreaded what he might do next fear there was in abundance but of admiration for the man i could discover no trace the examination concluded nicola addressed two or three pertinent questions to her concerning her great-grandfather's health during the voyage which she answered with corresponding clearness and conciseness the old man himself however though conscious did not utter a word but lay staring up the skylight above his head just as i had seen him do on board the steamship dona mercedes fully five hours must have elapsed before we reached our destination indeed day had broken and the sun was in the act of rising when a gentle tapping upon the skylight overhead warned nicola that our voyage was nearly at an end leaving the old man in his great-granddaughter's care nicola signed me to follow him to the deck it may interest you to see your future home he said as we stepped out of the companion into the cool morning air and looked out over the sea which the rim of the newly risen sun was burnishing until it shone like polished silver at the moment the yacht was entering a small bay surrounded by giant cliffs against which the great rollers of the north sea broke continuously the bay itself was a deep shadow and was as dreary as a place as any i have seen i looked about me for a dwelling of any sort but not a sign of such a thing could i discover only a long stretch of frowning cliff and desolate wind-slept table land at first glance it does not look inviting said nicola with a smile upon his face as he noticed the expression upon mine i confess i have seen a more hospitable coastline but never one better fitted for the work we have in hand but i do not see the castle i replied i have looked in every direction but can discover no trace of it one of its charms he continued triumphantly you cannot see it because at present it is hidden by yonder headland when we are safely in the bay however you will have a good view of it it is a fine old building and in bygone days must have been a place of considerable importance ships innumerable have gone to pieces in sight of its turrets while deep down its own foundations i am told there are dungeons enough to imprison half the county see we are opening up the bay now and in five minutes shall be at anchor i wonder what result we shall have achieved when we next steam between these heads while he was speaking we had passed from the open sea into the still water of the bay and the yacht was slowing down perceptibly gradually the picture unfolded itself until standing out in bold relief upon the cliffs like some grim sentinel of the past the castle for which some time to come at least was destined to be my home came into view who its architect had been i was never able to discover but he must have been impregnated with the desolation and solemn grandeur of the coast and in his building have tried to equal it as nicola had said a place better fitted for the work we had to do could not have been discovered in the length and breadth of england the nearest village was upwards of twelve miles distant farms or dwelling house there were none within view of its towers tourists seldom ventured near it for the reason that it was not only a place difficult of approach but what was perhaps more of importance because there was nothing of interest to be seen when you reached it as i gazed at it i thought of the girl in the saloon below and wondered what her feelings would be and what her life would be like in such a dismal place i glanced at nicola who was gazing up at the grim walls with such rapt attention that it was easy to see his thoughts were far away then the telegraph sounded and the screw ceased to revolve the spell was broken and we were recalled to the realities of the moment oh, i was miles away said nicola looking round at me i could see you were i answered you'd be very surprised if you knew of what i was thinking he continued i was recalling a place not unlike this but ten thousand miles or more away it is a monastery similarly situated on the top of enormous cliffs it was there that i obtained the secret which is the backbone of the discovery we are about to test i have been in some queer places in my time but never such a one as that but we haven't time to talk of that now what we have to do is get the old band ashore and up to yonder building 
If anything were to happen to him now, I think it would break my heart. And his great-granddaughters also, I put in. You must admit, she is devoted to him. He threw a quick glance at me, as if he were trying to discern how far I was interested in the beautiful girl in the saloon below. Whatever conclusion he may have come to, however, he said nothing to me upon the subject. Having ordered the captain to see the boat, which had been specially prepared for the work of carrying the old gentleman ashore, brought alongside, he made his way to the saloon, and I accompanied him. We have reached our destination, Donna Consuelo, he said, as he approached the bed beside which she was sitting. As he spoke, there leapt into her eyes the same look of terror I had noticed before. It reminded me more than anything else of the expression one sees in the eyes of a rabbit when the snare has closed upon it. As I noticed it for the first time since I had known him, a feeling of hatred for Nicola came over me. It was not until we were in the boat and were making our way ashore that I found the opportunity of speaking to her without Nicola overhearing us. Courage, my dear young lady, courage, I said. Believe me, there is nothing to fear. I will pledge my life for your safety. She gave me a look of gratitude and stooped as if to arrange the heavy travelling rug covering her aged relative. In reality, I believe, it was to hide the tears with which her eyes were filled. From that moment there existed an indefinable, real bond between us. And though I did not realise it at the moment, the first mark had been made upon the chain with which Nicola imagined he had bound me to him. On reaching that side of the bay on which there was a short strip of beach, the boat was grounded. The four sailors immediately took up the litter upon which the old man lay and carried it ashore. The path up to the castle was a steep and narrow one, and the work of conveying him to the top was by no means easy. Eventually, however, it was accomplished, and we stood before the entrance to the castle. Moat there was none, but in place of it, spanned by the drawbridge, a ponderous affair, something like fifty feet long by ten wide, was an enormous chasm going sheer down in one drop fully two hundred feet. At the bottom water could be seen, and at night when the tide came in, the gurgling and moaning which rose from it was sufficient to appall the stoutest heart. Welcome to Allardyne Castle, said Nicola as we crossed the bridge and entered the archway of the ancient keep. Then bending over the old man on the litter, he added, When you cross this threshold again, my old friend, I hope you will be fully restored to health and strength. A young man again in every sense of the word. Don Consuelo, I am all anxiety to hear your opinion of the apartments I have caused to be prepared for you. Moving in procession as before, we crossed the great courtyard which echoed to the sound of our footsteps, and reaching a door on the farther side entered and found ourselves standing in a well-proportioned hall, from which a staircase of solid stone, up which a dozen soldiers might have marched abreast, led to the floors above. With Nicola still in advance, we made the ascent, turned to the right hand, and proceeded along a corridor upwards of fifty yards in length, out of which opened a number of lofty rooms. Before the door of one of these, Nicola paused. This is the apartment I have set aside for your own particular use, my dear young lady, he said. And with that he threw open the door and showed us a large room, carpeted, curtained, and furnished in a fashion I was far from expecting to find in so sombre a building. Should there be anything wanting, he said, you will honour me by mentioning it, when I will do all that lies in my power to supply it. Her face was very pale, and her lips trembled a little, as she faltered a question as to where her great-grandfather was to be domiciled. I have come to the conclusion that, for the future, it would be better, said Nicola, speaking very slowly and distinctly, as if in anticipation of future trouble, that you should entrust him to my care. Ingleby and I, between us, will make ourselves responsible for his safety, and you may rest assured we will see that no harm comes to him. You must endeavour to amuse yourself as best you can, consoling yourself with the knowledge that we are doing all that science can do for him. And, as he said this, he smiled a little sarcastically, as if a reading of the word science would be likely to differ considerably from his. But you surely do not mean that I am to give him up to you entirely, she cried, this time in real terror. You cannot be so cruel as to mean that. Well, Dr. Nicola, I implore you not to take him altogether from me. 
I cannot bear it. My dear young lady, said Nicola, a little more sternly than he had yet spoken, in this matter you must be guided by me. I can brook no interference of any description. Surely you should know me well enough by this time to be aware of that. But he's all I have to live for, all I have to love, the girl faltered. Can you not make allowance for that? Her voice was piteous in its pleading, and when I heard Nicholas chilling tones as he answered her, I could have found it in my heart to strike him. To have interfered at all, however, would have done no sort of good. So hard as it seemed, I was perforce compelled to hold my tongue. If you love your great-grandfather, he said, you will offer no opposition to my scheme. I will return him to you a different man. But we are wasting time, and these stone corridors are too cold and draughty for him. If you will be guided by me, you will rest a little after your exertions. There is an old woman below who shall come to you and do her best to make herself useful to you. Seeing that to protest further would be useless, the girl turned and went into the room, trying to stifle sobs that would not be kept back. The sight was one which would have grieved a harder heart than mine, and it hurt me the more because I knew that I was powerless to help her. All this time the four sailors who had carried the litter up from the beach had been silent spectators to the scene. Now they took up their burden once more and followed Nicola along the corridor, up some more steps, down still another passage, till I lost count of the way we had come. The greater portion of the castle had been allowed to fall into disrepair. Heavy masses of cobwebs stretched from wall to wall. A large proportion of the doors were even worm-eaten, and in some instances had even fallen in altogether, revealing desolate apartments in which the wind from the sea whistled, and the noise of the waves echoed with blood-curdling effect. Reaching the end of the second corridor, Nicola paused before a heavy curtain, which was drawn closely from wall to wall, and ordered the men to set down their burden. They obeyed, and on being told to do so, took their departure with as much speed as they could put into the operation. If I know anything of the human face, they were not a little relieved at receiving permission to clear out of a place that had every right to be considered the abode of a certain old gentleman whom it scarcely becomes me to mention. When the sound of their footsteps had died away, Nicola drew back the curtain and displayed a plain but very strong wooden door. From the fact that the workmanship was almost new, I surmised that my host had placed it there himself. But for what purpose I could only conjecture. Taking a key from his pocket, he slipped it into the patent lock, turned the handle and the door swung open. Take up your end of the litter, he said, and help me carry it inside. I did as I was ordered, and bearing the old man between us, we passed into that portion of the castle, which, as I soon discovered, he had fitted up in readiness for the great experiment. Having passed the door, we found ourselves in a comparatively lofty room, or perhaps I'd better say hall, the walls of which were covered almost entirely with anatomical specimens. From what I could see of them, I should say that many were quite unique, while all were extremely valuable. Where and by what means he had collected them, I was never able to discover. Though Nicola, on one or two occasions, threw out hints. There they were, however, and I promised myself that during my stay in the place, I would use them for perfecting my own knowledge on the subject. At the end of the hall, looking over the sea, was a large window while in either wall were several doors, all of which, like that in the corridor, were heavily curtained. The carpet was of cork, quite noiseless. The lights were electric, the batteries and dynamos being in the room below. The heating arrangements were excellent, while the ventilation was of the most modern and improved description. I noticed that Nicholas smiled a little contemptuously at my astonishment. You were unprepared for this surprise, he said. Let me give you a little piece of advice and that is, never be astonished at anything you may see or hear while you are with me. The commonplace and I, I can assure you once and for all, do not live together. I have homes in all parts of the world. I am in England today, engaged upon one piece of work, and in six months' time I may be in India, Japan, Peru, Kamchatka, or if you like it better, shall we say, 
playing tricks with niggers in Cape Coast Castle. But see, we are keeping our old friend waiting. I will find out if all the preparations I have ordered are complete. If so, we will convey him at once to the chamber set apart for him. With that, he touched a bell, and almost before he had removed his finger from the button, a curtain at the farther end was drawn aside, and the same Chinese servant, the deaf and dumb individual, I mean, who had brought the letter to me at my lodgings in London the previous week, entered the room. Seeing his master, he bent himself double, and when he had resumed his upright posture, as curious a conversation commenced as I had ever known. I use the word conversation for the simple reason that I do not know how else to describe it. As a matter of fact, it was not a conversation at all, for the reason that not a word was spoken on either side. Their lips moved, but not a sound come from them. Yet they seemed quite able to understand one another. If, however, it was a strange performance, it had the least the merit of being an extremely successful one. He tells me that everything is prepared, Nicola remarked, as the man crossed the room and drew back another curtain from a doorway on our left. This is the room, but before we carry him into it, I think we'd better have a little light upon the subject. To press the electric switch was the work of a moment, and as soon as this had been done, we once more took up our burden and carried it into the inner room. Prepared as I had been by the outer hall for something extraordinary, I was perhaps not so much surprised at the apartments in which I now found myself, as I should otherwise have been, and yet it was sufficiently remarkable to fill anyone with wonder. It was upwards of twenty feet in length, possibly eighteen in width. The walls and the ceilings were as black as charcoal. When the electric light was extinguished, not a ray of anything would be visible. In the centre was a strange contrivance, which I could see was intended to serve as the bed and for some other purpose which at the moment was not quite apparent to me. In the farther corners were a couple of queer-looking pieces of machinery, one of which reminded me somewhat of an unusually large electric battery. The other I could not understand at all, a machine twice the size of those usually employed for manufacturing ozone stood opposite the door. Thermometers of every sort and description were arranged at intervals along the walls, while on one side was an ingenious apparatus for heating the room, and on the other a similar one for cooling it. At the head and foot of the bed were two brass pillars, the construction and arrangements of which reminded me of electric terminals on an exaggerated scale. We placed the old gentleman on the bed. The litter was thereupon removed by the servant, and Nicola and I stood facing each other across the form of the man who was to prove, or disprove, the feasibility of the discovery of my extraordinary employer claimed to have made. For twenty-four hours, said Nicola, he must have absolute peace and quiet. Nothing must disturb him, nor must he take food. But is he capable, do you think, I asked, of going without nourishment for so long a time? Perfectly. On the draught I am about to administer him, he could do without it were such a thing necessary for a much longer period. Indeed, it would not hurt him if he were to eat nothing for a month. He left the room, he left the room for a moment, and when he returned he carried in his hand a tiny file of the same description, though much smaller, as those which had been stolen from me on board the steamer. It contained a thick red mixture, which, when he removed the stopper, threw off a highly pungent odour. He opened the mouth of the patient and poured upwards of a teaspoonful of it. As before, I expected to see some immediate result, but my curiosity was not gratified. Deftly arranging the bed coverings, Nicola inspected the thermometers, tested the hot and cold air apparatus, and then turned to me. He will require little or no supervision for some hours to come, he said, so we may safely leave him. To while away the time, if you care about it, I will show you something of my abode. I think I can promise you both instruction and amusement. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of Dr. Nicholas Experiment by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 
leaving the room in which we had placed don miguel de moreno as described in a previous chapter we returned to the hall the same in which was contained the magnificent collection of anatomical specimens already mentioned tired as i was for it must be remembered that i had had but little sleep during the first night i had spent on board the dona mercedes and none at all on that through which we had just passed while i had a great deal of excitement and my fair share of hard work i would not have lost the opportunity of exploring nicholas quarters in this grim old castle for any consideration whatsoever nicola himself though one would have scarcely thought it from his appearance must have possessed a constitution of iron for he seemed as fresh as when i first had seen him at kellerand's house in london there was a vitality about him a briskness and if i may so express it an enjoyment of labour for its own sake that i do not remember ever to have found in another man as i was soon to discover my description of him was not very wide of the mark he would do the work of half a dozen men and at the end be ready and not only ready but eager for more in addition to this i noticed another peculiarity about him and like most people who are fond of work he possessed an infinite fund of patience to wait for an issue whatever it might be to develop itself naturally and unlike so many experimentalists betrayed no desire to hurry it by the employment of extraneous means in thus putting forward my reading of the most complex character that has ever come under my notice i do so with an absolute freedom from bias indeed you might almost say that i do so in great measure against my own inclinations as will be apparent to you when you have finished my story as i informed you in london said this strange individual after he closed the door of the patient's room behind him had drawn the heavy curtains and switched off the electric light i purchased this famous castle expressly for the experiment we are about to try the owner so my business people informed me was amazed that i should want it at all but then you see he did not understand its value if i had searched the world i could not have discovered a better while we are near enough to civilization to be able to obtain anything we may require in the way of drugs or incidental apparatus we have no prying neighbours such household stores as we require the yacht brings us them direct from newcastle an old man and woman who take care of the place when i am absent have their quarters in the keep my chinese servant cooks for me personally and attends to the wants which are not many of the other people under my care other people under your care i echoed i had no idea there was anyone in the house save yourself and your servants it's scarcely you would have any idea he observed seeing that no one knows of it save our win who for reasons you have seen is unable to talk about them and myself who would be even less likely to do so would you care to see them i replied that i would very much like to do so and he was about to lead me across the hall towards the door through which the chinese servant had entered some little time before when a curious circumstance happened with a bound that was not unlike the spring of a tiger an enormous cat black as the pit of tophet jumped from the room and approaching his master rubbed himself backwards and forwards against his legs seeing my astonishment nikola condescended to explain you are going to say that i can tell you that you have never seen such a cat as a polyon i suppose you have if he could talk he would be able to tell you some strange stories would you not old man he has been my almost constant companion for many years and more than once he has been the means of saving my life replacing a polyon whom he had picked up on the floor he conducted me towards the entrance of another corridor which led in direction of the keep halfway down it was a rough iron gate which was securely padlocked nikola undid it and when we were on the other side carefully relocked it after him though you may not think so he said these precautions are necessary some of my patients are extremely valuable and i have not the least desire that they should escape from my keeping and fall over the battlements into the sea below follow me i accompanied him towards yet another door which he also unlocked the scene which met my gaze as he threw it open to employ a hackneyed phrase beggar's description the room was about the same size as that that was occupied by the donna consuelo but it was not its proportions that amazed me but its occupants the customs i had necessarily been by virtue of my profession to what are commonly called horrors i found that i was not proof against what i had before me now it was sufficient to make my 
blood run cold anything more gruesome could scarcely have been discovered or even imagined try to picture for yourself the inmates of a dozen freak museums and the worst of monstrosities of which you have ever read or heard and you will only have some dim notion of the folk whom nicola so ironically called his patients some were like men but not men as we know them some were like monkeys but of a kind i had never seen before which i sincerely hope i may never see again there were things dull flabby faceless things but there i can go no further to attempt to describe them to you in detail is a work of which my pen is quite incapable a happy family said nicola advancing into the room and without exception devoted to their nurse our win yonder as you are aware in a measure shares their afflictions with them some day if you care about it i should be only too pleased to give you a lecture with demonstrations such as you would get in no medical school in the world though i have attempted to set down this offer word for word i have but the vaguest recollection of it for long before he had finished speaking i had staggered sick and faint with horror into the corridor outside not for the wealth of england would i have remained there a minute longer to see these loathsome creatures fawning around nicola clutching at his legs and stroking his clothes was too much for me and i verily believed an hour in that room would have the effect of making me an idiot like themselves a few moments later nicola joined me in the passage you're very easily affected my dear ingleby he said with one of his peculiar smiles i should have thought your hospital experience would have endowed you with stronger nerves my poor people in yonder don't don't i cried holding up my hand in entreaty don't speak to me of them don't let me think of them if i do i believe i shall go mad my god are you human that you can live with such things about you i believe i am he answered with the utmost coolness but why make such a fuss do like i do regard them from a scientific standpoint only the poor things have come into this world handicapped by misfortune i endeavour as far as possible to ameliorate their conditions and in return they enable me to perfect my knowledge of the human frame as no other living man can hope to do of course i know there are people who look askance at me for keeping them it doesn't trouble me at one time they lived with me in port said which when you come to think of it was a fit and proper place for such a hospital circumstances however combined to induce me to leave eventually we came here some time if you care to hear it i will tell you the story of their voyage home it would interest you i protested however that i desired to hear no more about them i had both seen and heard too much already that being so nicola led me along the passage and through the iron gate which he locked behind him as before and so conducted me to the hall whence we had first set out once there he went into a corner cabinet and from it produced a decanter pouring me out a stiff glass of brandy he bade me drink it you look as if you wanted he said and heaven knows he was right and now he said when i had finished it if you will take my advice you lie down for an hour or two for the convenience of our work i have arranged that you shall occupy a room near me this is it shall i want you i will ring a bell the room to which he alluded adjoined his own it was situated at the far end of the hall the door like those of the others i have described being concealed behind a curtain never was permission to retire more willingly accepted and within five minutes of leaving him i was in bed and asleep it must have been between ten and eleven o'clock in the forenoon when i retired the afternoon was well advanced before i woke again heavily as i slept however it had not been a restful slumber all things considered i had much better have been waking over and over again i saw the donna consuelo standing before me just as she had done before nicola that day there was this difference however instead of asking to be allowed to remain with her grandfather their prayer was that i should save both him and her for nicola while she pleaded to me the faces of the terrible creatures i had seen in that room down the passage peered at us from all sorts of hiding places i had acceded to the donna's request and was flowing from the castle carrying her in my arms at last after i appeared to have been running for an eternity we reached the shore where i hoped to find a boat awaiting us but not a sign of one was to be seen while i waited day broke and i placed my burden on the sand only to spring back from it with a cry of horror it was not donna consuelo i had been carrying but one of those loathsome creatures i had seen in that terrible room 
A fit of rage came over me. I was about to wreak my vengeance on the unhappy idiot when I woke. I looked about me at the somewhat sparsely furnished room, and some seconds elapsed before I realised where I was. The memory of our arrival at the castle, and all that had happened since, returned to me. I shuddered, and had it not been for that poor girl, so lonely and friendless, I could have found it in my heart to wish myself back in London once more. Having dressed myself, I went out into the hall. Nicola was not there. I waited for some time. But as he did not put in an appearance, I left the room and made my way down the corridor in the direction of the Donna Consuelo's sitting-room. Not being able to get an answer when I knocked, I continued my walk, ascended another flight of stairs, and eventually found myself upon the battlements, a better place for observing the construction of the castle and obtaining a view of surrounding country could not have been desired. On one side I could look away across the moorland towards a distant range of hills, on the other along the cliffs and across the wide expanse of the sea. In the tiny bay to my right, the yacht which had brought us from Newcastle lay at anchor, and had it not been for that and a column of smoke rising from a chimney, I might have believed myself to be living in a world of my own. For some time I stood watching the panorama spread out before me. I was still looking at it when a soft footfall sounded on the stones behind me. I turned to find Donna Consuelo approaching me. She was dressed entirely in black and wore a lace mantilla over her shoulders. Thank heaven I have found you, Dr. Ingleby, she cried as she hastened towards me. I began to think myself deserted by everybody. Why should you do that, I asked. You know that that could never be. I'm certain of nothing now, she answered. You cannot imagine what I have been through today. Indeed, I'm sorry to hear you've been unhappy, I continued. Is there any way I can be of service to you? There are many ways, but I fear you would not employ them, she replied. I'm hungering to be with my great-grandfather again. Can you tell me why Dr. Nicola takes him away from me? I fancied that he had told you, I answered. But if it be any consolation to you, let me give you my assurance that he is being tenderly cared for. His comfort is secured in every way, and from what Dr. Nicola has said to me, and from what I have seen myself, I feel convinced he will be able to do what he has promised and make your great-grandfather a hale and hearty man once more. It's all very well for him to say that, she said, but why am I not permitted to be with him? If he needs nursing, who would be likely to wait upon him so devotedly as the woman who loves him? Surely Dr. Nicola cannot imagine his secret would be unsafe with me, if he reveals it to you, a rival in his own profession. It's not that at all, I answered. Do not fancy Nicola has given a moment's consideration to the safety of his secret. Then, seeing the loophole of escape she presented to me, I added, from what you know of him, I should have thought you have understood that he has no great liking for your sex. Put it bluntly, Nicola is a woman-hater of the most determined order, and I fancy he would find it impossible to carry out his plans if you were in attendance upon the dock. Ah, oh, well, I suppose I must be content with your assurance, she said with a sigh. For the present, I'm very much afraid so, I replied. At this moment, the old woman, whom Nicola had appointed to wait upon us, made her appearance, and informed the donna that her dinner awaited her. About my own meals she knew nothing, so I concluded from this that I was to take them with Nicola in our own portion of the castle. Such proved to be the case, for when we reached the donna Consuelo's apartments on the floor below, we met Nicola awaiting us in the corridor. I've been looking for you, Ingleby, he said with a note of command in his voice. You are quite ready for dinner, I have no doubt. And if you will accompany me, I think we shall find it waiting for us. As may be supposed, I would rather have partaken it with the Donna Consuelo, but as it was not to be, I bade her good morning and was about to follow Nicola along the corridor. When he stopped, turned to the girl and said, I can see from your face that you have been worrying about your grandfather. I assure you, you have not the least cause to do so. And I think Ingleby here, if he has not done so already, will bear me out in what I say. The old gentleman is doing excellently. Almost before you know he has been taken away from you, you will have him back again. Thank you for your news, she replied, but there was very little friendliness in her voice. I would rather, however, see him and convince myself of the fact then bowing to us, she retired to her own departments, while we made our way to the hall in search of our meal. Tomorrow morning, said Nicholas, we drew up our chairs to the table. We must commence work in earnest. 
After that, for some weeks to come, I am afraid you'll see but little of your fair friend down yonder. You seem to be on excellent terms with each other. As he said this, he shot a keen glance at me, as though he was desirous of discovering what was passing in my mind. I was quite prepared for him, however, and I answered in such an unconcerned way that I flattered myself. Should he have got into his head that there was anything more than mere friendship in our intimacy, he would be immediately disabused of the notion. As he predicted, the following morning saw the commencement of that gigantic struggle with the forces of nature upon the result of which Nicola had pinned so much faith and which was destined, so he affirmed, to revolutionise the world. The most exhaustive preparations had been made. The duration of our watches in the sick room were duly apportioned, and a minute outline of the treatment proposed was propounded to me. On entering the dark room in which the old Don lie, I discovered that two bronze pedestals, the use of which had puzzled me so much on my first visit, had been moved near the bed one being placed on his head and the other at its foot. These, Nicola pointed out to me, were the terminals of an electric conductor for producing a constant current, which was to play, without intermission, a few feet above the patient's head. A peculiar and penetrating smell filled the room, which I had no difficulty in recognising as ozone. Though Nicola's reason for using it in such a case was not at first apparent to me. The old Don himself lay just as we had left him, the previous morning. His hands were by his sides, his eyes as usual were open but saw nothing. It is not until I examined him closely that a slight respiratory movement was observable. When I am not here, said Nicola, it must be your business to see that this electric current is kept continually playing above him. It must not be permitted for an instant to abate one unit of its strength. Then, pointing to an instrument fixed at the further wall, he continued, here is a voltmeter with a maximum and minimum points plainly marked upon it. Your record must also include temperature, which you will take on these dry, wet thermometers once every quarter of an hour. The currents of hot and cold air you can regulate by means of these handles. The temperature of the patient himself must be noted once in every hour, and should on no account be permitted to get higher or lower than it is at the present moment. Taking a clinical thermometer from his pocket, he applied it, and when he had noted the result, handed it to me. If it rises two points above that before the same hour three days hence, he will die. No skill can save him. If it drops, well, in 80% of the cases, the result will be the same. I suppose I detect a tendency to rise. In that case, you must communicate instantly with me. Here is an electric button which will put you in touch with my room. I hope, however, that you will have no necessity to use it. Then, placing his hand upon my shoulder, he looked me full in the face. Ingleby, he said, you see how much trust I am placing in you? I tell you frankly, you have a great responsibility upon your shoulders. I am not going to beat about the bush with you. In this case, there is no such thing as certainty. I have made the attempt three times before, and on each occasion my man has died simply through a moment's inattention on the part of my assistant. It's the love of science and a proper appreciation of the compliment I've paid you in asking you to share with me the honour of this great discovery. Do not weigh with you, then think of the girl with whom you talked upon your battlements yesterday. You tried to make me believe that she was nothing to you. Some day, however, she may be. Remember what her grandfather's death would mean to her. You need have no fear, I replied. I assure you, you can trust me implicitly. I do trust you, he answered. Now let us get to work. So saying, he crossed the room and opened a square box, heavily clamped with iron, for which he took two china pots of ointment. Then, disrobing the old man, we anointed him with the most scrupulous care from head to foot. This we did three times, after which the second curious apparatus I had seen standing in the corner was wheeled up to the bedside. That it was an electrical instrument of some sort was plain. But what its specific use was, I could not even conjecture. Nicola, however, very soon enlightened me upon the matter. Taking a number of large velvet pads, each of which was moulded to fit a definite position of the human body, he placed them in position, attached the wires that connected them with the machine, and when all was ready, turned on the current. 
at first no effect was observable in about a minute and a half however if my memory serves me the usual deathly pallor of the skin gave place to a faint blush which presently increased till the skin exhibited a healthy glow little by little the temporal veins then so prominent gradually disappeared in half an hour during which the current had been slowly and very gradually increased another dressing of both ointments was applied take this glass and examine his skin said nikola whose eyes were gleaming with excitement as he handed me a powerful magnifying glass when i bent over the patient and did as he directed it was indeed a wonderful thing that i beheld an hour before the skin had been soft and hung in loose folds upon the bones while the pressure of a finger upon it would not leave it up for upwards of any of a minute now it had in a measure regained its youthful elasticity and upon my softly pinching it between my fingers i found that it recovered its colour almost immediately it is wonderful i whispered had i not seen it myself i would never have believed it when it had been applied for an hour the electric current was turned off and the pads removed now watch what happens very closely said nikola for i assure you the effect is curious scarcely able to breathe by reason of my excitement i watched and as i did so saw the flush of apparent health gradually decrease the skin became white and loose once more while the superficial veins rose into a prominence upon the temples i glanced at nikola thinking that some mistake must have occurred and that he would show signs of disappointment this however he did not do you surely did not imagine he said when i had questioned him upon the subject that the effect i produced would be permanent on the first application no we may hope to achieve a more lasting result in a fortnight's time but not till then meanwhile the effect must be produced in the same fashion every six hours both day and night now give me those rugs we must cover him carefully in his present state the least draught would be fatal record the state of the voltmeter read your thermometers and see that your ventilating apparatus is working properly as i said just now should you need me remember the bell one ring when you have recorded your results will inform me that all is progressing satisfactorily or three will immediately bring me to your assistance do you understand when i had assured him that i did he left me i accordingly switched off three of the electric lights and sat myself down in a chair in semi-darkness the centre of light being the patient on the bed there is no fear of my feeling dull for i had a great deal to think about taken altogether the situation in which i found myself was as extraordinary as the most inveterate seeker after excitement could desire not a sound was to be heard the stillness was that of the tomb and yet i smiled to myself as i thought that if nicholas experiment achieved the result he expected of it the simile was not an appropriate one for it was not the silence of the tomb but of perpetual life itself i looked at the figure on the bed before me and tried to picture what the mystery he was unravelling would mean to mankind it was a solemn thought should the experiment prove successful how would it affect the world would it prove a blessing or a curse but the thoughts it conjured up were too vast the issues too great and to attempt to solve them was only to lose oneself in the fields of wildest conjecture for four hours i remained on duty noting all that occurred reading my thermometers regulating the hot and cold air apparatus and at intervals signalling to nikola that everything was progressing satisfactorily when he relieved me i retired to rest and slept like a top too tired even to dream of what happened during the fortnight following i have little to tell nikola and i watched by the bedside in turn took our exercise upon the battlements ate and slept with the regularity of automata the life on one side was monotonous in the extreme on the other it was filled with an unholy excitement that was the greater in so much as it had been so carefully suppressed to say that i was deeply interested in the work upon which i was engaged be by a by no means strong enough expression the fire of enthusiasm to which i have alluded was raging once more in my heart and yet there had been little enough so far in the experiment to excite it with that regularity which characterized the whole of our operations we carried on the work i have described 
Every sixth hour saw the skin tighten and become elastic, the hue of the flesh change from white to pink, the veins recede, and the hollows fill only to return to their original state as soon as the electric current was withdrawn. Towards the end of the fortnight, however, there were not wanting signs to show that the effect was gradually becoming more lasting. In place of doing so at once, the change to the original condition did not occur until some eight or ten minutes after the pads had been removed. And here I must remark that there was one other point on which the case struck me as peculiar. When I had first seen the old man, his fingernails were of that pale yellow tint, so often observable in the very old. Now they were a delicate shade of pink, while his hair was, I felt convinced, a darker shade than it had been before. As Nicola was careful to point out, we had arrived at the most critical stage of the experiment. A mistake at this juncture would not only undo all the work we had accomplished, but what was more serious still might very possibly cost us the life of the patient himself. The night I am about to describe was at the end of the fourteenth day after our arrival at the castle. Nicola had been on watch from four o'clock in the afternoon until eight when I relieved him. Do not let your eyes wander from him for a minute, he said, as I took my place beside the bed. From certain symptoms I've noticed during the last few hours, I'm convinced the crisis is close at hand. Should a rise in the temperature occur, summon me instantly. I shall be in the laboratory, ready at a moment's notice, to prepare the elixir upon which the success we hope to achieve depends. But you are worn out, I said, as I noticed the haggard expression upon his face. Why don't you take some rest? Rest, he cried scornfully. It's likely that I could rest with such a discovery just coming within my grasp. No, you need not fear for me. I shall not break down. I have a constitution of iron. Having once more warned me to advise him of any change that might occur, he left me, and when I had examined my instruments, attended to the electrical apparatus, and taken the patient's temperature, I sat down to the vigil to which I had by this time become accustomed. Hour by hour I followed the customary routine, my watch was nearly at an end. In twenty minutes it would be time for Nicola to relieve me. Leaning over the old man, I convinced myself that no change had taken place in his condition. His temperature was exactly what it had been throughout the preceding fortnight. I carefully wiped the clinical thermometer and replaced it in its case. As I did so, I was startled by hearing a wild shriek in the hall outside. It was a woman's voice and the accent was one of deadly terror. I should have recognised the voice anywhere. It was the Donna Consuelos. What could have happened? Once more it rang out, and almost before I knew what I was doing, I had rung the bell for Nicola and rushed from the room to the hall outside. No one was to be seen there. I ran in the direction of the corridor, which led towards the Donna's own quarters, but she was not there. I returned and followed that leading towards the terrible room behind the iron gate. The passage was in semi-darkness, but there was still sufficient light for me to see a body lying upon the floor. As I thought, it was the Donna Consuelo, and she had fainted. Picking her up in my arms, I carried her to the hall, where the meal of which I was to partake at the end of my watch was already prepared. To bathe her forehead was the work of a moment. She revived almost immediately. What's the matter? she asked faintly. What has happened? But before I could reply, the recollection of what she had seen returned to her. A look of abject terror came into her face. Save me, save me, Dr. Inglebury, she cried, clinging to my arm like a frightened child. If I see them again, I shall go mad. It will kill me. You don't know how frightened I have been. I thought I was in a position to understand exactly. Hush, I answered. Try to think of something else. You're quite safe with me. Nothing shall harm you here. She covered her face with her hands, and her slender frame trembled under the violence of her emotion. Five minutes had elapsed before she was sufficiently recovered to tell me everything. For some days, as I soon discovered, she had been left mostly entirely alone, and having nothing to occupy her mind, had been brooding over her enforced separation from her aged relative. The more she thought of him, the more intense became her craving to see him, in order to convince herself that no harm had befallen him. A semi-hysterical condition must have ensued, for she rose from her bed 
dressed herself, and taking a candle in her hand, started in the hope of finding him. By some stroke of ill fortune she must have discovered a passage leading to Ah Wynne's portion of the castle, and at last found herself standing before the open door of that demon-haunted room. What does it all mean? she cried piteously. What is this place? And why are those dreadful things here? I was about to reply when the curtain at the end of the hall, covering the door of the laboratory, was drawn aside. To my horrified amazement, Nicola, whom I imagined had taken my place at the patient's room, stood before us. As I saw him and realised the significance of the position, a cold sweat broke out on my forehead. What construction would he be likely to place upon my presence there? For a few seconds he stood watching us. Then an expression I can only describe as being one of terror spread over his face. What does this mean? he cried hoarsely. What have you done? And then running to the door of the Don's room, he drew back the curtain and entered. Leaving the Donna where she was, I followed with such fear in my heart as I had never known before. I found Nicola fumbling with the case of the clinical thermometer and trembling like a leaf as he did so. Thrusting it into the old man's mouth, he hung over him and waited, as if his whole life depended on the result. Withdrawing it again, and holding up to the light, he gazed at it. Too late, he cried, and I scarcely recognised his voice, so changed was it. His temperature has dropped a point, Ingleby. This is your doing. For all you know to the contrary, you may have killed him. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of Dr. Nicholas' Experiment by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Chapter Seven. In the preceding chapter, I made you acquainted with the calamity which befell our patient, and the serious position in which I found myself placed with Nicola in consequence. While knowing in my own heart that I was quite innocent of any intentional neglect of duty, I had yet to remember that I had remained on watch instead of leaving the room to ascertain what had befallen the Donna Consuelo. It would, in all probability, never have occurred. On the other hand, I had signalled Dr. Nicola and called him to my assistance before abandoning my charge. How it was that he had not answered my summons was more than I could understand. As it transpired afterwards, however, and as is usual in such things, the explanation was a very simple one. In the last chapter I said that when he left me to go to the laboratory, he was quite exhausted. He had eaten nothing for many hours, and as a natural result, the fumes of the herbs he was distilling had overpowered him, and he had fallen in a dead faint upon the floor. As long as I live, I shall retain the recollection of the next fourteen hours. During the whole of that time, Nicola and I fought death inch by inch for the body of the old Don. From midnight until the following afternoon, neither of us crossed the threshold of the sick chamber, and during the whole of that time, save to give me brief directions, Nicholas spoke no word to me at all. It was only when the mercury in the clinical thermometer was once more established on its accustomed mark that he addressed me. Rearranging the bed covering and wiping his clammy forehead with his pocket handkerchief, he turned to me. I think he will do now, he said provided he does not lose ground within the next half hour you may take it for granted that he's out of danger this was the opportunity for which i was waiting i accordingly seized it i'm afraid dr nicola i said mustering with courage as i progressed that you consider me to blame for what has happened he looked sharply at me and then said coldly i failed to see how i could very well think otherwise i left you in charge and you deserted your post but I assure you, I continued, that you are misjudging me. I could not help myself. I heard the girl scream and ran to her assistance. At the same time, I took care to ring the bell for you before I left the room. You should not have left it at all until I had joined you, he answered, with a still same icy tone. As a matter of fact, I did not hear your summons. I had fainted. And the other question, what was the girl doing in this portion of the castle? She was hysterical, I answered. I was searching for her great-grandfather. 
she did not know herself how she got here but as ill luck would have it she saw your terrible people and was frightened nearly to death in consequence for common humanity's sake i could not leave her as she was having rung for you i naturally thought you were with the don and that i was free to render her what assistance i could your argument is certainly plausible but supposing the man had died during your absence how would you have felt then i should have regretted it all my life i answered but surely you must admit that would have been better than that young girl should have been driven mad by fear you do not seem to understand nikola replied that i would willingly sacrifice a thousand girls to accomplish this great object i have in view no no ingleby you have been found wanting in your duty you have checked the progress of the experiment if that old man had died here he took a step towards me his face suddenly became livid with passion as i live at this moment you would never have seen the light of day again i swear i would have killed you with as little compunction as i would have destroyed a dog who had bitten me so menacing was his attitude and so fiendish the expression on his face that i instinctively recoiled a step from him however i don't think my worst enemy could accuse me of being a coward was the man a lunatic i asked myself had the magnitude of his discovery turned his head if so i must be careful in my dealings with him i'm afraid i do not understand you dr nikola i said trying to appear calmer than i really felt you talk in an exaggerated fashion and one which i cannot permit i confess to being a certain measure to blame for what has happened but if you feel that you can no longer repose trust in me that you once did i would rather resign my post and leave your house at once for a moment i thought i detected a sign of fear in his face then his manner changed completely my dear ingleby he said patting me on my shoulder and speaking in quite a different tone if i hurt your feelings just now i hope you will forgive me and describe it to my anxiety for the last two days as you are aware i have been overwrought i stated that i considered you to blame i said more than i meant for of course i know that you had no intention of injuring our patient or of doing anything to prejudice the end that we have in view it was a combination of unfortunate circumstances the ill effects of which by good luck we have been able to remedy let us forget all about it with all my heart i said with a momentary friendliness i have never felt for him before and held up my hand to him he took it and went to my surprise i found that his hand was as cold as ice in this fashion the cloud between us appeared to have blown away but though it was no longer visible to the naked eye it still existed for i was unable to dispel from my mind the recollection of the threat he had used to me if he were not in earnest now he had at least been so then and for my own part i put more faith in his threats than in his protestations of friendship come come this will never do said nikola after a few moments silence which had followed after our reconciliation it is nearly three o'clock you had better go to your room and rest for a couple of hours after which you can relieve me seeing his haggard and weary face i offered to remain on duty while he went to lie down but to this he would not consent it was plain he was still brooding over what had happened and that he did not intend to trust me any further than he was absolutely obliged accordingly i did not press him but as soon as i had noted the various temperatures and had done what i could to help him i left him to his vigil and went to my own apartment i had had nineteen hours in the sick room and in consequence was completely worn out during that time i had heard nothing of the donna consuelo when i laid my head upon my pillow and closed my eyes a terrified face as i had seen it the previous night rose before me even then i could feel the thrill which had run through me as i took that lovely body in my arms what place was this terrible castle i asked myself for such a woman how dreary was the life she was compelled to lead in it without companions cut off from the one person who only a week before had been all the world to her this suggested another and sweeter thought to me was there only one person she loved i remembered how she had clung to me in the hall and how she had appealed to me to save her the mere thought that there might be something more than simple liking in her attitude was sufficient to set my heart beating like a sledgehammer 
was it possible that i could be falling in love i who had thought myself done with that sort of thing for ever i smiled at the idea a nice sort of position i was in to contemplate such a thing and yet i was so lonely in the world that it soothed me to think there might be someone to whom i was a little more than the average man and that someone was a beautiful and noble woman with these thoughts in my brain i fell asleep a moment later so it seemed the electric bell above my head brought me wide awake again one glance at my watch was sufficient however to show me that i had been asleep two hours i dressed as quickly as possible and returned to the don's room where much to my relief nikola informed me there had been no relapse and that all was progressing as satisfactorily as he could wish bidding me exercise the greatest vigilance he left me and staggered from the room a little more of this sort of thing my friend i said to myself as i watched him pass out of the door only a little more and you will be unfit for anything but i had yet to learn the strength of nicholas constitution he was like a steel bow he might often be bent but never broken it was until the following morning that i saw donna consuelo again we met upon the battlements as usual dr ingleby she said after we'd been standing together some time i feel there is something i should say to you i want to tell you how sorry i am for what occurred the other night but for my folly in wandering about the castle as i did i should not have seen she paused for a moment and a shudder swept over her face at the recollection i should not have seen what i did and you would not have got into trouble with dr nikola how do you know that i did get into trouble with dr nikola i asked because dr nikola spoke to me about it she replied on hearing this i pricked up my ears had nikola taken her to task for what she had done in all probability had blamed her i tried to catch her on this point but she would tell me nothing you will accept my apology won't you she asked it has made me so unhappy you must apologize to me at all i answered i assure you none is needed i would have given anything to have prevented your seeing well what you did and still more to have prevented nikola from speaking to you he had no right to do so then drawing a little closer to her i took her hand donna consuelo i said i am very much afraid your life here is a very unhappy one i was happier in spain she answered but i do not want you to think i am grumbling you have given me your promise that no ill shall befall my great-grandfather and for this reason i have no fear if he is well what right have i to complain of anything that may happen to myself some day perhaps dr nikola will allow us to go back to spain and then i shall forget all about this terrible castle i wondered if the hope she entertained would ever be realized but i was not going to permit her to suppose that i entertained any doubt at all about it i felt i should like to have said more but prudence restrained me she looked so beautiful that the temptation was almost more than i could withstand whether she knew anything of what was in my mind i cannot say but somehow i fancied she must have done so though i have no desire to appear conceited i could not help thinking when we bade each other good-bye there was a look of sorrow in her face once more a fortnight went by a month had now elapsed since our arrival at the castle and as i could plainly see nicholas's experiment was at length achieving a definite result the changes effected by the use of electric batteries and the constant anointing which i have already described having ceased within a short time of the removal of the means by which they were occasioned were now almost permanent and were becoming more so every day the patient's flesh was firmer his skin more elastic while his usual pallor had given place to what might be almost described as a healthy tint so far success had crowned nicola's endeavours but whether the final result would be what he desired was more than i could say after the little contretemps which followed my mistake already described nicola and i had agreed fairly well together I was aware however that he was suspicious of my intimacy with the old don's great-granddaughter and from the way in which he glanced at the patient and the various instruments whenever he relieved me in the sick room i could tell he was always anxious to satisfy himself that i had not done anything to prejudice the work we had in hand it may easily be supposed therefore that our partnership was far from being as pleasant as it had promised in london to be to live in an atmosphere of continual suspicion is unpleasant at any time 
but it becomes doubly so when another's happiness depends in a very large measure upon it of course the reason was apparent to me there must have been something more in nikola's mind than i could fathom for i think i can assert most truthfully that never for a moment did i allow an effort to be wanting on my part to show how much i had his interest at heart it was yet another thing which puzzled me it was this what was to happen when the required result had been achieved and the old don was transformed into a young man again and more important still what would become of his great granddaughter the whole thing seemed so absurd so unnatural if you like it better that i could see no proper conclusion to it still there was time to talk of that later on the old don was already i am prepared to admit in a certain sense younger that is to say he did not present that appearance of great age which had been noticeable on board the donna mercedes at the same time he was still very far from being a young man one day i found sufficient courage to speak on this point to nikola that is one of the most remarkable points in my argument he answered if he were to change his state so quickly i should despair of success as it is i am more than hopeful i am sanguine to-morrow if he continues to progress so favourably we shall enter upon the third stage of the experiment granted that is successful i shall be within measurable distance of the greatest medical discovery of this or any other century knowing it was useless attempting to question him further i was compelled to possess my soul in patience until the time should arrive for him to enlighten me the following morning as soon as i had finished my period of duty in the don's chamber i informed nikola of my intention of going for a short stroll the time he had decided was not ripe yet for the third phase as i knew that i should be kept closely employed as soon as it was I was anxious to obtain as much exercise as possible while I had the opportunity. Accordingly, I placed my hat upon my head and descended into the courtyard. Strangely enough, it was the first time I had set foot in it since our arrival at the castle. It was an exquisite morning for walking. The sky was blue overhead, a brisk breeze was blowing, and when I had crossed the drawbridge and looked down into the little bay where the waves rolled in and broke with a noise like thunder upon the beach, I felt happier than I had been for some considerable time past. I watched the white gulls wheeling above my head, and as I did so, the recollection of the time when I had last seen them rose before my mind's eye. It was the day that I had come so near to speaking words of love to Donna Consuelo upon the battlements. I remember the look I had seen in her sweet face, and as I did so, I realised how much she was for me. With a light step and a feeling of elation in my heart, I made my way down the path towards the beach. Not a soul was to be seen, for I remembered having heard Nicola say that the yacht had gone south for stores. Reaching the water's edge, I stood and looked back at the castle. It was a sombre enough place in all conscience, and yet there was something about it which affected me in a manner I can scarcely describe. I looked at it for a few moments. Then turning my back upon it, I set off along the beach at a brisk pace, whistling gaily as I went. Eventually I reached the further side of the bay opposite that on which the castle was situated. Here the sand gave place to large rocks, which in their turn terminated in a tall headland. The view from these rocks was grand in the extreme. Night and day the rollers of the North Sea broke upon them, throwing showers of spray high into the air. Clambering up, I struggled for fifty yards or so, and finally seating myself upon a rock somewhat larger than the rest to enjoy the view. A surprise was in store for me. Looking back upon the way I had come, I caught the sight of a figure walking towards me on the sands. Needless to say, it was the Donna Consuelo. Whether she was aware of my presence upon the rocks, I cannot say. I only know that as soon as I saw her, I rose from where I was sitting and hastened to meet her how beautiful she looked and how her face lighted up as i came closer are things which i must leave to the imagination of my reader you are further than broader than usual today are you not i said as we shook hands might i not say the same of you she answered with a smile the morning was so beautiful that i could not remain in that terrible old building every corner seems to suggest unhappy memories to me you really think that all the memories connected with it will be unpleasant i inquired 
she looked up at me in a little startled way and blushed divinely as she did so could you expect me to regard the time i have spent in it with any sort of pleasure she inquired fencing with my meaning and giving me a roland for an oliver only think what i have suffered in it by this time we were strolling back towards the rocks i have already described the beach at this point narrowed considerably and for some reason or another we walked a little nearer the cliff than i had done suddenly my companion stopped and pointing to the sand said you had a companion this morning i i had no companion i answered what makes you think so look here she said and as she spoke she pointed to some footmarks in the sand before us as you went up the beach you walked near the water's edge and as you came to meet me you passed midway between your former tracks and the cliff if you did not have a companion whose footprints are these they must have been made this morning for as you are aware when the tide is full it comes right up to the cliffs and would be certain to wash anything out that existed before i stooped and I examined the tracks carefully before i answered they were evidently those of a man and from the fact that the sand was hard the outline could be plainly distinguished the foot that was responsible for them was a large one and must have been clad in an extremely clumsy boot i don't know what to think of it i said one thing however is quite certain i had no companion this morning what about the old man and his wife at the castle i happen to know they have both been hard at work all morning she answered besides what object could they have in following you the beach leads nowhere and from here to yonder point there is no place where you can reach the land above i shook my head the problem was too much for me at the same time i must own it disquieted me strangely who was this mysterious person who had dogged my footsteps what could have been his object in following me for a moment i inclined to the belief that it might have been dr nikola who was anxious to discover how i spent my leisure but on second thoughts the absurdity of the idea became apparent to me but if it were not nikola who could it have been on reaching the rocks we seated ourselves and fell to criticising the picture spread before our gaze there was something in my companion's manner this morning which analyse it as i would i could not understand she was by turns light-hearted and sad the two expressions chased each other across her face like clouds across an april sky at last she returned to the topic which i knew must come sooner or later that of her great-grandfather's condition i seem cut off from him for ever she said with infinite sadness i hear nothing of him from week's end to week's end and i see nothing of him he has gone completely out of my life but only for the time being i answered dr nikola has assured you that he will restore him to health and strength think what that will mean and how happy you will be together then i know it's very wrong of me to say so she continued but i cannot keep it back dr ingleby i distrust dr nikola he is deceiving me of that i feel sure knowing what i did i could not contradict her but i saw my opportunity and acted upon it but if you do not trust dr nikola i said am i to suppose that you do not trust me she was silent and i noticed that she turned her face away from me as if she were anxious to study the castle and the cliff what was more i noticed that her hand trembled a little as it rested on the rock beside me once more i put the question and as i did so leant a little towards her i do trust you she answered but so softly i could scarcely hear it consuelo i said in a voice but a little louder than that in which she had addressed me you cannot think what happiness it is to me to hear you say that as i have tried to show you there is nothing i would not do to prove how anxious i am to be worthy of your trust we have known each other but a little longer than a month in that time however i have learnt to know you as well as any man could know a woman i have learnt more than that consuelo i have learnt to love you better than life itself no no she answered you must not say that i cannot hear you but it must be said i answered my love will not be denied you do love me consuelo i can see it in your face don't you think that i watched and longed for it instead of turning her face to me she turned it still further from mine i took a little hand in mine what is your answer consuelo i asked be brave and tell me darling if i were brave she said i should tell you what you ask must never be it is hopeless impossible 
that it would be madness for us to think of such a thing but i'm not brave i am so lonely in the world and have lost so much that i cannot lose you also then you love me i cried in such triumph as i had never felt for anything else in my life before thank god thank god for that yes i love you she answered and the great waves breaking on the rocks seemed to echo the happiness we were both feeling over the next half hour i must draw a veil by the end of that time it was necessary for me to think of returning to the castle nicola's watch would be up in an hour and i knew it would not do for me to keep him waiting as i said as much to consuelo and we immediately rose and set out on our return as i walked beside her i would not have changed position with any living man so happy was i my peace of mind however was destined to be but short-lived we had crossed the greater number of the rocks and were approaching the sand once more when i received a shock which i shall not forget as long as i can remember anything clambering over the sharp and slippery rocks was by no means an easy business it was however delightful to hold my sweetheart's hand in the pretence of assisting me occasionally it became necessary for us to make considerable detours and once i bade her remain where she was until i had climbed a somewhat bigger rock than usual in order to find out whether we could proceed that way I had reached the top, I was about to extend my hand to her assistance, and something caused me to look behind me. Judge of my surprise and consternation at finding in the hollow below me a man crouching on the sand watching me. It was the Chinaman I had seen on board the Dona Mercedes, the man who had thrown the knife which had so nearly terminated Nicola's existence. How I managed to retain my presence of mind at that trying moment I find it difficult now to understand. I only know this, that I realised in a flash the fact that it would have been madness to pretend to have seen him. Accordingly, I stood for a moment looking out to sea. Then, with a laugh that must have sounded far from natural, I rejoined Consuelo on the rock below and chose another path towards the sands. What is the matter? she inquired when we had proceeded a short distance. Your face is quite pale. I did not feel very well for a moment, I answered, making use of the first excuse that occurred to me. I'm afraid you are not telling me the truth, she answered. I feel convinced something has frightened you. Can you not trust me? Under the circumstances, I thought it would be better for me to make a clean breast of it. I will trust you, I answered. The fact of the matter is I have discovered an explanation from the footsteps you pointed out to me upon the beach. We are being followed. When I jumped on top of that rock, I found a man lying on the other side of it a man who could he have been why should he be spying on us did you recognize him perfectly i should have known him anywhere then who was he the chinaman we saw on board the steamer the man who stole the drugs nicola entrusted to my care do you mean the man who entered my cabin and bent over to look at me she cried in alarm i nodded and threw a quick glance over my shoulder to discover whether we were still being followed I could see nothing, however, of the man, a circumstance which by no means allayed my anxiety. What do you think we'd better do? inquired Consuelo. Hasten home as fast as we can, and go tell Nicola, I answered. It's imperative he should know at once. We accordingly continued our walk at increased speed, every now and then throwing apprehensive glances behind us. It's possible some of my readers may regard it as an exhibition of cowardice on my part, to have sought refuge in flight. But when all the circumstances connected with it are taken into consideration, I am sure every fair-minded person will acquit me of this charge. Had I been alone, it is possible I might have turned and risked an encounter with the man. But Consuelo being with me rendered such a course impossible. For the first time since we had known it, the grim old castle, perched up on the cliff, seemed a desirable place, and it was with a feeling of profound relief and I led my sweetheart across the drawbridge and was able to tell myself, for the time being at least, she was safe. On reaching the hall, I found that I still had twenty minutes to spare. I had no desire, however, for further leisure. What I wanted was to see Nicola at once in order to tell him my unpalatable news. On entering the room, I found him engaged in taking the old man's temperature. He looked up at me as if he were surprised to see me return so soon. I said nothing until he had finished the work upon which he was engaged. 
I can see from your face that you have had a fright. And you have something to say to me concerning it, he began, when he returned the thermometer to its case. Our friend Kwong Ma has turned up again, I suppose. How did you know it, I asked. I had no idea that he was aware of the man's appearance in the neighbourhood. I guessed it, he answered with one of his peculiar smiles. You are the possessor of the most expressive countenance. Consider for a moment. You will understand how it is I am able to arrive at a conclusion so quickly. In the first place, you have been for a walk with the young lady whom you love and who loves you in return. Perhaps you saw me, I replied sharply, feeling myself blushing to the roots of my hair. I have not left this room, he answered. There's a long black hair on your collar which would not have been there if you had spent your liberty by yourself. The same thing tells me that you love her and she loves you. As for the other matter, the caretaker and his wife have been busily employed in the castle all morning, while our wind never leaves its own portion of the premises. There is only one person outside the walls who could have put that expression into your face, and that person is Kwong Ma. Am I right? Quite right, I replied. He followed me along the sands and hid himself among the rocks. In recrossing them from the point, I, as nearly as possible, jumped on him. I'm very glad you did not quite do so, he answered. Had you experienced that misfortune, you would not have been here to tell the tale. But enough of him for the present. Take your place here and watch our patient. In an hour's time, his temperature should have risen two points. When it has done so, give him ten drops of this fluid in twenty drops of distilled water. A profuse perspiration should result, which will herald the return of consciousness and the new life. In twenty-four hours he should not only be conscious, but on his way to the commencement of his second youth. In forty-eight the improvement should be firmly established, while in a week we should have him on his legs, a living, moving, thinking man, and of my own creation. Watch him, therefore, and whatever happens, do not leave this room. Meanwhile, I'll have the drawbridge raised, and if Kong Ma can leap the chasm and make his way into the castle, well, all I can say is he's a cleverer man than I take him to be. With that, Nicola left me, and I sat down to watch beside the aged Don. Apart from my duty towards him, I had plenty to think about. Over and over again, I found myself recalling the incidents of the morning. Consuelo loved me, and happen what might, I would prove myself worthy of her love. At the end of the hour, as Nicola had predicted, the patient's temperature had risen two points. I accordingly measured out the stipulated quantity of the medicine he had placed in readiness for me, added the necessary quantity of water and poured it into the old man's mouth. And I sat myself down to wait. Slowly the hands of the clock upon the wall went round, and sixty minutes later, just as Nicola had prophesied, Small beads of perspiration made their appearance upon his forehead. It was an exciting moment, and one for which we had been eagerly waiting. I immediately rang the bell for Nicola, and upon his arrival informed him of the fact. At last, at last, he whispered, it is certain now that I have made no mistake. From this moment forward his progress should be assured. In a week you will be rewarded by a sight such as the eye of man has never yet seen. Be faithful to me, Ingleby. I pledge my word that your future with a woman you love is assured. For the remainder of that day, and indeed until eleven o'clock in the morning the following, there was but little change in the old Don's condition. The casual observer would have seen but little difference from the day on which I had first taken charge of him on board the steamer. But Nicola and myself, however, who had spent so much time with him, and who had noted every change, there was a difference so vast that it seemed almost incomprehensible. My watch the next morning was from four o'clock until eight. At eight I breakfasted, and afterwards repaired to the battlements above in the hope of meeting Consuelo. Since Nicola had ordered the drawbridge to be raised, we had been compelled to make this our meeting place, and as it happened, Consuelo was the first at the rendezvous. Oh, good news for me, she cried after I had kissed her. Can you, I can see it in your face. What is it? Does it concern my great-grandfather? It does, I answered. It concerns him inasmuch as I am able to tell you that what Nicola promised you should happen has in reality come to pass. Everything has been satisfactory beyond our wildest hopes. And do you mean that all need of anxiety is over, she cried? I don't mean that exactly, I answered, but I think it's very possible we should soon be able to say so. 
Nicola is certainly the most wonderful man upon this earth. What she said in reply, it would be vanity on my part to recall. It would only be another instance of the folly of lover's talk. Let it suffice that for upwards of an hour our converse was of the sweetest description. Hand in hand, we sat upon the battlements, looking out across the sunlit sea, and building our castles in the air. We were interrupted by our wind, who suddenly made his appearance before us, and beckoned me to follow him. Bidding Consuelo good-bye, I followed the fellow to the hall, where he pointed to the old Don's room and left me. I found Nicola in a state of wildest excitement. I sent for you because the crisis is close at hand, he whispered. At any moment now I may know my fate. Little by little I have built up this worn-out frame, strengthening and renewing, revivifying, and now the object of my ambition is almost achieved. A thousand years ago the secret was guessed by a certain sect in Asia. After working a hundred or more years upon it, they at length perfected it, but by the law of their order only one man was permitted to derive any benefit from it. I obtained this secret, how it does not matter. Added to it what I thought it lacked, and here is the result. As he spoke, a visible tremor ran over the form on the bed before us. The excitement was well nigh unbearable. For the first time in more than thirty days, movement was to be detected. The eyelids flickered, the mouth twitched, and little by little the eyes opened. Nicola immediately stooped over him and concentrated all his attention upon the pupils, and placing his fingertips so close that they almost touched the lashes, he drew them away again in long transverse passes. Do you know me? he asked in a voice that shook with emotion. Almost instantly the man replied, I know you. Do you suffer any pain? I do not. Sleep then, rest and gain strength, and in two days from this hour wake again a strong man. Once more he placed his hands before the patient's eyes. As he drew them away the lids closed. Nicola bent over him and listened, and when he rose he nodded reassuringly to me. It's all right, he said. His respiration is as even and unbroken as that of a sleeping child. As usual, my watch that night was from eight o'clock until midnight. From the fact that Don Miguel continued to sleep as quietly at that moment as when Nicola had hypnotised him, it was neither as difficult nor as anxious as before. Nor was I altogether discontented with my lot. I was in love. I was loved in my turn. I was engaged in deeply interesting employment which, should the experiment terminate successfully, would in all probability ensure my being able to start for a second time in my profession, and with an added knowledge that it would bring me to the top of the tree at once. The room in which I sat was warm and comfortable. Outside, however, a violent storm was raging. The rain and wind beat against the window in the hall with the wildest fury. Now, ever since I had watched by the Don's bedside, I had made it my habit to carefully lock the door as soon as Nicola left the room. On this particular occasion, I had not departed from my custom. The hands of the clock on the wall stood at ten minutes past eleven, and I was reflecting that I should not be sorry when my watch was over and I at liberty to retire to bed, when, to my astonishment, I saw the handle of the door slowly turn. At first, I almost believed that my imagination was playing me a trick. But when the handle revolved and was afterwards turned again, I was satisfied that this was not the case. It was the person on the other side. It would not be our win for the reason that he had been particularly instructed on no account ever to touch the door. Consuelo would not venture into that portion of the castle again on any consideration whatsoever, while Nicola himself, being aware that I always kept it locked, would have knocked before attempting to enter. Whoever it was must have been satisfied that the task was a hopeless one. At any rate, he desisted, and I heard no more of him. A few moments later, the ventilator required my attention, and I was too busy to bestow any more thought upon the matter. Indeed, it was not until Nicola knocked upon the door and relieved me that it entered my mind again. It became apparent immediately that he attached more importance to the incident than I was inclined to do. Very strange, he said, but it accounts for one thing which I must confess has puzzled me. What is that? I inquired. Yeah, I will show you, he answered, and led the way to the hall. At the further end, near the window, 
he paused and pointed to a mark upon the floor not being able to see it very distinctly i went down upon my hands and knees do you know what it is asked nikola i do i answered it is the print of a naked foot yes said nikola and that foot was wet it was more than that here he took a magnifying glass from his pocket and also went down upon his hands and knees the chimney leading from our wind's room he said is almost exactly above our heads in consequence as you may have noticed the battlements at that point are invariably covered with smuts the naked foot which made this mark brought some of these particles with it which tells us that there was only one way in which the owner could have come and that was down a rope and through the window let us examine the window we did so but so far as i could see there was nothing there to reward us the rain was pelting down and the wind blew as i had never heard it before the man whoever he was was certainly not deficient in pluck said nikola i shouldn't have cared to lower myself over the battlements on a night like this are you sure that he did not lower himself i inquired are you sure that he did so lower himself i inquired i'm quite sure nikola answered how else could he have come the old don is safe for half an hour at least get your revolver i will get mine and we'll go upstairs in search of the intruder i did as he directed but with no great willingness as you may suppose i was quite convinced as to the identity of the mysterious visitor and knowing his proficiency in the art of knife throwing i had not the smallest desire to become better acquainted with him however i was not going to allow nikola to think i was afraid so putting the best face i could upon it i did as he directed and having assured myself that my weapon was loaded in every chamber i followed him along the corridor up the stone staircase and so out on to the battlements above of all the storms in my experience i think that particular one was certainly the worst the rain beat in our faces and so great was the strength of the wind that the very castle itself seemed to shake and tremble before it revolver in hand expecting every moment to be confronted by the man of whom we were in search i followed nikola in the direction of the engine room chimney i knew very well for what he was looking he thought he would find a rope there but in this he was disappointed nor were we able to discover any traces of human beings we searched the whole length of the battlements in vain and at last were perforce compelled to give up the hunt as hopeless returning to the stairway once more we were about to descend when i saw nikola stoop and pick something up whatever it was he said nothing to me until we had reached the light of the corridor below then he held it up for me to see it was a grey felt hat the same that i had seen upon the chinaman's head that morning mark my words said nikola we shall have trouble with kwong ma before very long end of chapter seven Chapter 8 of Dr. Nicholas' Experiment by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8. When we had returned to the corridor below the battlements, after our search for the man who had lowered himself down to the window of the hall, Nicola brought with him the soft felt hat I had observed upon the head of that villainous Chinaman, Kwong Ma, that morning. Though neither of us was altogether surprised at finding that he was the man we suspected of being in the castle we were none the more pleased at having our suspicions confirmed the thing which puzzled us most however was how he had obtained admission seeing that he had not been in sight when i had entered the castle that morning that i had informed nikola of my meeting with him within five minutes of my arrival and that the drawbridge had been raised if not at once certainly within a quarter of an hour of making my report and yet it was plain that he had been upon the battlements that he was in the castle and that his being there boded no good was as apparent as his presence i always knew they had original ideas said nikola but i had no idea that they were as clever as this we shall have to be very careful what we do for the future for from what i know of them they would stick at nothing tomorrow morning we must search the castle from dungeon to turret and if we find them in that case said nikola i fancy i know a way of dealing with them 
Donna Consuelo locks her door at night, I suppose? I informed him that I had advised her to do so. It would be better that we should make certain, he answered. And proceeding to the door in question, he softly turned the handle. It was securely fastened from the inside. Seems all right, said Nicola. Now we will return to our own quarters and make everything secure there. We did as suggested, and when everything was made fast, to securely lock the door in the corridor behind us. Reaching the hall once more, we made a careful survey of the various rooms, including not only the apartments leading out of it, but also the passage leading to our wind's quarters. No sign, however, of the man we wanted was to be seen there. Returning to the hall, we assured ourselves that our patient was still sleeping quietly, and then I bade Nicola good night and prepared to go to my room. I should advise you to lock your door, he said as we parted. You cannot take too many precautions when Kong Ma and his companion are about. Shall I require your assistance during the night? I will ring for you. I promised to answer his call immediately and was about to turn away when it occurred to me to ask him a question to which he had promised me an answer upwards of a month before. On the night that we left Newcastle, I said, you were kind enough to say that when a fitting opportunity occurred to you, you would tell me what has induced these men to follow you as they are doing. There is no reason why you should not hear it, Nicola replied. To tell it in full, however, would be too long a story, but I will briefly summarise it for you. In order to obtain the information necessary for carrying out the experiment upon which we are now engaged, I penetrated, as I think I have already informed you, into a certain monastery situated in the least known portion of Thibet. My companion and I carried our lives in our hands, if ever men have done so in the history of the world. The better to carry out my scheme, I might explain, I impersonated a high official who had lately been elected one of the rulers of the order. At a most unfortunate moment, the fraud was discovered, and my companion and I were ordered to be hurled from the roof of the monastery into the precipice below. We managed to escape, however, but not before I had secured the precious secret for which I had risked so much. The monks traced us on our journey back to civilization, and two of the order who have had special experience in this sort of work were detailed to follow us in the hope that they might not only regain possession of a book which contained the secret, but at the same time revenge the insult which had been offered to them. And you still have the book? Would you care to see it? asked Nicola. I replied that I should like to immensely, whereupon he retired to his own apartment to presently return, bringing with him a small packet which he placed upon the table. Untying the string which bound it and removing a sheet of thin leather, he exposed to my gaze a small book, possibly eight inches long by four wide. The materials in which it was bound were almost dropping apart with age. The backs and corners, however, were clamped with rusty iron. The interior was filled with writing in the Sanskrit character, a great deal of which had faded and was barely decipherable. I took it tenderly in my hands. And it is to regain possession of this book that these men are following you, I asked. Do that, he answered, and to punish me for the trick I played on them. They have not, however, accomplished their task yet, nor shall they do so if I can help it. Let me once get hold of Kong Ma, and he'll do no more mischief for some time to come. As Nicholas said this, his great cat, which for the past few moments had been sitting upon his knees, suddenly stood up and placed its forepaws upon the table, scratched at the cloth. Nicola was watching my face, and what he saw there must have considerably amused him. You are thinking that Apollyon and I are not unlike. When we get out our claws, we are dangerous. It would be well for our Chinese friend if he understood as much. Now you'd better be off to bed, and I to my watch. When Nicola relieved me at eight o'clock the morning following, it was plain that there was something important toward. Get your breakfast as soon as you can, he said, and when you have done, we will search the castle. You heard nothing suspicious during your watch, I suppose? Nothing, I replied. Everything has gone just as usual. As soon as I had finished my breakfast, Ah Win summoned me, and together we set off on our errand. Beginning with the battlements, we took the castle corridor by corridor, floor by floor, examining every corner and staircase 
in which it would be possible for a human being to hide himself having exhausted the inhabited portion of the building we searched the rooms into which no one had penetrated from year's end to year's end these we also drew blank then descending another flight of stairs we reached the basement explored the great kitchens once so busy and now tenanted only by rats and beetles and examined the various domestic offices including the buttery and armoury still without success if Kongmar was in the castle it looked as if he must certainly possess the power of rendering himself invisible at will at last we reached the keep where the old couple who as nicola had said officiated as caretakers during his absence had their quarters at the moment of our arrival the woman was bitterly upbraiding her husband for some misdeed i'll tell ee she said slapping the table with her hand to emphasize her words that when i went to bed last night they vitals was in yonder cupboard what i want ee to say is where they be now don't he say he never saw them or that it was the cat has stolen for he may talk till he be black in the face and i'll not believe ee cats don't turn handles and undo latches and mutton don't walk out the front door on its own leg if he be a man he'll tell the truth and shame the devil i must leave you to picture for yourself the vehemence with which all of this was said the words poured from her throat in a torrent and every sentence was punctuated with slaps upon the table so engaged were they in their quarrel that some moments elapsed before they perceived nicola and myself standing in the doorway when they did the tumult ceased as if by magic you seem to be enjoying yourselves said nicola dryly perhaps you'll be kind enough to tell me what it's all about he had no sooner finished than the irate lady recommenced it's just this way my lord she said though why she should have bestowed a title upon nicola i could not understand last night i was troubled with rheumatism mortal bad went to bed early the old man there begging your pardon for the liberty i'm taking was a sitting by the fire smoking his pipe such as being his custom of an evening he'd had his supper as i seed with my own eyes when he finished there was an end leg of mutton in yon cupboard when it comes this morning i take it out for breakfast it's gone and with it the bread as i baked with my own hands but yesterday and he stands there saving your presence my lord and wants for i to believe how he's not touched it and the latch of the cupboard down as you can see for yourselves honourable gentlemen both with your own eyes i've been married these three and forty years and i don't know as how you'll believe it my lord seeing that she was getting up steam once more nicola held his hand up to her to be silent what you tell me is very interesting he said fixing his dark eyes upon her let me understand you properly you say you went to bed leaving your husband smoking his pipe in this room before retiring you convince yourself that the food which is now not forthcoming was in the cupboard is that so yes my lord and honourable gentlemen both and addressing her husband nicola continued i suppose you went to sleep over your pipe the question had to be repeated and his wife had to admonish him with speak up to his lordship like a man before he could answer even then his reply was scarcely satisfactory he thought he might have fallen asleep but he was not at all sure upon the point he admitted that he was in the habit of doing so and as far as nicola was concerned this settled the matter kwong ma he said turning to me now i understand where he gets his food from and turning to the woman he said your husband is a heavy sleeper i suppose why well, bless you sir she replied he sleeps that heavy you can't wake him as for snoring why the rattling of that old bridge out yonder when they're a drawing of it up ain't to be compared with him as the saying is i did hear of a man that lived down sunderland as did snore so that when he woke up the folks next door sent in to ask him to go on again the stillness being that lonesome they couldn't bear it nicola peremptorily made the old woman to be silent and ordered her for the future to see that her door was locked at dusk every evening and addressing her husband he inquired if the latter was conversant with the subterranean passages of the castle and when he had replied in the affirmative bade him light a lantern and show us all he could the man did so and having conducted us across the courtyard entered a long low chamber which might once have been used as a bakehouse in this was a large wooden door secured with many bolts but now fallen into considerable disrepair these bolts he drew one by one with an air of importance that was indescribably comic 
i don't quite understand how these bolts come to be fastened if the man is down below said nikola addressing me i shook my head whereupon he bade the old man inform him whether there were any other entrances to the vaults in question lor sir the man replied the castle be fair maze with them if he likes the place i can take you to most any room in the place from down below i should have thought of that said nikola more to himself than to me i'm sorry i didn't question our friend here before kwong ma had evidently mastered the situation and is playing a game of hide and seek however we'll examine the dungeon first and the passages afterwards so lead the way my friend the old man going ahead carrying the lantern nikola following and arwin and myself bringing up the rear we made our way down the clammy stone staircase into the subterranean portion of the castle it was an experience that would have been worth anything to a novelist seeking colour for a historical tale but knowing what i did about the man we were after i cannot say that i appreciated the incident so much in addition to my nervousness my head was aching while hot and cold perspirations alternately contributed to my general discomfort what was the matter with me I could not think as it was i was the only member of the party i believe who felt any symptoms of fright the old man with the lantern knew nothing of his danger our wind was an asiatic and a fatalist and in his master's presence appeared not to care whom or what he faced while as for nikola himself i believe most implicitly that cold-blooded individual would have faced certain death as coolly and as contentedly as he would have tossed off a glass of wine lower and lower we descended glancing into dungeons which no light of day had ever penetrated and stooping to make our way along passages in which the moisture from the roof fell drip 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 upon our heads search as we would however we could discover no trace of that villainous celestial we be close down along the sea now your lordship said the old man and when i tells thee that it's some not many folks as bided in this here castle ever knowed most admirable of men said nikola you tell me exactly what i want to know do you mean that it's possible for us to reach the sea from where we are now standing without crossing the drawbridge that's exactly what i do mean my lord he answered and if your lordship and the honourable gentleman will come where i i'll let you see for yourselves forthwith the old fellow holding his lantern aloft turned down a narrow passage leading to the right and a few minutes later brought us up some steps at the bottom of which the light of day could be plainly seen to reach the bottom of the steps was a work of a moment and once there a curious scene was revealed to us a doorway opened into the chasm which i have described earlier and was situated almost directly beneath the drawbridge and the keep kneeling down nikola and i looked over the edge and could plainly see a number of iron steps let into the rock one above the other at the bottom for it was now a full tide the sea washed and dashed with terrific force rising to his feet again nikola addressed the old man is it possible at low tide he said to reach the sands from here lord bless you sir the man replied when the tide is down he can get along from rock to rock without as much as wetting shoe leather that accounts for everything said nikola with considerable satisfaction i understand exactly how kwong ma got into the castle now he must have laughed to himself when he saw that we had raised the drawbridge in the hope of keeping him out however forewarned is forearmed and this place shall be bricked up this morning you my old friend had better see to it and be sure that you make a good job of it the old man promised to do so and seeing that there was nothing further to be gained by remaining where we were nikola bade him conduct us back again to our own portion of the building by a secret passage if possible the man assured us that we could do so and was as good as his word we climbed crawled and scrambled away up the narrow steps along a rabbit warren of a small passage behind our guide at last he stopped would your lordship be kind enough to say where he think ye are now he said i have not the least notion said nikola nor i i added well sir i will show ye and the man after a little hunting he found and pressed something on the wall there was a grating noise as the sound of rusty hinges being slowly unfolded and a portion of the wall swung outward and we found ourselves standing at the top of the great staircase within a few yards of consuelo's apartments this is uncanny to say the least of it remarked nikola 
pray do any of these interesting passages open up into the young lady's room opposite or into the smaller hall occupied by this gentleman and myself not now my lord the man replied time was when they did but the old lord didn't take kindly to em and it was bricked up as much as five year ago i'm glad to hear it said nicola and you imagine that i echoed the sentiment nicola thereupon thanked the old man and dismissed him at the same time reiterating his order that the opening in the chasm below the drawbridge should be made secure the excitement of the search for quang ma and the damp of the passages had been too much for me by the time we reached the hall i could scarcely stand good heavens ingleby said nicola as i dropped into a chair you're looking awfully ill what's the matter can't exactly say i answered i fear i must have caught a chill on the battlements last night and yet you accompanied me down those damp passages this morning was that wise i was not going to let you go alone i replied he glanced sharply at me as if he would read my thoughts well well i'll tell you what you must do you must be off to bed at once there can be no doubt about that i tried to protest i explained my desire to see the end of the experiment but nicola was adamant to bed i must go willy-nilly and to bed i accordingly went but not in my own room off the hall the apartment further down the corridor next door to that occupied by consuelo was arranged for me and when i was safely between the blankets nicola prescribed for me and my sweetheart was duly installed as nurse my indisposition must have been more severe than i had supposed for before nightfall i was in a high state of fever and by midnight was delirious i remember nothing further till i opened my eyes and found consuelo sitting by my side what does this mean i inquired surprised to find her there it means that you've been very ill she answered and that i am your nurse and i'm not going to permit you to talk very much to do this was a feat of which i was incapable but i was not going to be silent until i had learnt something of what had happened how long have i been ill i inquired more than a week she answered and then added you naughty boy you little know what a fright you have given me but you must not talk any more or dr nicola will be angry she poured out some medicine for me bade me drink it and then reseated herself beside me in five minutes i was wrapped in a heavy slumber from which i did not wake for several hours when i did i found dr nicola installed as nurse consuelo had disappeared well ingleby said nicola cheerily as he felt my pulse you have had a sharp bout of it but i'm glad to see we've managed to pull you through how do you feel in yourself much better i answered though still a bit shaky i don't wonder at it he said do you feel hungry i feel as if i could eat anything i answered well that's a good sign i'll see that something is sent to you in the meanwhile keep as quiet as possible when i leave you i'll send your sweetheart to you she's been a devoted nurse and between ourselves i rather fancy you owe your life to her god bless her i answered fervently but you call her my sweetheart what do you mean by that my dear fellow i know everything one night the young lady in question was rather concerned about you and in her agitation she allowed the cat to slip out of the bag you young people seem to have managed the matter pretty well in the short time you've known each other now keep quiet for a few moments while i see if i can find her he was making for the door when i stopped him you've not told me how the don is i said how does the experiment progress his face clouded over it has proved successfully answered but with a sudden sternness that surprised me it was for all the world that he were trying to convince me what he said was correct although in his own heart he knew it was not so when he spoke again it was very slowly yes ingleby he said as if he were weighing every word before he uttered it the experiment has proved a success i have made the don a young man but well to tell the truth i have made a mistake in my calculations a mistake that i cannot explain and that i can in no way account for and the result don't ask me he said for i'm afraid i do not know myself by the time you're on your feet again i shall hope to have come nearer an understanding of the situation then i shall be able to tell you more of what i hope and fear at present i scarcely like to think of it myself to my surprise as i watched him i saw great beads of perspiration start out upon his forehead and for the first time since i had known him I saw a look of terror in dr nicholas face i tried to question him further upon the subject but he bade me wait until i was stronger but presently repeating that he would find consuelo he left me when my sweetheart entered the room looking more beautiful than i had ever seen her 
i forgot for the time being about nikola you're looking much better she said as she came toward me and put down upon the table the tray she carried in her hand here is some beef tea which i have made for you myself if you don't drink it all up i shall let the old woman in the kitchen make it for you in the future and bring it to you herself you'd better not i answered in that case i should refuse to touch a drop of it and should die of slow starvation in consequence with a gentleness that was infinitely becoming to her she lifted my head and held the cup while i drank if i took longer over it than i should have done at any other time the fact must of course be attributed to my weakness dr nicholas says he is very pleased with the progress you have made she said when she had replaced the cup upon the table but you are to be kept very quiet for some days and to sleep as much as possible and when am i to get up i asked get up she cried in mock horror you must not even think of such a thing for a week at least a week i replied do you think i have to stay here for a week so dr nicholas says the remainder of our conversation is too sacred to be set down in cold drawn type let it suffice that when i fell asleep again it was with her hand in mine i was more in love even than i had been before as consuelo had predicted more than a week had elapsed before i was permitted to leave my room even then i was not allowed to return to my duties at once but spent the greater portion of my time with consuelo on the battlements gaining strength with every breath of sea air that i inhaled nikola i saw but little of he examined me every morning and on one or two occasions honoured us with his company for a brief period on the castle roof at the best of times however he was not a good companion he was invariably absorbed in his own thoughts spoke but a little and struck me as being very anxious to say good-bye almost as soon as he arrived since then i have learned the true reason of it all and i have been able to see that complex character in a new light it never struck me how lonely the man's life must be during the whole time that i was associated with him i never once heard him speak of kith or kin friends he appeared to have none while his acquaintances numbered only such men as were necessary to the particular work he happened to be engaged in at the moment of their meeting his very attainments his peculiar knowledge of the world of its under and mystic side was sufficient to make him hold aloof from his fellow men in all matters of comfort a rigid ascetic the good things of life had no temptation for him to sum it all up of this i feel certain so certain that at times it becomes almost a pain that nikola with all his sternness his self-denial his genius and his failings hungered for one thing and that was to be loved why should i say this considering that the only evidence i have to offer tends to lead one's thoughts in a contrary direction i do not know but as i remarked just now i feel convinced that my hypothesis is a correct one as i am that that i love consuelo but to return to my story it was not until nearly a fortnight had elapsed since my return to consciousness that i was permitted to take up my duties again when i did i returned to my old quarters leading out of the hall and i think nikola was pleased once more to have my cooperation at any rate he led me to suppose that he was when you think that you're up to the mark i shall be pleased to show you the don he said and to hear your opinion of him i expressed myself as being quite equal to seeing him at once very good he answered but i warn you to be prepared for a great and somewhat unpleasant change in the man so saying he led me across the hall towards the room in which i had before my illness spent so many hours inserting the key in the lock he turned it and we entered i had expected to find it exactly as i had last seen it a surprise however was in store for me the bed placed in the centre was gone as were both the electrical appliances the clock and the thermometers had been removed the only things that still remained being the electric lights which suspended from the ceiling and the enclosed fixtures for regulating the supply of hot and cold air in point of fact it was a bare room as well as could be imagined don miguel said nicola i have brought an old friend to see you i looked about the room but for a moment could see nothing of the old man in question then my eye lighted upon what looked like a heap of clothes huddled up on the mattress in the corner on hearing nikola's voice the face looked up at me a face so terrible so demoniacal that i might say that it involuntarily shrank from it what there was about it that caused me such revulsion i cannot say 
it was the countenance of a young man if you can imagine a man endowed with perpetual youth and with that youth the cunning the cruelty and the vice of countless centuries steady my friend i heard nicholas say and as he did so he placed his hand upon my arm remember ingleby this is nothing more than an experiment then addressing the crouching figure he bade him stand up with a snarl like that of a dog or rather a wild beast who is compelled to do a thing very much against his will the man obeyed i was able then to take better stock of him accustomed as i was to the old don's face i found it difficult to realize that the healthy vigorous man standing before me was he and yet i had only to look at him carefully to have all the doubt upon the subject removed he was the same and yet not the same at any rate he was an illustration of the marvellous nay the almost unbelievable success of nicholas experiment you remember the don as he was and you can see to what i have been able to bring him said nicholas sadly and for the one moment without a trace of triumph this however was soon forthcoming out of an old man tottering on the brink of the grave i have manufactured a young and vigorous creature such as you now see before you i have made him i have transformed him i have subjected nature to science i have revolutionized the world abolished death and upset the teachings and essential ideas of all religions i have proved that old age can be prevented and that the grave defied and and i have failed under the intensity of his emotion his voice broke and something very like a sob burst from him never since had i known nicola had i seen him as he was then to all appearances he was well nigh broken-hearted if you have done all this i asked how can you say that you have failed are you so blind that you cannot see he answered examine the man for yourself and you'll find that he is a human being in animal life only i have given him back his youth his strength his enjoyment in living but i cannot give him back his mind in his body i have triumphed in his brain i have completely failed but can it not be set right i inquired is the case quite hopeless nothing is hopeless he answered but it will take years centuries perhaps at work to find the secret i thought when i built up the body i should be building up the brain as well it was not so in proportion as his body renewed its youth his brain shrunk let me give you an illustration he went forwards towards the man who was now once more crouching upon the floor watching us over his right shoulder as if he were afraid we were going to do him harm well miguel said nicola patting him upon the head and speaking to him in the same tone he would have used to a favourite monkey how is it with you to-day the man however took no notice but bending down played with the lace of nicola's shoe now and again looking swiftly up into his face as if he dreaded a blow and as swiftly looking away again this should prove to you what i mean said nicola addressing me in his present condition he is less than a man and yet where would you find a finer frame his heart his lungs his constitution are all perfect while he had been speaking he had turned his back upon the beast upon the floor as he uttered the last words he moved towards me he had not taken a step however before the don was half off his feet from childish idiocy his expression had changed until it was a fiendish malignity that surpasses all description in words in another moment he would have thrown himself on nicola as it was he glared at him until he turned when in an instant the wild expression was gone and he was crouching upon the floor once more picking at his fingers and smiling to himself you can see for yourself what he is said nicola an imbecile but for one ray of hope i should despair of him there is then a ray of hope i said eagerly clutching him like a drowning man at the straw he held out thank god for that there is a ray he answered but it's a very little one i'll give you an example turning to the wretched creature on the floor he extended his hands towards him and gradually lifting it bade him rise the effect was instantaneous the man rose little by little until he stood upright once more pointing his hand directly at him Nicola moved towards him until the points of his fingers were scarcely an inch from the other's eyes, and slowly raising his fingers he made an upward and downward pass. The eyes closed and the man still remained rigid against the wall. Turning to me, Nicola said, You can see for yourself that he is absolutely under my influence and control. I approached and made a careful examination. There could be no doubt about his condition. 
it was one of the hypnotic coma and on raising one of the eyelids i found the ball turned upwards and wandering in its orbit you are satisfied inquired nicola perfectly I answered in that case let us proceed to whom am i speaking asked nicola addressing the man before him to miguel de moreno was the answer given in a perfectly clear and strong voice and without apparent hesitation do you know where you are i am with dr nicola before you came to me with whom and where did you live i live with my great-granddaughter in cadiz have you any recollection of coming to england i remember it perfectly now lie down upon that mattress and sleep without waking till eight o'clock tomorrow morning the man did as he was ordered without hesitation nicola covered him with the blankets and as soon as we had made sure of his safety we left the room carefully locking the door after us you could have no idea ingleby what a disappointment this has been to me three times before i have tried and failed but this time i made sure i had success within my grasp i progress further now than i have ever done before it is true but it is the brain that has beaten me as long as i live i will persevere and the perfect man who shall retain his youth through all ages shall eventually walk the earth now good night he held out his hand to me as i shook it apollyon came up and rubbed him against my leg as if to show that he too appreciated my sympathy it struck me that i had heard nothing of our friend kwong ma since we had searched the subterranean portion of the castle for him i asked nicola if he had anything to tell me concerning him nothing he answered saving that last night i felt certain that i saw a man across the courtyard it was just before midnight the moon was about the building and i am ready to stake anything that i am not deceived but who could it have been that's exactly what i want to know he answered you were safe in bed and asleep it was not the caretaker for i tried his door and found it locked and from the sound that greeted me i had good proof it was not he but might it not have been our win i asked i thought so before going in search of the figure i hastened to his room only to find him asleep in that case it must have been kwong ma but how does the fellow live and why does he not strike because he has not yet found his opportunity when he does you may be sure he will avail himself of it and once more good night you need not trouble about our patient i shall take a look at him about midnight good night i said and went to my room the door of which i carefully locked my last waking thoughts were of consuelo and my speculations as to what her feelings would be when she realized the terrible change that had taken place in her great-grandfather was sufficient to give me a nightmare over and over again i was afflicted with the most horrible dreams and when i was roused by a loud thumping on my door and nicola's voice calling for admittance it seemed so much part and parcel of the horror that my brain had just pictured for me that for a moment i took no notice of it it sounded again so springing from my bed i ran to the door and opened it what's the matter i asked when he was standing before me his usual pale face was now ghastly in its whiteness good heavens man he cried you have no notion what has happened dress yourself immediately and come with me he sat upon my bed while i huddled my clothes on and then when i was ready he seized me by the wrist and half dragged me half led me into the hall once there he pointed to the figure of a man stretched out before the door it was ah win and his throat was cut from ear to ear the sight was so sudden and so totally unexpected it was almost too much for me covering my presence of mind however i knelt down and examined him look at his hands said nicola they are cut to the bone with some sharp bladed instrument the murderer must have come here in search of me our wind must have met him tried to prevent him reaching the door and was unable to warn us and so have met his fate we were both too much overcome to continue the discussion kong ma had struck at last End of chapter 8chapter nine of dr nicholas experiment by guy boothby this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine at the conclusion of the preceding chapter i described to you the terrible discovery we had made of the death of our win that he had met his fate in an endeavour to prevent 
Quang Ma from reaching his master's room seemed quite in accordance with the evidence before us. Small wonder was it, therefore, that Nicola was affected. But even in his grief he proved himself unlike the average man. Another man would have bewailed his loss, or at least have expressed some sorrow at his servant's unhappy lot. Nicola, however, did neither, and yet his grief was as plain to the eye as if he had wept copious tears. Having satisfied himself that the poor fellow was really dead, he bade me help him carry the body down the passage to an empty room which adjoined his former quarters. We laid it upon a bed there, and Nicola followed me into the passage, carefully locking the door behind him. When we were back in the hall once more, Nicola spoke. This has gone far enough, he said. Come what may, we must find Quang Ma. The fellow must be in the castle at this minute. Shall we organise a search for him, I said? The man must be captured at any hazard. We are risking valuable lives by allowing him to remain at large. Though I use the plural, I must confess I was thinking more of my darling than of anybody else. How did I know that? How did I know that when Quang Ma found that it was impossible for him to get hold of Nicola, he would not revenge himself upon Consuelo? That we must find him goes without saying, Nicola replied. I doubt very much, however, if it would be prudent for you to take part in the search. In the first place, you are still as weak as a baby, and in the second, the damp of the subterranean passages might very easily bring on a return of the fever. You surely do not imagine that I should permit you to go alone, I said. Nicola gave a short laugh. Ha! I do not want to appear boastful, he said. But I am very much afraid you do not know me yet, my dear Ingleby. However, I will confess that if you really do desire it and feel equal to the exertion, I shall be very glad of your company. When do you propose to start? At once, he answered. I shall not know a minute's peace until I have revenged our win. And supposing we catch the fellow, what do you propose to do with him? It's a long way from here to the nearest police station. I don't fancy somehow I shall trouble the police, he said. But we will talk of what we will do with him when we have got him. Now, if you are ready, come along. Thereupon, for the second time, we searched the castle for Quang Ma. And as before, we first visited the battlements and the rooms on the next floor. The basement offices followed and still being unsuccessful, we unbolted the door leading to the dungeons and entered the subterranean portion of the building. Cool as I endeavour to appear, I am prepared to confess that when the icy wind came up to greet us from those dark and dreary passages, I was far from feeling comfortable. I don't set up to be a braver man than my fellows, but it seemed to me to require more pluck to enter those dismal regions and to take part in a forlorn hope. With our revolvers in our hands, and Nicola holding the lantern above his head, we explored passage after passage, dungeon after dungeon. Rats scuttled away beneath our feet, bats flew in the darkness above our heads, but as before, not a sign of Quang Ma. Can't understand it, said Nicola at last, and his voice echoed along the rocky passages. We have explored every room in the castle, and every dungeon underneath it and not a trace of the man can we discover. We have bricked up the opening into the chasm, and lifted the drawbridge that connects us with the outside world. And yet we cannot catch him. He must be here somewhere. Exactly, but where? I knew. Do you think I should be standing here? Nicola replied sharply. But let us try back again. I want to explore that secret passage the old man showed us the other day. I remember now that there was something that struck me as being rather peculiar about it. We accordingly retraced our steps, found the passage in question, and ascended it. Reaching the point where on the previous occasion we had turned off to find the trap door opening at the head on the great staircase, we found, as Nicola had supposed, a second and smaller turning, halfway hidden in a shadow, which bore away to the right, that is to say, in the direction of the keep. Unfortunately, it was now level going, but so narrow was the passage that it was still impossible to walk two abreast. Hark, what was that? Nicola suddenly cried, stopping and holding the lantern above his head. We stopped and listened, and sure enough, a shuffling noise came from the passage in front. A moment later, the same sound we had heard when the old caretaker had opened the secret door reached us. 
if i am not mistaken we have found his lair at last my companion shouted and ran forward but certain as we felt that it was quang ma we had heard we were too late to convince ourselves of the fact the secret door still open the man however was not to be seen in the passage outside where are we i asked for i was not familiar with the corridor in which we had found ourselves between the keep and our wind's quarters nicola replied now i understand how that fiend has found his way into the hall but let me think for a moment there is the gate between us and the hall and i have the key in my pocket there is no other exit in either direction so it seems to me that we have got our man at last is your revolver ready quite ready i replied come along then but remember this if he attacks you show him no mercy he'll show you none remember our win with that we made our way along the corridor in the direction of the room where nicholas well where the murdered man had been quartered nicholas unlocked the door and looked in while i remained in the passage outside i really believe i was more afraid of what i should see in there than of quang ma himself he's not there said nicholas when he rejoined me and then went to the gate and tested it and he can't get out here we've missed him somewhere and must look back again we accordingly retraced our steps examining room by room and preparing ourselves every time lest when we turned the handle quang ma should jump out upon us but in every case we were disappointed i was surprised just now said nicola after we had left the last apartment and stood in the corridor once more but i am doubly so now he seems to vanish into thin air every time we get near him there must be another secret passage hereabout of which we are ignorant before we return however i want to make quite certain of one thing let us continue that passage by which we ascended from the dungeons just now we did so nicola once more going ahead with a lantern just as i thought he cried look here he stooped and stood with his back to the wall at this point the passage came to an abrupt termination and on the floor before us was an old blanket a quantity of straw about a loaf and a half of bread and an earthenware pipkin containing a quart or so of water under the blanket was a half-used packet of candles and from the grease that bespattered everything it was easy to see how he had obtained his illumination well we have found our bird's nest at last said nicola but i'm afraid we have driven him away from it for good and all but we will have him yet or my name's not nicola now let us go back to the hall we can do no good by staying here we returned but not before we had taken possession of the things we had found and carefully marked the position of the secret door in case we should want to use it again after breakfast we will have another try said nicola in the meantime we had better take a little rest you look as if you stood in need of it it would have been better for me had i abandoned any thought of such a thing for with our wind lying dead only a few yards away and quang ma still at large the drowsy god was difficult if not impossible to woo every danger that it would be possible for a man to imagine i pictured for consuelo and when at last i did fall asleep the dreams that harassed me were of the most horrible description right glad was i when morning broke and it became necessary to attend to the duties of the day if i were you i should say nothing to your sweetheart either of her great-grandfather's condition or of the tragedy of last night said nicola i agreed with him although i knew that it could not be very long before the former would become known to consuelo but surely she will hear about our win before very long i said will it not be necessary for you to communicate with the county police and for an inquest to be held ingleby replied nicola ask me no questions i have no desire to draw you into the matter it is sufficient for you to know that our win is dead he paused for a minute and added significantly and buried try how i would i could not contain my surprise how when and by whom had the poor chinaman been buried had nicola carried it out himself it seemed impossible yet knowing as i did the indomitable energy and working powers of the man i felt it might very well be true i would have questioned him further but i could see that he was not in the humour to permit it for this reason i held my peace though i knew full well at the time that by doing so i was giving my consent to what was undoubtedly an illegal act from what i have said i fancy it would be readily agreed that the past two or three days 
had been as full of incident as the greatest craver after excitement could desire. I had recovered from a serious illness. I had witnessed the result of one of the most extraordinary experiments the world had seen. Arwin had been murdered, and we had discovered Quang Ma's hiding place in the castle, and had had a most exciting chase after him. Now Arwin had been buried secretly by Nicola, and if what had been done was discovered by the authorities, there is no saying in what sort of trouble we might not find ourselves. As soon as we had seen the Don, who was still wrapped in the same hypnotic slumber, and had breakfasted, we organised another search, only to meet with the same result. Later I spent an hour with Consuelo upon the battlements. I was careful, however, to tell her nothing of the death of our Wynne, nor of the reappearance of the detestable Chinaman in the castle. It would have served no good purpose, and would have only have frightened her needlessly. When she reiterated her desire to see her grandfather, I found myself, if possible, at still greater disadvantage. On returning to Nicola in the hall, I placed the matter before him. To my surprise, he did not receive it in the same spirit as I expected he would do. I had anticipated a direct refusal, but he gave me nothing of the kind. Why should she not see him, he said, provided she gave me proper notice. I fancy I can arrange that he shall behave in every way as she would wish him to do. When, then, may the interview take place? Let us say at midday, will that suit you? But before we arrange anything definitely, let's examine him ourselves and see how he is likely to conduct himself. We accordingly made our way to the patient's room. I had noticed by the hall clock that it wanted only three minutes of the hour at which Nicola had ordered the Don to wake. On approaching his bed place, we found him still sleeping peacefully, in exactly the same position as when we had seen him last. With his eyes closed and one strong arm thrown out upon the floor, he looked a magnificent specimen of a man. If only Dr. Nicola could perfect the brain, here was a being seemingly capable of anything. But would he be able to do so? That was the question. Watch in hand, Nicola knelt down beside the bed, and for some time not a sound broke the stillness of the room. Punctually, however, as the long hand of the clock pointed to the hour, the Don gave a long sigh. I jumped to the conclusion that he was about to wake in obedience to Nicola's command. But to our surprise, he did not do so. Strange. I heard Nicola mutter to himself. Stooping over the patient, he lifted up the eyelids and carefully examined the pupils. Five minutes went by, and still he did not wake. Don Miguel, said Nicola at last. Don Miguel, Nicola said at last. I command you to wake. You cannot disobey me. A slight movement was visible, but still the sleeper did not comply with the order given him. It was not until a quarter of an hour had elapsed that the consciousness returned to him. With the opening of his eyes, the animal look which I had noticed on the previous day came back to him. Instead of rising to his feet as he was ordered, he crouched and cowered in the corner, pulling at his bedclothes and watching us the while as if he would do us mischief on the slightest provocation. Dangerous as he appeared to the day before, it struck me that he was even more so today. It's very plain that we shall have to keep an eye on you, my friend, said Nicola. I'm not quite certain you're going to be docile much longer. Let me feel your pulse. He stooped and was about to take hold of the other's wrist when the man sprang forward and, seizing the doctor with both hands, laid hold of his arm with his teeth just below the elbow. Fortunately, Nicola was wearing a thick velvet coat, otherwise the injury might have been a severe one. Seeing what had happened, I threw myself upon the man and, tearing him off, forced him down upon his bed. He struggled in my grasp, snapping at me and foaming at the mouth like a mad dog. But I had him too secure, and did not let go my hold until Nicola had fixed his arms behind him. Good heavens, Nicola, I cried, scarcely able to contain my emotion. This is too terrible. What on earth are we going to do with him? I do not quite see what we can do, Nicola replied, wiping the perspiration from his forehead as he spoke. However, I must try my hand on him once more. If you can manage to keep him still and I can get him under my influence, we ought to be able to keep him quiet while we have time to think. I did as requested, while Nicola made slow mesmeric passes before the man's eyes. It was fully ten minutes, however, before he succeeded, but as soon as he did, the patient's heart-rending struggles ceased, and he lay down upon his bed, sleeping quietly. I began to be afraid I was losing my influence over him, said Nicola, as he rose to his feet. One thing is quite certain, I answered, and that is Consuelo must not see him while he's in this state. 
would frighten her to death. And she would never forgive me, said Nicola, and I thought I detected a note of sadness in his voice. Are you going to leave him as he is? I inquired. For the present, Nicola answered, I must make up something that will have a soothing effect upon him. You need have no fear. He will be quite safe where he is. The words were scarcely out of his mouth before movement on the bed caused us to look round. Little as we had anticipated such a thing, Nicholas' influence was slowly but surely working off, and the man was returning to his old state again. Even now, I never liked to think of what happened during the next ten minutes. Before we could reach him, the Dom was on his feet and had rushed upon me. Nicola ran to my assistance, and strong men as we both were, I assure you that at first we could not cope with him. The struggle was a terrific one. He fought like the madman he certainly was, and with an animal ferocity that rendered him doubly difficult to deal with. When at last we did manage to force him back upon his bed and make him secure, we were both completely exhausted. We could only lean against the wall and pant. Conversation was out of the question. This will never do, said Nicola, when he had sufficiently recovered to speak. If this sort of thing goes on, he will murder someone. Are you going to prevent it, I ask? It's plain that your influence has lost its effect. There's nothing for it but to administer an opiate, he answered. Do you think you can manage to hold him while I procure one? I fancied I could, at any rate. I expressed myself as very willing to try. Nicola immediately hurried away. He informed me afterwards that he was not gone more than a minute, but had I been asked, I should have put the time down at least quarter of an hour. To describe to you my feelings during that wait would be impossible. The loathing, the horror, the abject personal fear of the man writhing below me seemed to fill my whole being. I don't think we shall have much more trouble with him for an hour or two to come, said Nicola, when the drug had taken effect, and we were on our feet once more. But we cannot go on administering drugs forever, I answered. What do you propose to do later on? That is what we've got to find out, he replied. In the meantime, we must keep him up like this and take turns to watch him. You'd better go out now and get a breath of fresh air. If you see your sweetheart, pacify her with the best excuse you can think of. Are you sure you're quite safe with him? I asked. I must risk it, he replied. But as I moved towards the door, he stopped me. Ingleby, he said, speaking slowly and sadly, I don't know whether you will believe me or not when I say how deeply I regret what has happened in this case. I would have given anything, my own life even, that things should not have fallen out in this way. And what is more, I do not say this for my own sake. You're thinking of Consuelo, I said. I am, he answered. It is for her sake I feel this regret. As a rule, I'm not given to sentiment, but somehow this seems altogether different. But there, go away and tell her what you think best. I left him and went in search of Consuelo. She was in a usual pace in the tower above her room. When she saw me, she ran to greet me with outstretched hands. Something, it might have been my pale face, frightened her. My darling, I said, you're not ill, are you? What makes you look so alarmed? I've been frightened, she answered, more frightened than I can tell you. For a moment I thought she must have heard about her grandfather, but such was not the case. I've only been up here a few moments, she answered. The caretaker's wife was in my room when I left. The door was open, and as I climbed the turret stairs, I thought I heard her call me. Turning round, I was about to descend again, when I saw standing at the foot of the stairs a man. He was looking up at me. For a moment I could scarcely even believe my eyes. Who do you think it was? Though I could easily guess, I forced myself to utter the word, who? He was the man you saw behind the rock, the same I saw bending over in my cabin aboard the Donna Mercedes, that terrible Chinaman with half an ear. I feared she might see from my face that I knew more than I cared to tell, but as good fortune had it, she failed to notice it. Surely you must have been mistaken, I answered. What could the man be doing in the castle? I do not know, she answered, but I am certain that I saw him as I am of anything. He was standing at the foot of the stairs watching me. Then he began to move in my direction. But before he could reach the bottom step, I heard the door open along the corridor. This must have frightened him, for he fled round the corner, and I saw no more of him. It must have been my opening the door that saved you, I said. Thank God I came when I did. But what does it mean, she asked. Why did that man come aboard the boat, and why has he followed us here? I think the reason is to be found in the fact that he is Dr. Nicholas' enemy, I replied. They had a private quarrel in China some years ago, and ever since then this man 
has been following him about the world endeavouring to do him harm the case is a serious one darling and as you love me you must run no risks be on your guard night and day see that your door is locked at night and never venture from your room after dusk unless i am with you it makes my blood run cold when i think of your running such risks as you did this morning what about you she said looking up at me with her beautiful frightened eyes oh why cannot we take my grandfather and go away and never see this dreadful place again we must make patiently i answered the don is not fit to travel just yet she gave a little sigh and the next moment it was time for me to leave her for the next two or three days following nikola and i took it in turns to act as sentry over the don it was not difficult work it was the reverse of pleasant for as soon as the effect of each successive opiate wore off his evil nature invariably reasserted itself sometimes he would sit for an hour or more watching me as if he intended springing upon me the instant i was off my guard and others he would crouch in a corner tearing into atoms everything within his reach more than once he was really violent and it became necessary for me to signal to nikola for assistance the horror of those days i shall never forget when i say that not once but several times i have left that room dripping with perspiration and the pure sweat of terror my feelings may be partially imagined it was not madness we had to contend with it was worse than that it was the fighting of a lost soul against the effect of a man's impious prying into what should have been the realms of the unknowable this sort of thing cannot last much longer said nikola when our patient was lying drugged and helpless upon his mattress on the third night after the death of our wind and i knew he was right outraged nature would avenge herself when nikola had bade me good night i examined the don to make sure that he was not shamming sleep in order to try and get the better of me directly i was alone finding him to be quite helpless i seated myself in my chair and prepared to spend my watch in as comfortable a fashion as possible under the circumstances during the day i had passed a considerable portion of my time with my sweetheart in the open air and in consequence i found myself growing exceedingly sleepy knowing it would never do to allow slumber to get the better of me in that room i rose from my chair and began to pace the floor this had the effect of temporarily rousing me and when i reseated myself i thought i had dispelled the attack it soon returned however and this time it would not be denied i rubbed my eyes pinched myself got up and walked about it was no good however i returned to my chair my eyelids closed and almost without knowing it i dozed off when i woke again it was with a start i rubbed my eyes and looked about me heavens what mischief had i done the don was not in his corner the key was gone from the hook upon which it usually hung and worse than all the door stood open for a moment i was so overwhelmed with horror that i could do nothing but only for a moment then i knew that i must act and at once I rang the bell for Nicola, and having done so, dashed into the hall. Almost simultaneously, Nicola made his appearance, coming from his room. What's the matter? he cried. Why do you ring for me? The Don has escaped, I almost shouted. Like the fool I am, I fell asleep. And during that time, he must have recovered his wits, stolen the key, and escaped from the room. Oh, what have I done? If she should see him as he is, it will kill her. For a moment, it looked as if Nicola would have swept me off the face of the earth but the look scarcely came into his eyes before it was gone again we must find him he cried before he can do any mischief and what is more we must not separate for he would be more than a match for us single-handed accordingly we left the hall and proceeded towards the donna consuelo's apartments i thanked heaven when i found that the door was locked calling to her in answer to her cry of who's there i told her that i only desired to assure myself of her safety and after that we passed on up the turret stairs and along the battlements but no sign of the don could we discover there returning to the corridor again we descended to the great entrance hall and searched the courtyard and basement the room shone clear and the courtyard was as light as day had there been any one there we must certainly have seen him suddenly there rang out the most unearthly scream it has ever been my ill luck to hear it came from the direction of the chapel which lay between the keep and what had once been the banqueting hall from where we stood the interior of the latter was quite visible to us 
on either side it had tall windows so that the light shone directly through the scream had scarcely died away before we saw a short figure dash into the room and out again upon the other side an instant later a taller figure followed and also disappeared again and again the scream rang out while nicholas stood rooted to the spot unable to move hand or foot i see it all cried nicola that was quang ma and the other was the don they'll kill each other if they meet i thought of consuelo and thought of the terror she would feel should she hear that dreadful noise they must not meet i cried it is too terrible at any cost we must prevent it where do you think they are now as this to let us know another scream rang out this time it came from our own quarters come on said nicola and dashed into the building as you may suppose i followed close upon his heels in this order we flew up the stairs and along the first gallery intending if possible to reach the small hall by which the staircase near the kitchen in which our wind had worked was approached and thus cut them off as we crossed the threshold however a wild hubbub came from the passage ahead and told us that we were too late i knew what it meant and if i had not been by that time quite bankrupt of emotions i should certainly have been doubly terrified now leaving the kitchen we dashed along the passage only to find that the room usually occupied by nicholas unfortunates was empty with the exception of one solitary specimen who by reason of his infirmity was unable to fly they had all vanished leaving him to his own desires we passed the iron gate now thrown open and a moment later had entered the hall itself once more the cry sounded this time coming from a spot somewhat nearer consuelo's apartment on hearing it my heart seemed to stand still what if she should imagine that i was in danger and should open her door the same thought must have been in nicola's mind for i heard him say to himself anything but that side by side we raced for her door only to find it was still shut and locked almost at the same time a scream louder than any we had heard yet sounded from the battlements above at last i cried and led the way up the stone stairs i can only say that of all the horrid scenes i have ever witnessed what i saw before me then was the very worst in the centre of the open space between the parapets fighting like wild beasts were the two men of whom we were in search their arms were twined about each other and as they swayed to and fro the sound of their heavy breathing could be distinctly heard having reached the top of the stairs we paused irresolute what was to be done to have attempted to separate them would have only been to draw their anger upon ourselves and to have made the fight a general one the moon shone down upon us revealing the smooth sea on one side and the many turrets of the castle on the other from fighting in the centre of the open space they had gradually come nearer to the parapet of the wall kwong ma must then have realised how near he stood to death or he redoubled his energy they will be over shouted nicola and started to run towards them it scarcely spoke of before they reached the edge for a moment locked in each other's arms they paused upon the brink then with a wild shriek from kwong ma they lost their balance and disappeared i clapped my hands to my eyes to shut out the fearful sight when i took them away again all was over both nicola and i knew that kwong ma and don miguel de moreno were dead i suppose i must have fainted when i returned to my senses once more i found myself seated on the top of the stairs with consuelo's arms about me there remains but little more to tell at the time of that dreadful scene upon the battlements it was full tide and the known nicola and i searched every nook and cranny along the coastline for many miles the bodies of the two men could not be found in all probability they had drifted out to sea the same day i summoned up my courage and prepared to tell my sweetheart everything but when i sought her out and was about to commence my confession she stopped me say nothing to me about it dear she began i cannot bear it yet dr nicola has told me everything he exonerates you completely but what of ourselves i asked consuelo you and i are alone together in the world will you give me the right to care for your future happiness my darling will you be my wife when and where you please she answered holding out her hands to me and looking up at me with her beautiful trusting eyes i told her of my straitened means and how hard the struggle would be at first no matter she answered bravely we will fight the world together 
i am used to poverty and with you beside me i shall know no fear an hour later i had an interview with nikola in the hall ingleby he said this is the end of our intercourse i have tried my experiment and though i have succeeded in many particulars i have failed in the main essential how much i regret what has happened i must leave you to imagine but it is too late for what is done cannot be undone i have given orders that the yacht shall be prepared she will convey you to newcastle whence you can proceed in any direction you may desire one thing is certain donna consuelo must leave this place and as you are to be her husband it is only fit and proper that you should go with her i have only one wish to offer you it is that you may be as happy as these past weeks have been sad he held in his hand to me and i took it we shall meet no more he said go away and forget that you ever met dr nicola good-bye good-bye i answered without another word he turned and left the room shortly before midday we boarded the yacht steam was up when we arrived and within a few minutes we were steaming out of the little bay consuelo and i stood together at the taffrail and looked up at the grim old castle above our heads standing on the battlements we could distinctly see a solitary figure who waved his hands to us then the little vessel passed round the headland and that was the last we saw of dr nicola end of chapter nine end of dr nicola's experiment read by peter keeble nottingham united kingdom